Section zero zero of Montcalm and Wolfe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. Note to the listener. The source of these recordings is from Project Gutenberg. The text is unchanged, but footnotes and references have been removed for ease of recording and audiobook listening. They can be accessed at Project Gutenberg. Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. Preface and Author's Introduction. Preface. The names on the title page stand as representative of the two nations whose final contest for the control of North America is the subject of the book. A very large amount of unpublished material has been used in its preparation, consisting for the most part of documents copied from the archives and libraries of France and England, especially from the Archives de la Marine et des Colonies, Archives de la Guerre, and the Archives Nationales at Paris, and the Public Records Office and the British Museum at London. The papers copied for the present work in France alone exceed six thousand folio pages of manuscript additional and supplementary to the paris documents procured for the state of new york under the agency of mr broadhead the copies made in england form ten volumes besides many english documents consulted in the original manuscript great numbers of autograph letters diaries and other writings of persons engaged in the war have also been examined on this side of the atlantic i owe to the kindness of the present marquis de montcalm the permission to copy all the letters written by his ancestor general montcalm when in america to members of his family in france general montcalm from his first arrival in canada to a few days before his death also carried on an active correspondence with one of his chief officers with whom he was on terms of intimacy these autograph letters are now preserved in a private collection i have examined them and obtained copies of the whole they form an interesting complement to the official correspondence of the writer and throw the most curious sidelights on the persons and events of the time besides manuscripts the printed matter in the form of books pamphlets contemporary newspapers and other publications relating to the american part of the seven years war is varied and abundant and i believe i may safely say that nothing in it of much consequence has escaped me the liberality of some of the older states of the union especially new york and pennsylvania in printing the voluminous records of their colonial history has saved me a deal of tedious labor the whole of this published and unpublished mass of evidence has been read and collated with extreme care and more than common pains have been taken to secure accuracy of statement the study of books and papers however could not alone answer the purpose the plan of the work was formed in early youth and though various causes have long delayed its execution it has always been kept in view meanwhile i have visited and examined every spot where events of any importance in connection with the contest took place and i have observed with attention such scenes and persons as might help to illustrate those i meant to describe in short the subject has been studied as much from life and in the open air as from the library table these two volumes are a departure from the chronological sequence the period between seventeen hundred and 1748 has been passed over for a time when this gap is filled the series of france and england in north america will form a continuous history of the french occupation of the continent boston september 16th 1884 author's introduction it is the nature of events to obscure the great events that came before them the seven years war in europe is seen but dimly through revolutionary convulsions and napoleonic tempests and the same contest in america is half lost to sight behind the storm cloud of the war of independence few at this day see the momentous issues involved in it or the greatness of the danger that it averted the strife that armed all the civilized world began here such was the complication 
of political interest, says Voltaire, that a cannon shot fired in America could give the signal to set Europe in a blaze. Not quite. It was not a cannon shot, but a volley from the hunting pieces of a few backwoods men, commanded by a Virginia youth, George Washington. To us of this day, the results of the American part of the war seems a foregone conclusion. It was far from being so, and very far from being so regarded by our forefathers. The numerical superiority of the British colonies was offset by organic weaknesses fatal to vigorous and united action. Nor at the outset did they or the mother country aim at conquering Canada, but only at pushing back her boundaries. Canada, using the name in its restricted sense, was a position of great strength, and even when her dependencies were overcome, she could hold her own against forces far superior. Armies could reach her only by three routes, the Lower St. Lawrence on the east, the Upper St. Lawrence on the west, and Lake Champlain on the south. The first access was guarded by a fortress almost impregnable by nature, and the second by a long chain of dangerous rapids, while the third offered a series of points easy to defend. During this same war, Frederick of Prussia held his ground triumphantly against greater odds, though his kingdom was open on all sides to attack. It was the fatuity of Louis the Fifteenth and his pompadour that made the conquest of Canada possible. Had they not broken the traditionary policy of France, allied themselves to Austria, her ancient enemy, and plunged needlessly into the European war, the whole force of the kingdom would have been turned from the first to the humbling of England and the defense of the French colonies. The French soldiers, left dead on inglorious continental battlefields, could have saved Canada and perhaps made good her claim to the vast territories of the West. But there were other contingencies. The possession of Canada was a question of diplomacy as well as of war. If England conquered her, she might restore her as she had lately restored Cape Breton. She had an interest in keeping France alive on the American continent. More than one clear eye saw at the middle of the last century that the subjection of Canada would lead to a revolt of the British colonies. So long as an active and enterprising enemy threatened their borders, they could not break with the mother country, because they needed her help. And if the arms of France had prospered in the other hemisphere, if she had gained in Europe or Asia territories with which to buy back what she had lost in America, then in all likelihood Canada would have passed again into her hands. The most momentous and far-reaching question ever brought to issue on this continent was, shall France remain here, or shall she not? If by diplomacy or war she had preserved but the half or less than half of her American possessions, then a barrier would have been set to the spread of the English-speaking races. There would have been no revolutionary war and for a long time at least, no independence. It was not a question of scanty populations strung along the banks of the St. Lawrence. It was, or under a government of any worth it would have been, a question of the armies and generals of France. America owes much to the imbecility of Louis the Fifteenth, and the ambitious vanity and personal dislikes of his mistress. The Seven Years' War made England what she is. It crippled the commerce of her rival, ruined France in two continents, and blighted her as a colonial power. It gave England the control of the seas and the mastery of North America and India, made her the first of commercial nations, and prepared that vast colonial system that has planted new Englands in every quarter of the globe. And while it made England what she is, it supplied to the United States the indispensable conditions of their greatness, if not their national existence. Before entering on the story of the great contest, we will look at the parties to it on both sides of the Atlantic. End of section 00. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington.
Section One of Montcalm and Wolf by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One, Part One, seventeen forty five to seventeen fifty five. The Combatants. The latter half of the reign of George the Second was one of the most prosaic periods in English history. The civil wars and the restoration had had their enthusiasms, religion and liberty on one side, and loyalty on the other. But the old fires declined when William the Third came to the throne, and died to ashes under the House of Hanover. Loyalty lost half its inspiration when it lost the tenet of the divine right of kings, and nobody could now hold that tenet with any consistency except the defeated and despairing Jacobites. Nor had anybody as yet proclaimed the rival dogma of the divine right of the people. The reigning monarch held his crown neither of God nor of the nation, but of a parliament controlled by a ruling class. The Whig aristocracy had done a priceless service to English liberty. It was full of political capacity, and by no means void of patriotism. But it was only a part of the national life, nor was it, at present, moved by political emotions in any high sense. It had done its great work when it expelled the Stuarts, and placed William of Orange on the throne. Its ascendancy was now complete. The Stuarts had received their death-blow at Culloden, and nothing was left to the dominant party but to dispute on subordinate questions, and contend for office among themselves. The Tory squires sulked in their country houses, hunted foxes, and grumbled against the reigning dynasty, yet hardly wished to see the nation convulsed by a counter-revolution and another return of the Stuarts. If politics had run to commonplace, so had morals, and so too had religion. Despondent writers of the day even complained that British courage had died out. There was little sign to the common eye that under a dull and languid surface forces were at work preparing a new life, material, moral, and intellectual. As yet, Whitefield and Wesley had not wakened the drowsy conscience of the nation, nor the voice of William Pitt roused it like a trumpet peal. It was the unwashed and unsavoury England of Hogarth, Fielding, Smollett, and Stern, of Tom Jones, Squire Western, Lady Bellaston, and Parson Adams, of the Rake's Progress, and Marriage a la Mode, of the lords and ladies who yet live in the undying gossip of Horace Walpole, be powdered, be patched, and be rouged, flirting at masked balls, playing cards till daylight, retailing scandal and exchanging double meanings. Beau Nash reigned king over the gaming tables of Bath. The ostrich plumes of great ladies mingled with the peacock feathers of courtesans in the rotunda at Ranelagh Gardens. And young lords in velvet suits and embroidered ruffles played away their patrimony at White's Chocolate House, or Arthur's club. Vice was bolder than today, and manners more courtly, perhaps, but far more coarse. The humbler clergy were thought, sometimes with reason, to be no fit company for gentlemen, and country parsons drank their ale in the squire's kitchen. The passenger wagon spent the better part of a fortnight in creeping from London to York. Travellers carried pistols against footpads and mounted highwaymen. Dick Turpin and Jack Shepherd were popular heroes. 
Tyburn counted its victims by scores, and as yet no Howard had appeared to reform the inhuman abominations of the prisoners. The middle class, though fast rising in importance, was feebly and imperfectly represented in Parliament. The boroughs were controlled by the nobility and gentry, or by corporations open to influence or bribery. Parliamentary corruption had been reduced to a system, and offices, sinecures, pensions, and gifts of money were freely used to keep ministers in power. The great offices of state were held by men sometimes of high ability, but of whom not a few divided their lives among politics, cards, wine, horse-racing, and women, till time and the gout sent them to the waters of Bath. The dull, pompous, and irascible old king had two ruling passions, money and his continental dominions of Hanover. His elder son, the Prince of Wales, was a centre of opposition to him. His younger son, the Duke of Cumberland, a character far more pronounced and vigorous, had won the day at Culloden and lost it at Fontenoy. But whether victor or vanquished had shown the same vehement bull-headed courage, of late a little subdued by fast-growing corpulency. The Duke of Newcastle, the head of the government, had gained power and kept it by his rank and connections. His wealth, his county influence, his control of boroughs, and the extraordinary assiduity and devotion with which he practised the arts of corruption. Henry Fox, grasping, unscrupulous, with powerful talents, a warm friend after his fashion, and a most indulgent father. Carteret, with his strong, versatile intellect and jovial intrepidity, the two Townsends, Mansfield, Halifax, and Chesterfield, were conspicuous figures in the politics of the time. One man towered above them all. Pitt had many enemies and many critics. They called him ambitious, audacious, arrogant, theatrical, pompous, domineering. But what he has left for posterity is a loftiness of soul, undaunted courage, fiery and passionate eloquence, proud incorruptibility, domestic virtues rare in his day, unbounded faith in the cause for which he stood, and abilities which, without wealth or strong connections, were destined to place him on the height of power. The middle class, as yet almost voiceless, looked to him as its champion, but he was not the champion of a class. His patriotism was as comprehensive as it was haughty and unbending. He lived for England, loved her with intense devotion, knew her, believed in her, and made her greatness his own. Or rather, he was himself England incarnate. The nation was not then in fighting equipment. After the peace of aix la chapelle the army within the three kingdoms had been reduced to about 18,000 men. Added to these were the garrisons of Minorca and Gibraltar, and six or seven independent companies in the American colonies. Of sailors, less than 17,000 were left in the Royal Navy. Such was the condition of England on the eve of one of the most formidable wars in which she was ever engaged. Her rival across the channel was drifting slowly and unconsciously towards the cataclysm of the revolution. Yet the old monarchy, full of the germs of decay, was still imposing and formidable. The House of Bourbon held the three thrones of France, Spain and Naples, and their threatened union in a family compact was the terror 
of European diplomacy. At home, France was the foremost of the continental nations, and she boasted herself second only to Spain as a colonial power. She disputed with England the mastery of India, owned the islands of Bourbon and Mauritius, held important possessions in the West Indies, and claimed all North America except Mexico and a strip of sea coast. Her navy was powerful, her army numerous and well appointed, but she lacked the great commanders of the last reign. Soubise, Malibois, Contades, Brogli, and Clermont were but weak successors of Condé, Touraine, Vendôme, and Villars. Marshal Richelieu was supreme in the arts of gallantry, and more famous for conquests of love than of war. The best generals of Louis the Fifteenth were foreigners. Lowendal sprang from the royal house of Denmark, and Saxe, the best of all, was one of the 354 bastards of Augustus the Strong, elector of Saxony and king of Poland. He was now, 1750, dying at Chambord, his iron constitution ruined by debaucheries. The triumph of the Bourbon monarchy was complete. The government had become one great machine of centralized administration, with a king for its head, though a king who neither could nor would direct it. All strife was over between the crown and the nobles. Feudalism was robbed of its vitality, and left to the mere image of its former self, with nothing alive but its abuses, its caste privileges, its exactions, its pride and vanity, its power to vex and oppress. In England, the nobility were a living part of the nation, and if they had privileges, they paid for them by constant service to the state. In France, they had no political life and were separated from the people by sharp lines of demarcation. From warrior chiefs, they had changed to courtiers. Those of them who could afford it, and many who could not, left their estates to the mercy of stewards and gathered at Versailles to revolve about the throne as glittering satellites, paid in pomp, empty distinctions, or rich sinecures for the power they had lost. They ruined their vassals to support the extravagance by which they ruined themselves. Such as stayed at home were objects of pity and scorn. Out of your majesty's presence, said one of them, we are not only wretched, but ridiculous. Versailles was like a vast and gorgeous theatre, where all were actors and spectators at once, and all played their parts to perfection. Here swarmed by thousands this silken nobility, whose ancestors rode cased in iron. Pageant followed pageant. A picture of the time preserves for us an evening in the great hall of the chateau, where the king, with piles of louis d'or before him, sits at a large oval green table, throwing the dice among princess and princesses, dukes and duchesses, ambassadors, marshals of France, and a vast throng of courtiers, like an animated bed of tulips, for men and women alike wear bright and varied colors. Above are the frescoes of Le Brun. Around are walls of sculptured and inlaid marbles, with mirrors that reflect the restless splendors of the scene and the blaze of chandeliers, sparkling with crystal pendants. Pomp, magnificence, profusion were a business, and a duty at the court. Versailles was a gulf into which the labor of France poured its earnings, and it was never full. Here, the graces and charms were a political power. Women had prodigious influence, and the two sexes 
were never more alike. Men not only dressed in colors, but they wore patches and carried muffs. The robust quality of the old nobility still lingered among the exiles of the provinces, while at court they had melted into refinements tainted with corruption. Yet if the butterflies of Versailles had lost virility, they had not lost courage. They fought as gaily as they danced. In the halls which they haunted of yore, turned now into a historical picture gallery, one sees them still on the canvas of l'enfant, le Péon or Vernet, facing death with careless gallantry in their small three-cornered hats, powdered perukes, embroidered coats and lace ruffles. Their valets served them with ices in the trenches under the cannon of besieged towns. A troop of actors formed part of the army train of Marshal Saxe. At night there was a comedy, a ballet or a ball, and in the morning a battle. Saxe, however, himself a sturdy German, while he recognized their fighting value and knew well how to make the best of it, sometimes complained that they were volatile, excitable, and difficult to manage. The weight of the court, with its pomps, luxuries, and wars, bore on the classes least able to support it. The poorest were taxed most, the richest not at all. The nobles in the main were free from imposts. The clergy who had vast possessions were wholly free, though they consented to make voluntary gifts to the crown, and when, in a time of emergency, the minister Machault required them, in common with all others hitherto exempt, to contribute a twentieth of their revenues to the charges of government. They passionately refused, declaring that they would obey God rather than the king. The cultivators of the soil were ground to the earth by a threefold extortion, the seigneurial dues, the tithes of the church, and the multiplied exactions of the crown, enforced with merciless rigor by the farmers of the revenue, who enriched themselves by wringing the peasant on the one hand and cheating the king on the other. A few great cities shone with all that is most brilliant in society, intellect, and concentrated wealth, while the country that paid the costs lay in ignorance and penury, crushed and despairing. Of the inhabitants of towns, too, the demands of the tax-gatherer were extreme. But here the immense vitality of the French people bore up the burden. While agriculture languished, and intolerable oppression turned peasants into beggars or desperadoes, while the clergy were sapped by corruption, and the nobles enervated by luxury and ruined by extravagance, the middle class was growing in thrift and strength. Arts and commerce prospered, and the seaports were alive with foreign trade. Wealth tended from all sides towards the centre. The king did not love his capital, but he and his favourites amused themselves with adorning it. Some of the chief embellishments that make Paris what it is today, the Place de la Concorde, the Champs-Élysées, and many of the palaces of the Faubourg Saint-Germain date from this reign. One of the vicious conditions of the time was the separation in sympathies and interests of the four great classes of the nation, clergy, nobles, burghers, and peasants, and each of these again divided itself into incoherent fragments. France was an aggregate of disjointed parts, held together by a meshwork of arbitrary power, itself touched with decay. A disastrous blow was struck at the national welfare 
when the government of Louis the Fifteenth revived the odious persecution of the Huguenots. The attempt to scour heresy out of France cost her the most industrious and virtuous part of her population, and robbed her of those most fit to resist the mocking scepticism and turbid passions that burst out like a deluge with the revolution. Her manifold ills were summed up in the king. Since the Valois, she had had no monarch so worthless. He did not want understanding, still less the graces of person. In his youth the people called him the well-beloved, but by the middle of the century they so detested him that he dared not pass through Paris, lest the mob should execrate him. He had not the vigor of the true tyrant, but his languor, his hatred of all effort, his profound selfishness, his listless disregard of public duty, and his effeminate libertinism, mixed with superstitious devotion, made him no less a national curse. Louis the Thirteenth was equally unfit to govern but he gave the reins to the great cardinal. Louis the Fifteenth abandoned them to a frivolous mistress, content that she should rule on condition of amusing him. It was a hard task, yet Madame de Pompadour accomplished it by methods infamous to him and to her. She gained and long kept the power that she coveted, filled the Bastille with her enemies, made and unmade ministers, appointed and removed generals. Great questions of policy were at the mercy of her caprices. Through her frivolous vanity, her personal likes and dislikes, all the great departments of government, army, navy, war, foreign affairs, justice, finance, changed from hand to hand incessantly and this at a time of crisis when the kingdom needed the steadiest and surest guidance. Few of the officers of state, except perhaps d'Argenson, could venture to disregard her. She turned out Ori, the comptroller general, put her favorite Machault into his place, and then made him keeper of the seals, and at last minister of marine. The Marquis de Poiseu, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Comte de Saint Florentine, charged with the affairs of the clergy, took their cue from her. The king stinted her in nothing. First and last, she is reckoned to have cost him thirty-six million francs, answering now to more than as many dollars. End of section one. Section two of Montcalm and Wolf by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter one, part two. The prestige of the monarchy was declining with the ideas that had given it life and strength. A growing disrespect for king, ministry, and clergy was beginning to prepare the catastrophe that was still some forty years in the future. While the valleys and low places of the kingdom were dark with misery and squalor, its heights were bright with a gay society, elegant, fastidious, witty, craving the pleasures of the mind as well as of the senses, criticizing everything, analyzing everything, believing nothing. Voltaire was in the midst of it, hating with all his vehement soul, the abuses that swarmed about him, and assailing them with the inexhaustible shafts of his restless and piercing intellect. Montesquieu was showing to a despot-ridden age the principles of political freedom. Diderot and de Lambert 
were beginning their revolutionary encyclopedia. Rousseau was sounding the first notes of his mad eloquence. The wild revolt of a passionate and diseased genius against a world of falsities and wrongs. The salons of Paris, cloyed with other pleasures, alive to all that was racy and new, welcomed the pungent doctrines, and played with them as children play with fire, thinking no danger. As time went on, even embraced them in a genuine spirit of hope and goodwill for humanity. The revolution began at the top, in the world of fashion, birth, and intellect, and propagated itself downwards. We walked on a carpet of flowers, Count Segur afterwards said, unconscious that it covered an abyss till the gulf yawned at last and swallowed them. Eastward, beyond the Rhine, lay the heterogeneous patchwork of the Holy Roman or Germanic Empire, the sacred bonds that throughout the Middle Ages had held together its innumerable fragments, had lost their strength. The empire decayed as a whole, but not so the parts that composed it, in the south, the House of Austria reigned over a formidable assemblage of states, and in the north, the House of Brandenburg, promoted to royalty half a century before, had raised Prussia into an importance far beyond her extent and population. In her dissevered rags of territory lay the destinies of Germany. It was the late king that honest, thrifty, dogged, headstrong despot, Frederick William, who had made his kingdom what it was, trained it to the perfection of drill, and left it to his son, Frederick the Second, the best engine of war in Europe. Frederick himself had passed between the upper and nether millstones of paternal discipline, Never did prince undergo such an apprenticeship. His father set him to the work of an overseer or steward, flung plates at his head in the family circle, thrashed him with his rattan in public, bullied him for submitting to such treatment, and imprisoned him for trying to run away from it. He came at last out of purgatory, and Europe felt him to her farthest bounds. This bookish, philosophizing, verse-making cynic and profligate was soon to approve himself the first warrior of his time, and one of the first of all time. Another power had lately risen on the European world. Peter the Great, half hero, half savage, had roused the inert barbarism of Russia into a titanic life. His daughter Elizabeth had succeeded to his throne, heiress of his sensuality, if not of his talents. Over all the continent the aspect of the times was the same. Power had everywhere left the plains and the lower slopes, and gathered at the summits. Popular life was at a stand. No great idea stirred the nations to their depths. The religious convulsions of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries were over, and the earthquake of the French Revolution had not begun. At the middle of the eighteenth century the history of Europe turned on the balance of power. The observance of treaties, inheritance and succession, rivalries of sovereign houses struggling to win power or keep it, encroach on neighbors or prevent neighbors from encroaching, bargains, intrigue, force, diplomacy, and the musket, in the interest not of peoples but of rulers. Princes, great and small, brooded over some real or fancied wrong, 
nursed some dubious claim born of a marriage a will or an ancient covenant fished out of the abyss of time and watched their moment to make it good the general opportunity came when in 1740 the emperor charles the sixth died and bequeathed his personal dominions of the house of austria to his daughter maria theresa the chief powers of europe had been pledged in advance to sustain the will and pending the event the veteran prince eugene had said that two hundred thousand soldiers would be worth all their guarantees together the two hundred thousand were not there and not a sovereign kept his word they flocked to share the spoil and parcel out the motley heritage of the young queen frederick of prussia led the way invaded her province of silesia seized it and kept it the elector of bavaria and the king of spain claimed their share and the elector of saxony and the king of sardinia prepared to follow the example france took part with bavaria and intrigued to set the imperial crown on the head of the elector thinking to ruin her old enemy the house of austria and rule germany through an emperor too weak to dispense with her support england jealous of her designs trembling for the balance of power and anxious for the hanoverian possessions of her king threw herself into the strife on the side of austria it was now that in the diet at presbourg the beautiful and distressed queen her infant in her arms made her memorable appeal to the wild chivalry of her hungarian nobles and clashing their swords they shouted with one voice let us die for our king maria theresa moria mor pro rege nostro moria one of the most dramatic scenes in history not quite true perhaps but near the truth then came that confusion worst confounded called the war of the austrian succession with its molwitz its dettingen its fontenoy and its scotch episode of culloden the peace of aix la chapelle closed the strife in seventeen forty eight europe had time to breathe but the germs of discord remained alive the american combatants the french claimed all america from the alleghanies to the rocky mountains and from mexico and florida to the north pole except only the ill-defined possessions of the english on the borders of hudson bay and to these vast regions with adjacent islands they gave the general name of new france they controlled the highways of the continent for they held its two great rivers first they had seized the st lawrence and then planted themselves at the mouth of the mississippi canada at the north and louisiana at the south were the keys of a boundless interior rich with incalculable possibilities the english colonies ranged along the atlantic coast had no royal road to the great inland and were in a manner shut between the mountains and the sea at the middle of the century they numbered in all from georgia to maine about eleven hundred and sixty thousand white inhabitants by the census of seventeen fifty four canada had but fifty five thousand add those of louisiana and acadia and the whole white population under the french flag might be something more than eighty thousand here is an enormous disparity and hence it has been argued that the success of the english colonies and the failure of the french was not due to difference of religious and political systems but simply to numerical preponderance 
But this preponderance itself grew out of a difference of systems. We have said before, and it cannot be said too often, that in making Canada a citadel of the state religion, a holy of holies of exclusive Roman Catholic orthodoxy, the clerical monitors of the crown robbed their country of a transatlantic empire. New France could not grow with a priest on guard at the gate to let in none but such as pleased him. One of the ablest of Canadian governors, La Galissonniere, seeing the feebleness of the colony compared with the vastness of its claims, advised the king to send 10,000 peasants to occupy the valley of the Ohio and hold back the British swarm that was just then pushing its advance guard over the Alleghanies. It needed no effort of the king to people his waste domain, not with 10,000 peasants, but with 20 times 10,000 Frenchmen of every station, the most industrious, most instructed, most disciplined by adversity, and capable of self-rule, that the country could boast. While La Galissonniere was asking for colonists, the agents of the crown, set on by priestly fanaticism, or designing selfishness masked with fanaticism, were pouring volleys of musketry into Huguenot congregations, imprisoning for life those innocent of all but their faith, the men in the galleys, the women in the pestiferous dungeons of Aigues Mortes, hanging their ministers, kidnapping their children, and reviving, in short, the Dragonades. Now, as in the past century, many of the victims escaped to the British colonies and became a part of them. The Huguenots would have hailed as a boon the permission to emigrate under the fleur de lis and build up a Protestant France in the valleys of the West. It would have been a bane of absolutism, but a natural glory would have set bounds to English colonization and changed the face of the continent. The opportunity was spurned. The dominant church clung to its policy of rule and ruin. France built its best colony on a principle of exclusion and failed. England reversed the system and succeeded. I have shown elsewhere the aspects of Canada where a rigid scion of the old European tree was set to grow in the wilderness. The military governor holding his miniature court on the rock of Quebec, the feudal proprietors whose domains lined the shores of the St. Lawrence, the peasant, the roving bushranger, the half-tamed savage with crucifix and scalping knife, priests, friars, nuns, and soldiers, mingled to form a society the most picturesque on the continent, what distinguished it from the France that produced it was a total absence of revolt against the laws of its being, an absolute conservatism, an unquestioning acceptance of church and king. The Canadian, ignorant of everything but what the priest saw fit to teach him, had never heard of Voltaire, and if he had known him, would have thought him a devil. He had, it is true, a spirit of insubordination born of the freedom of the forest, but if his instincts rebelled, his mind and soul were passively submissive. The unchecked control of a hierarchy robbed him of the independence of intellect and character, without which, under the conditions of modern life, a people must resign itself to a position of inferiority. Yet Canada had a vigor of her own. It was not in spiritual deference only that she differed from the country of her birth. Whatever she had caught of its corruptions, she had caught nothing of its effeminacy. The mass of her people lived in a rude poverty, not abject like the peasant of old France, 
nor ground down by the tax-gatherer, while those of the higher ranks, all more or less engaged in pursuits of war or adventure, and inured to rough journeyings and forest exposures, were rugged as their climate. Even the French regular troops sent out to defend the colony caught its hardy spirit, and set an example of stubborn fighting which their comrades at home did not always emulate. Canada lay ensconced behind rocks and forests. All along her southern boundaries between her and her English foes lay a broad tract of wilderness shaggy with primeval woods. Innumerable streams gurgled beneath their shadows. Innumerable lakes gleamed in the fiery sunsets. Innumerable mountains bared their rocky foreheads to the wind. These wastes were ranged by her savage allies, Micmacs, Etechemins, Abenakis, Kanawagas, and no enemy could steal upon her unawares. Through the midst of them stretched Lake Champlain, pointing straight to the heart of the British settlement, a watery thoroughfare of mutual attack and the only approach by which, without a long detour by wilderness or sea, a hostile army could come within striking distance of the colony. The French advanced post of Fort Frederick, called Crown Point by the English, barred the narrows of the lake, which thence spread northward to the portals of Canada, guarded by Fort St. Jean. Southwestward, some fourteen hundred miles as a bird flies, and twice as far by the practical routes of travel, was Louisiana, the second of the two heads of New France, while between lay the realms of solitude where the Mississippi rolled its sullen tide, and the Ohio wound its belt of silver through the verdant woodlands. To whom belonged this world of prairies and forests? France claimed it by right of discovery and occupation. It was her explorers who, after De Soto, first set foot on it. The question of right, it is true, mattered little. For right or wrong, neither claimant would yield her pretensions so long as she had strength to uphold them. Yet one point is worth a moment's notice. The French had established an excellent system in the distribution of their American lands. Whoever received a grant from the Crown was required to improve it, and this within reasonable time. If he did not, the land ceased to be his, and was given to another more able or industrious. An international extension of her own principle would have destroyed the pretensions of France to all the countries of the West. She had called them hers for three-fourths of a century, and they were still a howling waste, yielding nothing to civilization but beaver skins, with here and there a fort, trading post or mission, and three or four puny hamlets by the Mississippi and the Detroit. We have seen how she might have made for herself an indisputable title and peopled the solitudes with a host to maintain it. She would not. Others were at hand who would and could, and the late claimant, disinherited and forlorn, would soon be left to count the cost of her bigotry. The thirteen British colonies were alike, insomuch as they all had representative governments and a basis of English law. But the differences among them were great. Some were purely English, others were made up of various races, though the Anglo-Saxon was always predominant. Some had one prevailing religious creed, others had many creeds. Some had charters, and some had not. In most cases the governor was appointed by the crown. 
In Pennsylvania and Maryland he was appointed by a feudal proprietor, and in Connecticut and Rhode Island he was chosen by the people. The differences of disposition and character were still greater than those of form. End of section 2 Section 3 of Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1, Part 3. The four northern colonies, known collectively as New England, were an exception to the general rule of diversity. The smallest, Rhode Island, had features all its own, but the rest were substantially one in nature and origin. The principal among them, Massachusetts, may serve as the type of all. It was a mosaic of little village republics, firmly cemented together and formed into a single body politic through representatives sent to the general court at Boston. Its government originally theocratic, now tended to democracy, ballasted as yet by strong traditions of respect for established worth and ability, as well as by the influence of certain families prominent in affairs for generations. Yet there were no distinct class lines, and popular power, like popular education, was widely diffused. Practically, Massachusetts was almost independent of the mother country. Its people were purely English, of sound yeoman stock, with an abundant leaven drawn from the best of the Puritan gentry. But their original character had been somewhat modified by changed conditions of life. A harsh and exacting creed, with its stiff formalism, and its prohibition of wholesome recreation, excess in the pursuit of gain, the only resource left to energies robbed of their natural play, the struggle for existence on a hard and barren soil, and the isolation of a narrow village life, joined to produce in the meaner sort qualities which were unpleasant and sometimes repulsive. Puritanism was not an unmixed blessing. Its view of nature was dark, and its attitude towards it one of repression. It strove to crush out not only what is evil, but much that is innocent and salutary. Human nature so treated will take its revenge, and for every vice that it loses, find another instead. Nevertheless, while New England Puritanism bore its peculiar crop of faults, it produced also many good and sound fruits. An uncommon vigor joined to the hardy virtues of a masculine race marked the New England type. The sinews, it is true, were hardened at the expense of blood and flesh, and this literally as well as figuratively, but the staple of character was a sturdy conscientiousness, an undespairing courage, patriotism, public spirit, sagacity, and a strong good sense. A great change, both for better and for worse, has since come over it, due largely to reaction against the unnatural rigors of the past. That mixture which is now too common, of cool emotions with excitable brains, was then rarely seen. The New England colonies abounded in high example of public and private virtue, though not always under the most prepossessing forms. They were conspicuous, moreover, for intellectual activity, and were by no means without intellectual eminence. Massachusetts had produced at least two men whose fame had crossed the sea. 
Edwards, who, out of the grim theology of Calvin, mounted to sublime heights of mystical speculation, and Franklin, famous already by his discoveries in electricity. On the other hand, there were few genuine New Englanders who, however personally modest, could divest themselves of the notion that they belonged to a people in an especial manner the object of divine approval and this self-righteousness along with certain other traits failed to commend the puritan colonies to the favor of their fellows then as now new england was best known to her neighbors by her worst side in one point, however, she found general applause. She was regarded as the most military among the British colonies. This reputation was well founded, and is easily explained. More than all the rest, she lay open to attack. The long waving line of the New England border, with its lonely hamlets and scattered farms, extended from the Kennebec to beyond the Connecticut, and was everywhere vulnerable to the guns and tomahawks of the neighboring French and their savage allies. The colonies towards the south had thus far been safe from danger. New York alone was within striking distance of the Canadian war parties. That province then consisted of a line of settlements up the Hudson and the Mohawk, and was little exposed to attack except at its northern end, which was guarded by the fortified town of Albany, with its outlying posts and by the friendly and warlike Mohawks, whose castles were close at hand. Thus New England had borne the heaviest brunt of the preceding wars, not only by the forest but also by the sea for the French of Acadia and Cape Breton, confronted her coast and she was often at blows with them. Fighting had been a necessity with her, and she had met the emergency after a method extremely defective, but the best that circumstances would permit. Having no trained officers and no disciplined soldiers, and being too poor to maintain either, she borrowed her warriors from the workshop and the plough, and officered them with lawyers, merchants, mechanics, or farmers. To compare them with good regular troops would be folly, but they did, on the whole, better than could have been expected, and in the last war achieved the brilliant success of the capture of Louisbourg. This exploit, due partly to native hardihood and partly to good luck, greatly enhanced the military repute of New England, or rather was one of the chief sources of it. The great colony of Virginia stood in strong contrast to New England. In both the population was English, but the one was Puritan with roundhead traditions, and the other, so far as concerned its governing class, Anglican with cavalier traditions. In the one, every man, woman, and child could read and write. In the other, Sir William Barclay once thanked God that there were no free schools and no prospect of any for a century. The hope had found fruition. The lower classes of Virginia were as untaught as the warmest friend of popular ignorance could wish. New England had a native literature more than respectable under the circumstances, while Virginia had none. Numerous industries, while Virginia was all agriculture, with but a single crop. A homogeneous society and a democratic spirit while her rival was an aristocracy. Virginian society was distinctively stratified. On the lowest level were the Negro slaves, nearly as numerous as all the rest together. 
next the indented servants and the poor whites of low origin good-humoured but boisterous and sometimes vicious next the small and despised class of tradesmen and mechanics next the farmers and lesser planters who were mainly of good english stock and who merged insensibly into the ruling class of the great landowners it was these last who represented the colony and made the laws they may be described as english country squires transplanted to a warm climate and turned slave masters they sustained their position by entails and constantly undermined it by the reckless profusion which ruined them at last many of them were well born with an immense pride of descent increased by the habit of domination indolent and energetic by turns rich in natural gifts and often poor in book learning though some in the lack of good teaching at home had been bred in the english universities high-spirited generous to a fault keeping open house in their capacious mansions among vast tobacco fields and toiling negroes and living in a rude pomp where the fashions of st james were somewhat oddly grafted onto the roughness of the plantation what they wanted in schooling was supplied by an education which books alone would have been impotent to give the education which came with the possession and exercise of political power and the sense of a position to maintain joined to a bold spirit of independence and a patriotic attachment to the old dominion they were few in number they raced gambled drank and swore they did everything that in puritan eyes was reprehensible and in the day of need they gave the united colonies a body of statesmen and orators which had no equal on the continent a vigorous aristocracy favors the growth of personal eminence even in those who are not of it but only near it the essential antagonism of virginia and new england was afterwards to become and to remain for a century an element of the first influence in american history each might have learned much from the other but neither did so till at last the strife of their contending principles shook the continent pennsylvania differed widely from both she was a conglomerate of creeds and races english irish germans dutch and swedes quakers lutherans presbyterians romanists moravians and a variety of nondescript sects the quakers prevailed in the eastern districts quiet industrious virtuous and serenely obstinate the germans were strongest towards the centre of the colony and were chiefly peasants successful farmers but dull ignorant and superstitious towards the west were the irish of whom some were Celts, always quarrelling with their German neighbours who detested them, but the greater part were Protestants of Scotch descent from Ulster, a vigorous border population. Virginia and New England had each a strong, distinctive character. Pennsylvania, with her heterogeneous population, had none but that which she owed to the sober neutral tints of quaker existence a more thriving colony there was not on the continent life if monotonous was smooth and contented trade and the arts grew philadelphia next to boston was the largest town in british america and was moreover 
the intellectual centre of the middle and southern colonies. Unfortunately for her credit in the approaching war, the Quaker influence made Pennsylvania non-combatant. Politically, too, she was an anomaly, for though utterly unfeudal in disposition and character, she was under feudal superiors in the persons of the representatives of William Penn, the original grantee. New York had not as yet reached the relative prominence which her geographical position and inherent strength afterwards gave her. The English, joined to the Dutch, the original settlers, were the dominant population, but a half-score of other languages were spoken in the province, the chief among them being that of the Huguenot French in the southern parts, and that of the Germans on the Mohawk. In religion, the province was divided between the Anglican Church with government support and popular dislike, and numerous dissenting sects, chiefly Lutherans, Independents, Presbyterians, and members of the Dutch Reformed Church. The little city of New York, like its great successor, was the most cosmopolitan place on the continent, and probably the gayest. It had, in abundance, balls, concerts, theatricals, and evening clubs, with plentiful dances and other amusements for the poorer classes. Thither in the winter months came the great hereditary proprietors on the Hudson, for the old Dutch feudality still held its own, and the manners of Van Rensselaer, Cortland, and Livingston with their seignorial privileges and the great estates and numerous tenantry of the Schuylers and other leading families, formed the basis of an aristocracy, some of whose members had done good service to the province, and were destined to do more. Pennsylvania was feudal in form, and not in spirit. Virginia in spirit and not in form, New England in neither, and New York largely in both. This social crystallization had, it is true, many opponents. In politics, as in religion, there were sharp antagonisms and frequent quarrels. They centered in the city, for in the well-stocked dwellings of the Dutch farmers along the Hudson, there reigned a tranquil and prosperous routine, and the Dutch border town of Albany had not its like in America for unruffled conservatism and quaint picturesqueness. Of the other colonies, the briefest mention will suffice. New Jersey, with its wholesome population of farmers, tobacco-growing Maryland, which, but for its proprietary government and numerous Roman Catholics, might pass for another Virginia, inferior in growth and less decisive in features. Delaware, a modest appendage of Pennsylvania, wild and rude North Carolina, and farther on South Carolina and Georgia, too remote from the seat of war to take a noteworthy part in it. The attitude of these various colonies towards each other is hardly conceivable to an American of the present time. They had no political tie except a common allegiance to the British crown. Communication between them was difficult and slow, by rough roads traced often through primeval forests. Between some of them there was less of sympathy than of jealousy kindled by conflicting interests or perpetual disputes concerning boundaries. The patriotism of the colonist was bounded by the lines of his government, except in the compact and kindred colonies of New England, which were socially united though politically distinct. The country of the New Yorker 
was New York, and the country of the Virginian was Virginia. The New England colonies had once confederated, but kindred as they were, they had long ago dropped apart. William Penn proposed a plan of colonial union wholly fruitless. James the Second tried to unite all the northern colonies under one government, but the attempt came to naught. Each stood aloof, jealously independent. At rare intervals, under the pressure of an emergency, some of them would try to act in concert, and except in New England the results had been most discouraging. Nor was it this segregation only that unfitted them for war. They were all subject to popular legislatures, through whom alone money and men could be raised, and these elective bodies were sometimes factious and selfish, and not always either far-sighted or reasonable. Moreover, they were in a state of ceaseless friction with their governors, who represented the king, or what was worse, the feudal proprietary. These disputes, though varying in intensity, were found everywhere except in the two small colonies which chose their own governors, and they were premonitions of the movement towards independence which ended in the War of Revolution. The occasion of difference mattered little. Active or latent, the quarrel was always present. In New York it turned on a question of the governor's salary. In Pennsylvania, on the taxation of the proprietary estates. In Virginia, on a fee exacted for the issue of land patents. It was sure to arise whenever some public crisis gave the representative of the people an opportunity of extorting concessions from the representative of the crown, or gave the representative of the crown an opportunity to gain a point for prerogative, that is to say, the time when action was most needed was the time chosen for obstructing it. In Canada there was no popular legislature to embarrass the central power. The people, like an army, obeyed the word of command, a military advantage beyond all price. Divided in government, divided in origin, feelings, and principles, jealous of each other, jealous of the crown, the people at war with the executive, and by the fermentation of internal politics, blinded by an outward danger that seemed remote and vague, such were the conditions under which the British colonies drifted into a war that was to decide the fate of the continent. The war was the strife of a united and concentred few against a divided and discordant many. It was the strife, too, of the past against the future, of the old against the new, of moral and intellectual torpor against moral and intellectual life, of barren absolutism against a liberty crude, incoherent, and chaotic, yet full of prolific vitality. End of section 3. Section 4 of Mont Carmen Wolf by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2, Part 1, 1749 to 1752. Celeron de Bienville. When the peace of A. La Chapelle was signed, the Marquis de la Galissonniere ruled over Canada. Like all the later Canadian governors, he was a naval officer, and, a few years after, he made himself famous by a victory near Minorca over the English Admiral Byng, an achievement 
now chiefly remembered by the fate of the defeated commander judicially murdered as the scapegoat of an imbecile ministry galissonniere was a humpback but his deformed person was animated by a bold spirit and a strong and penetrating intellect he was the chief representative of the american policy of france he felt that cost what it might she must hold fast to canada and link her to louisiana by chains of forts strong enough to hold back the british colonies and cramp their growth by confinement within narrow limits while french settlers sent from the mother country should spread and multiply in the broad valleys of the interior it is true he said that canada and her dependencies have always been a burden but they are necessary as a barrier against english ambition and to abandon them is to abandon ourselves for if we suffer our enemies to become masters in america their trade and naval power will grow to vast proportions and they will draw from their colonies a wealth that will make them preponderant in europe the treaty had done nothing to settle the vexed question of boundaries between france and her rival it had but staved off the inevitable conflict meanwhile the english traders were crossing the mountains from pennsylvania and virginia poaching on the domain which france claimed as hers ruining the french fur trade seducing the indian allies of canada and stirring them up against her worse still english land speculators were beginning to follow something must be done and that promptly to drive back the intruders and vindicate french rights in the valley of the ohio to this end the governor sent celeron de bienville thither in the summer of seventeen forty nine he was a chevalier de st louis and a captain in the colony troops under him went fourteen officers and cadets twenty soldiers a hundred and eighty canadians and a band of indians all in twenty-three birch bark canoes they left la chine on the fifteenth of june and pushed up the rapids of the st lawrence losing a man and damaging several canoes on the way ten days brought them to the mouth of the oswegatchie where ogdensburg now stands here they found a sulpician priest abbe piquet busy at building a fort and lodging for the present under a shed of bark like an indian this enterprising father ostensibly a missionary was in reality a zealous political agent bent on winning over the red allies of the english retrieving french prestige and restoring french trade thus far he had attracted but two iroquois to his new establishment and these he lent to celeron reaching lake ontario the party stopped for a time at the french fort of frontenac but avoided the rival english post of oswego on the southern shore where a trade in beaver skins disastrous to french interests was carried on and whither many tribes once faithful to canada now made resort on the sixth of july celeron reached niagara this the most important pass of all the western wilderness was guarded by a small fort of palisades on the point where the river joins the lake thence the party carried their canoes over the portage road by the cataract and launched them upon lake erie on the fifteenth they landed on the lonely shore 
where the town of Portland now stands, and for the next seven days were busied in shouldering canoes and baggage up and down the steep hills, through the dense forest of beech, oak, ash, and elm, to the waters of Chautauqua Lake, eight or nine miles distant. Here they embarked again, steering southward over the sunny waters in the stillness and solitude of the leafy hills, till they came to the outlet and glided down the peaceful current in the shade of the tall forests that overarched it. This prosperity was short. The stream was low in spite of heavy rains that had drenched them on the carrying place. Father Bonnicamp, chaplain of the expedition, wrote in his journal, In some places, and they were but too frequent, the water was only two or three inches deep, and we were reduced to the sad necessity of dragging our canoes over the sharp pebbles, which, with all our care and precaution, stripped off large slivers of the bark. At last, tired and worn, and almost in despair of ever seeing La Belle Riviere, we entered it at noon of the twenty ninth. The part of the Ohio, or La Belle Riviere, which they had thus happily reached, is now called the Allegheny. The great west lay outspread before them, a realm of wild and waste fertility. French America had two heads, one among the snows of Canada and one among the cane brakes of Louisiana, one communicating with the world through the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the other through the Gulf of Mexico. These vital points were feebly connected by a chain of military posts, slender and often interrupted circling through the wilderness nearly three thousand miles midway between canada and louisiana lay the valley of the ohio if the english should seize it they would sever the chain of posts and cut french america asunder if the french held it and entrenched themselves well along its eastern limits they would shut their rivals between the alleghanies and the sea control all the tribes of the West, and turn them in case of war against the English borders, a frightful and insupportable scourge. The Indian population of the Ohio and its northern tributaries was relatively considerable. The upper or eastern half of the valley was occupied by mingled hordes of Delawares, Shawanos, Wyandots and Iroquois, or Indians of the Five Nations, who had migrated thither from their ancestral abodes within the present limits of the state of New York, and who were called Mingos by the English traders. Along with them were a few wandering Abenakis, Nipissings, and Ottawas. Farther west, on the waters of the Miami, the Wabash, and other neighboring streams, was the seat of a confederacy formed of the various bands of the Miamis and their kindred or affiliated tribes. Still farther west, towards the Mississippi, were the remnants of the Illinois. France had done but little to make good her claims to this grand domain. East of the Miami she had no military post whatever. Westward, on the Maumee, there was a small wooden fort, another on the St. Joseph, and two on the Wabash. On the meadows of the Mississippi in the Illinois country stood Fort Chartres, a much stronger work, and one of the chief links of the chain that connected Quebec with New Orleans. Its four stone bastions were impregnable to musketry, and here, in the depths of the wilderness, there was no fear that cannon would be brought against it. It was the centre and citadel of a curious little forest settlement, 
the only vestige of civilization through all this region at kaskaskia extended along the borders of the stream were seventy or eighty french houses thirty or forty at cahokia opposite the site of st louis and a few more at the intervening hamlets of st philippe and prairie a la roche a picturesque but thriftless population mixed with indians totally ignorant busied partly with the fur trade and partly with the raising of corn for the market of new orleans they communicated with it by means of a sort of row gallery of eighteen or twenty oars which made the voyage twice a year and usually spent ten weeks on the return up the river the pope and the bourbons had claimed this wilderness for seventy years and had done scarcely more for it than the indians its natural owners of the western tribes even of those living at the french posts the hurons or wyandots alone were christian the devoted zeal of the early missionaries and the politic efforts of their successors had failed alike the savages of the ohio and the mississippi instead of being tied to france by the mild bonds of the faith were now in a state which the french called defection or revolt that is they received and welcomed the english traders these traders came in part from virginia but chiefly from pennsylvania dinwiddie governor of virginia says of them they appear to me to be in general a set of abandoned wretches and hamilton governor of pennsylvania replies i concur with you in opinion that they are a very licentious people indian traders of whatever nation are rarely models of virtue and these without doubt were rough and lawless men with abundant blackguardism and few scruples not all of them however are to be thus qualified some were of a better stamp among whom were christopher gist william trent and george croen these and other chief traders hired men on the frontiers crossed the alleghanies with goods packed on the backs of horses descended into the valley of the ohio and journeyed from stream to stream and village to village along the indian trails with which all this wilderness was seamed and which the traders widened to make them practicable more rarely they carried their goods on horses to the upper waters of the ohio and embarked them in long wooden canoes in which they descended the main river and ascended much of its numerous tributaries as were navigable they were bold and enterprising and french writers with alarm and indignation declare that some of them had crossed the mississippi and traded with the distant osages it is said that about three hundred of them came over the mountains every year on reaching the allegheny celeron de bienville entered upon the work assigned him and began by taking possession of the country the men were drawn up in order louis the fifteenth was proclaimed lord of all that region the arms of france stamped on a sheet of tin were nailed to a tree a plate of lead was buried at its foot and the notary of the expedition drew up a formal act of the whole proceeding the leaden plate was inscribed as follows year seventeen forty nine in the reign of louis the fifteenth king of france we celeron commanding the detachment sent by the marquis de la galissonniere commander-general of new france to restore tranquillity in certain villages of these cantons have buried this plate at the confluence of the ohio and the conewagon conewango this twenty ninth of july 
as a token of renewal of possession heretofore taken of the aforesaid river ohio of all streams that fall into it and all lands on both sides to the source of the aforesaid streams as the preceding kings of france have enjoyed or ought to have enjoyed it and which they have upheld by force of arms and by treaties notably by those of ryswick utrecht and a la chapelle this done the party proceeded on its way moving downward with the current and passing from time to time rough openings in the forest with clusters of indian wigwams the inmates of which showed a strong inclination to run off at their approach to prevent this chabert de jonquere was sent in advance as a messenger of peace he was himself half indian being the son of a french officer and a seneca squaw speaking fluently his maternal tongue and like his father holding an important place in all dealings between the french and the tribes who spoke dialects of the iroquois on this occasion his success was not complete it needed all his art to prevent the alarmed savages from taking to the woods sometimes however saleron succeeded in gaining an audience and at a village of senecas called la paix coupe he read them a message from la galissonniere couched in terms sufficiently imperative my children since i was at war with the english i have learned that they have seduced you and not content with corrupting your hearts have taken advantage of my absence to invade lands which are not theirs but mine and therefore i have resolved to send you monsieur de Saleron to tell you my intentions which are that i will not endure the english on my land listen to me children mark well the word that i send you follow my advice and the sky will always be calm and clear over your villages i expect from you an answer worthy of true children and he urged them to stop all trade with the intruders and send them back to whence they came they promised compliance and says the chaplain bonnicamp we should all have been satisfied if we had thought them sincere but nobody doubted that fear had extorted their answer four leagues below french creek by a rock scratched with indian hieroglyphics they buried another leaden plate three days after they reached the delaware village of atique at the site of kitanning whose twenty-two wigwams were all empty the owners having fled a little farther on at an old abandoned village of shawanoes they found six english traders whom they warned to be gone and return no more at their peril being helpless to resist the traders pretended obedience and celeron charged them with a letter to the governor of pennsylvania in which he declared that he was greatly surprised to find englishmen trespassing on the domain of france i know concluded the letter that our commandant general would be very sorry to be forced to use violence but his orders are precise to leave no foreign traders within the limits of his government on the next day they reached a village of iroquois under a female chief called queen aliquippa by the english to whom she was devoted both queen and subjects had fled but among the deserted wigwams were six more englishmen whom celeron warned off like the others and who like them pretended to obey at a neighboring town they found only two withered ancient male and female whose united ages in the judgment of the chaplain were full two centuries 
they passed the site of the future Pittsburgh, and some seventeen miles below approached Chiningui, called Logstown by the English, one of the chief places on the river. Both English and French flags were flying over the town, and the inhabitants lining the shore greeted their visitors with a salute of musketry, not wholly welcome as the guns were charged with ball. Celeron threatened to fire on them if they did not cease. The French climbed the steep bank and encamped on the plateau above, betwixt the forest and the village, which consisted of some fifty cabins and wigwams, grouped in picturesque squalor and tenanted by a mixed population, chiefly of Delawares, Shawanoes, and Mingos. Here, too, were gathered many fugitives from the deserted towns above. Celeron feared a night attack. The camp was encircled by a ring of sentries. The officers walked the rounds till morning. A part of the men were kept under arms, and the rest ordered to sleep in their clothes. Jonquere discovered through some women of his acquaintance, that an attack was intended. Whatever the danger may have been, the precautions of the French averted it, and instead of a battle there was a council. Celeron delivered to the assembled chiefs a message from the governor more conciliatory than the former. Through the love I bear you, my children, I send you Monsieur de Celeron, to open your eyes to the designs of the English against your lands, the establishments they mean to make, and of which you are certainly ignorant, tend to your complete ruin. They hide from you their plans, which are to settle here and drive you away if I let them. As a good father who tenderly loves his children, and though far away from them, bears them always in his heart, I must warn you of the danger that threatens you. The English intend to rob you of your country, and that they may succeed, they begin by corrupting your minds. As they mean to seize the Ohio, which belongs to me, I send to warn them to retire. The reply of the chiefs, though sufficiently humble, was not all that could be wished. They begged that the intruders might stay a little longer, since the goods they brought were necessary to them. It was in fact these goods, cheap, excellent, and abundant as they were, which formed the only true bond between the English and the western tribes. Logstown was one of the chief resorts of the English traders, and at this moment there were ten of them in the place. Celeron warned them off. They agreed, says the chaplain, to all that was demanded, well resolved, no doubt, to do the contrary as soon as our backs were turned. Having distributed gifts among the Indians, the French proceeded on their way, and at or near the mouth of the Wheeling Creek buried another plate of lead, they repeated the same ceremony at the mouth of the Muskingum. Here, half a century later, when this region belonged to the United States, a party of boys, bathing in the river, saw the plate protruding from the bank where the freshets had laid it bare, knocked it down with a long stick, melted half of it into bullets, and gave what remained to a neighbor from Marietta, who, hearing of this mysterious relic, inscribed in an unknown tongue, came to rescue it from their hands. It is now in the cabinet of the American Antiquarian Society. On the 18th of August, Saleron buried yet another plate at the mouth of the Great Kanawha. This, too, in the course of a century, was unearthed by the floods and found in 1846 by a boy at play at the edge of the water. The inscriptions on all these plates were much alike with variations of date and place. 
the weather was by turns rainy and hot and the men tired and famished were fast falling ill on the twenty-second they approached scioto called by the french saint yotoc or sinioto a large shawano town at the mouth of the river which bears the same name greatly doubting what welcome awaited them they filled their powder horns and prepared for the worst jonquere was sent forward to propitiate the inhabitants but they shot bullets through the flag that he carried and surrounded him yelling and brandishing their knives some were for killing him at once others for burning him alive the interposition of a friendly iroquois saved him and at length they let him go celeron was very uneasy at the reception of his messenger i knew he writes the weakness of my party two-thirds of which were young men who had never left home before and would all have run at the sight of ten indians still there was nothing for me but to keep on for i was short of provisions my canoes were badly damaged and i had no pitch or bark to mend them so i embarked again ready for whatever might happen i had good officers and about fifty men who could be trusted End of section four. section five of montcalm and wolfe by francis parkman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two part two as they neared the town the indians swarmed to the shore and began the usual salute of musketry they fired says celeron full a thousand shots for the english give them powder for nothing he prudently pitched his camp on the farther side of the river posted guards and kept close watch each party distrusted and feared the other at length after much ado many debates and some threatening movements on the part of the alarmed and excited indians a council took place at the tent of the french commander the chiefs apologizing for the rough treatment of john care and celeron replied with a rebuke which would doubtless have been less mild had he felt himself stronger he gave them also a message from the governor modified apparently to suit the circumstances for while warning them of the wiles of the english it gave no hint that the king of france claimed mastery of their lands their answer was vague and unsatisfactory it was plain that they were bound to the enemy by interest if not by sympathy a party of english traders were living in the place and celeron summoned them to withdraw on pain of what might ensue my instructions he says enjoined me to do this and even to pillage the english but i was not strong enough and as these traders were established in the village and well supported by the indians the attempt would have failed and put the french to shame the assembled chiefs having been regaled with a cup of brandy each the only part of the proceeding which seemed to please them celeron re-embarked and continued his voyage on the thirtieth they reached the great miami called by the french riviere a la roche and here celeron buried the last of his leaden plates they now bade farewell to the ohio or in the words of the chaplain to la belle riviere that river so little known to the french and unfortunately too well known to the english he speaks of the multitude of indian villages on its shores and still more on its northern branches each great or small has one or more english traders and each of these has hired men to carry his furs 
Behold, then, the English well advanced upon our lands, and, what is worse, under the protection of a crowd of savages whom they have drawn over to them, and whose number increases daily. The course of the party lay up the Miami, and they toiled thirteen days against the shallow current, before they reached a village of the Miami Indians, lately built at the mouth of the rivulet, now called Loramie Creek. Over it ruled a chief to whom the French had given the singular name of La Demoiselle, but whom the English, whose fast friend he was, called Old Britain. The English traders who lived here had prudently withdrawn, leaving only two hired men in the place. The object of Celeron was to introduce the demoiselle and his band to leave this new abode and return to their old villages near the French fort on the Maumee, where they would be safe from English seduction. To this end, he called them to a council, gave them ample gifts, and made them an harangue in the name of the governor. The demoiselle took the gifts, thanked the French father for his good advice, and promised to follow it at a more convenient time. In vain, Saleron insisted that he and his tribesmen should remove at once. Neither blandishments nor threats would prevail, and the French commander felt that his negotiation had failed. He was not deceived. Far from leaving his village, the demoiselle, who was great chief of the Miami Confederacy, gathered his followers to the spot, till, less than two years after the visit of Celeron, its population had increased eightfold. Peak Town, or Pickawillany, as the English called it, became one of the greatest Indian towns of the West, the centre of English trade and influence, and a capital object of French jealousy. Celeron burned his shattered canoes, and led his party across the long and difficult portage to the French post on the Maumee where he found Raymond, the commander, and all his men, shivering with fever and ague. They supplied him with wooden canoes for his voyage down the river, and early in October he reached Lake Erie, where he was detained for a time by a drunken debauch of his Indians, who are called by the chaplain a species of men made to exercise the patience of those who have the misfortune to travel with them. In a month more he was at Fort Frontenac, and as he descended thence to Montreal, he stopped at the Oswegatchie, in obedience to the governor who had directed him to report the progress made by the Sulpician, Abbe Piquet, at his new mission. Piquet's new fort had been burned by Indians, prompted, as he thought, by the English of Oswego, but the priest, buoyant and undaunted, was still resolute for the glory of God and the confusion of the heretics. At length, Celeron reached Montreal, and closing his journal, wrote thus, Father Bonnecamp, who is a Jesuit and a great mathematician, reckons that we have travelled twelve hundred leagues. I and my officers think we have travelled more. All I can say is that the nations of these countries are very ill disposed towards the French, and devoted entirely to the English. If his expedition had done no more, it had at least revealed clearly the deplorable condition of the French interests in the West. While Celeron was warning English traders from the Ohio, a plan was on foot in Virginia for a new invasion of the French domain. An association was formed to settle in the Ohio country, and a grant of 500,000 acres was procured from the king, on condition that a hundred families should be established upon it within seven years. A fort built 
and a garrison maintained. The Ohio Company numbered among its members some of the chief men of Virginia, including two brothers of Washington, and it also had a London partner, one Hanbury, a person of influence, who acted as its agent in England. In the year after the expedition of Celeron, its governing committee sent the trader Christopher Gist to explore the country and select land. It must be good, level land, wrote the committee. We had rather go quite down to the Mississippi than take mean, broken land. In November, Gist reached Logstown, the Chenigue of Celeron, where he found what he calls a parcel of reprobate Indian traders. Those whom he so stigmatizes were Pennsylvanians, chiefly Scotch-Irish, between whom and the traders from Virginia there was great jealousy. Gist was told that he should never go home safe. He declared himself the bearer of a message from the king. This imposed respect, and he was allowed to proceed. At the Wyandot village of Muskingum, he found the trader, George Crowan, sent to the Indians by the governor of Pennsylvania to renew the chain of friendship. Crowan, he says, is a mere idol among his countrymen, the Irish traders. Yet they met amicably, and the Pennsylvanian had with him a companion, Andrew Montour, the interpreter who proved of great service to Gist. As Montour was a conspicuous person in his time, and a type of his class, he merits a passing notice. He was the reputed grandson of a French governor and an Indian squaw. His half-breed mother, Catherine Montour, was a native of Canada, whence she was carried off by the Iroquois and adopted by them. She lived in a village at the head of Seneca Lake, and still held the belief, inculcated by the guides of her youth, that Christ was a Frenchman crucified by the English. Her son, Andrew, is thus described by the Moravian Zinzendorf, who knew him. His face is like that of a European, but marked with a broad Indian ring of bear's grease and paint drawn completely round it. He wears a coat of fine cloth of cinnamon color, a black necktie with silver spangles, a red satin waistcoat, trousers over which hangs his shirt, shoes and stockings, a hat, and brass ornaments, something like the handle of a basket, suspended from his ears. He was an excellent interpreter, and held in high account by his Indian kinsmen. After leaving Muskingum, Gist, Crowan, and Montour went together to a village on White Woman's Creek, so called from one Mary Harris who lived here. She was born in New England, was made prisoner when a child forty years before, and had since dwelt among her captors, finding such comfort as she might in an Indian husband and a family of young half-breeds. She still remembers, says Gist, that they used to be very religious in New England, and wonders how white men can be so wicked as she has seen them in these woods. He and his companions now journeyed southwestward to the Shawano town at the mouth of the Scioto, where they found a reception very different from that which had awaited Celeron. Thence they rode northwestward along the forest path that led to Pickawillany, the Indian town on the upper waters of the great Miami. Gist was delighted with the country and reported to his employers that it is fine, rich, level land, well timbered with large walnut, ash, sugar trees, and cherry trees, 
well watered with a great number of little streams and rivulets, full of beautiful natural meadows, with wild rye, bluegrass, and clover, and abounding with turkeys, deer, elk, and most sorts of game, particularly buffaloes, thirty or forty of which are frequently seen in one meadow. A little farther west on the plains of the Wabash and the Illinois, he would have found them by thousands. They crossed the Miami on a raft, their horses swimming after them, and were met on landing by a crowd of warriors, who, after smoking with them, escorted them to the neighboring town, where they were greeted by a fusillade of welcome. We entered with English colors before us, and were kindly received by their king, who invited us into his own house and set up our colors upon the top of it. Then all the white men and traders that were there came and welcomed us. This king was Old Britain, or La Demoiselle. Great were the changes here since Celeron, a year and a half before, had vainly enticed him to change his abode and dwell in the shadow of the fleur de lis The town had grown to four hundred families, or about two thousand souls, and the English traders had built for themselves and their hosts a fort of pickets strengthened with logs. There was a series of councils in the long house, or town hall. Crowan made the Indians a present from the governor of Pennsylvania, and he and Gist delivered speeches of friendship and good advice, which the auditors received with the usual monosyllabic plaudits, ejected from the depths of their throats. A treaty of peace was solemnly made between the English and the Confederate tribes, and all was serenity and joy, till four Ottawas, probably from Detroit, arrived with a French flag, a gift of brandy and tobacco, and a message from the French commandant inviting the Miamis to visit him. Whereupon the great war chief rose, and with a fierce tone and very warlike air, said to the envoys, Brothers the Ottawas, we let you know by these four strings of wampum that we will not hear anything the French say, nor do anything they bid us. Then addressing the French as if actually present, Fathers, we have made a road to the sunrising, and have been taken by the hand by our brothers the English, the Six Nations, the Delawares, the Shawanoes, and Wyandots. We assure you in that road we will go, and as you threaten us with war in the spring, we tell you that we are ready to receive you. Then, turning again to the four envoys, Brothers the Ottawas, you hear what I say. Tell that to your fathers the French, for we speak it from our hearts. The chiefs then took down the French flag which the Ottawas had planted in the town, and dismissed the envoys with their answer of defiance. On the next day, the town crier came with a message from the demoiselle, inviting his English guests to a feather dance, which Gist thus describes. It was performed by three dancing masters, who were painted all over of various colors, with long sticks in their hands, upon the ends of which were fastened long feathers of swans and other birds, neatly woven in the shape of a fowl's wing. In this disguise they performed many antic tricks, waving their sticks and feathers about with great skill to imitate the flying and fluttering of birds, keeping exact time with their music. This music was the measured thumping of an Indian drum. From time to time a warrior would leap up, and the drum and the dancers would cease as he struck a post with his tomahawk, and in a loud voice recounted his exploits. 
than the music and dance began anew, till another warrior caught the martial fire and bounded into the circle to brandish his tomahawk and vaunt his prowess. On the 1st of March, Gist took leave of Pickawillany and returned towards the Ohio. He would have gone to the falls where Louisville now stands, but for a band of French Indians reported to be there, who would probably have killed him. After visiting a deposit of mammoth bones on the south shore, long the wonder of the traders, he turned eastward, crossed with toil and difficulty the mountains about the sources of the Kanawha, and after an absence of seven months reached his frontier home on the Yadkin, whence he proceeded to Roanoke with the report of his journey. All looked well for the English in the west, but under this fair outside lurked danger. The Miamis were hearty in the English cause, and so perhaps were the Shoanoes, but the Delawares had not forgotten the wrongs that drove them from their old abodes east of the Alleghanies, while the Mingos, or emigrant Iroquois, like their brethren of New York, felt the influence of John Kerr and other French agents, who spared no efforts to seduce them. Still more baneful to English interests were the apathy and dissensions of the British colonies themselves. The Ohio Company had built a trading house at Wills Creek, a branch of the Potomac, to which the Indians resorted in great numbers, whereupon the jealous traders of Pennsylvania told them that the Virginians meant to steal away their lands. This confirms what they had been taught by the French emissaries, whose intrigues it powerfully aided. The governors of New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia saw the importance of Indian alliances, and felt their own responsibility in regard to them, but they could do nothing without their assemblies. Those of New York and Pennsylvania were largely composed of tradesmen and farmers, absorbed in local interests, and possessed by two motives, the saving of people's money and opposition to the governor, who stood for the royal prerogative. It was Hamilton of Pennsylvania who had sent Crowan to the Miamis to renew the chain of friendship, and when the envoy returned, the assembly rejected his report. I was condemned, he says, for bringing expense on the government, and the Indians were neglected. In the same year, Hamilton again sent him over the mountains with a present for the Mingos and Delawares. Crowan succeeded in persuading them that it would be for their good if the English should build a fortified trading house at the fork of the Ohio, where Pittsburgh now stands and they made a formal request to the governor that it should be built accordingly. But in the words of Crowan, the assembly rejected the proposal and condemned me for making such a report. Yet this post on the Ohio was vital to English interests. Even the pens, proprietaries of the province, never lavish of their money, offered four hundred pounds towards the cost of it, besides a hundred a year towards its maintenance. But the assembly would not listen. The Indians were so well convinced that a strong English trading station in their country would add to their safety and comfort that when Pennsylvania refused it, they repeated the proposal to Virginia, but here too it found for the present little favor. The question of disputed boundaries had much to do with this most impolitic inaction. A large part of the valley of the Ohio, including the site of the proposed establishment, was claimed by both Pennsylvania and Virginia, and each feared that whatever money it might spend there would turn to the profit of the other. This was not the only evil that sprang from uncertain ownership. Till the line is run between the two provinces, 
says Dinwiddie, governor of Virginia, I cannot appoint magistrates to keep the traders in good order. Hence they did what they pleased, and often gave umbrage to the Indians. Clinton of New York appealed to his assembly for means to assist Pennsylvania in securing the fidelity of the Indians on the Ohio, and the assembly refused. We will take care of our Indians, and they may take care of theirs. Such was the spirit of their answer. He wrote to the various provinces, inviting them to send commissioners to meet the tribes at Albany, in order to defeat the designs and intrigues of the French. All turned a deaf ear except Massachusetts, Connecticut, and South Carolina, who sent the commissioners, but supplied them very meagerly with the indispensable presents. Clinton says further, The assembly of this province have not given one farthing for Indian affairs, nor for a year past have they provided for the subsistence of the garrison at Oswego, which is the key for the commerce between the colonies and the inland nations of Indians. In the heterogeneous structure of the British colonies, their clashing interests, their internal disputes, and the misplaced economy of pennywise and short-sighted assemblymen, lay the hope of France. The rulers of Canada knew the vast numerical preponderance of their rivals, but with their centralized organization they felt themselves more than a match for any one English colony alone. They hoped to wage war under the guise of peace, and to deal with the enemy in detail, and they at length perceived that the fork of the Ohio, so strangely neglected by the English, formed, together with Niagara, the key of the Great West. Could France hold firmly these two controlling passes, she might almost boast herself mistress of the continent. End of section 5section six of montcalm and wolfe by francis parkman this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three part one seventeen forty nine to seventeen fifty three conflict for the west the iroquois or five nations sometimes called six nations after the tuscaroras joined them had been a power of high importance in American international politics. In a certain sense, they may be said to have held the balance between their French and English neighbors, but their relative influence had of late declined. So many of them had emigrated and joined the tribes of the Ohio that the center of Indian population had passed to that region. Nevertheless, the five nations were still strong enough in their ancient abodes to make their alliance an object of the utmost consequence to both the European rivals. At the western end of their longhouse, or belt of confederated villages, Jonquere intrigued to gain them for France, while in the east he was counteracted by the young colonel of militia William Johnson, who lived on the Mohawk, and was already well skilled in managing Indians. Johnson sometimes lost his temper, and once wrote to Governor Clinton to complain of the confounded wicked things the French had infused into the Indians' heads, among the rest that the English were determined, the first opportunity, to destroy them all. I assure your excellency I had hard work to beat these and several other cursed villainous things told them by the French out of their heads. In former times the French had hoped to win over the five nations in a body by wholesale conversion to the faith, but the attempt had failed. They had, however, made within their own limits an asylum for such converts as they could gain, 
whom they collected together at Caughnawaga, near Montreal, to the number of about three hundred warriors. These could not be trusted to fight their kinsmen, but willingly made forays against the English borders. Caughnawaga, like various other Canadian missions, was divided between the church, the army, and the fur trade. It had a chapel, fortifications, and storehouses. Two Jesuits, an officer, and three chief traders. Of these last, two were maiden ladies, the Demoiselles de Saunières, and one of the Jesuits, their friend Father Turnois, was their partner in business. They carried on by means of the Mission Indians, and in collusion with influential persons in the colony, a trade with the Dutch at Albany, illegal but very profitable. Besides this Iroquois mission, which was chiefly composed of Mohawks and Oneidas, another was now begun farther westward, to win over the Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas. This was the establishment of Father Piquet, which Celeron had visited in its infancy when on his way to the Ohio, and again on his return. Piquet was a man in the prime of life of an alert, vivacious countenance, by no means unprepossessing, an enthusiastic schemer with great executive talents, ardent, energetic, vain, self-confident, and boastful. The enterprise seems to have been of his own devising, but it found warm approval from the government. La Presentation, as he called the new mission, stood on the bank of the river Oswegachi, where it enters the St. Lawrence. Here the rapids ceased, and navigation was free to Lake Ontario. The place commanded the main river, and could bar the way to hostile war parties or contraband traders. Rich meadows, forests, and abundance of fish and game made it attractive to Indians, and the Ozugachi gave access to the Iroquois towns. Piquet had chosen his site with great skill. His activity was admirable. His first stockade was burned by Indian incendiaries, but it rose quickly from its ashes, and within a year or two the mission of La Presentation had a fort of palisades flanked with blockhouses, a chapel, a storehouse, a barn, a stable, ovens, a sawmill, broad fields of corn and beans, and three villages of Iroquois, containing in all forty-nine bark lodges, each holding three or four families, more or less converted to the faith, and as time went on, this number increased. The governor had sent a squad of soldiers to man the fort, and five small cannon to mount upon it. The place was as safe for the new proselytes as it was convenient and agreeable. The Pennsylvanian interpreter, Conrad Weiser, was told at Onondaga, the Iroquois capital, that Piquet had made a hundred converts from that place alone, and having clothed them all in very fine clothes, laced with silver and gold, he took them down and presented them to the French governor at Montreal, who received them very kindly and made them large presents. Such were some of the temporal attractions of La Presentation. The nature of the spiritual instruction bestowed by Piquet and his fellow priests may be partly inferred from the words of a proselyte warrior, who declared with enthusiasm that he had learned from the Sulpician ministry that the King of France was the eldest son of the wife of Jesus Christ. This he, of course, took in a literal sense, the mystic idea of the church as the spouse of Christ being beyond his savage comprehension. 
The effect was to stimulate his devotion to the great Onontio beyond the sea, and to the lesser Onontio who represented him as governor of Canada. Piquet was elated by his success, and early in 1752 he wrote to the governor and intendant, it is a great miracle that, in spite of envy, contradiction, and opposition from nearly all the Indian villages, I have formed in less than three years one of the most flourishing missions in Canada. I find myself in a position to extend the empire of my good masters, Jesus Christ and the King, even to the extremities of this new world and with some little help from you to do more than France and England have been able to do with millions of money and all their troops. The letter from which this is taken was written to urge upon the government a scheme in which the zealous priest could see nothing impracticable. He proposed to raise a war party of 3,800 Indians, eighteen hundred of whom were to be drawn from the Canadian missions, the Five Nations, and the tribes of the Ohio, while the remaining two thousand were to be furnished by the Flatheads, or Choctaws, who were at the same time to be supplied with missionaries. The united force was first to drive the English from the Ohio, and next attack the Dog tribe, or Cherokees, who lived near the borders of Virginia, with the people of which they were on friendly terms. If, says Piquet, the English of Virginia give any help to this last-named tribe, which will not fail to happen, they, the war party, will do their utmost against them, though a grudge they bear them by reason of some old quarrels. In other words, the missionary hopes to set a host of savages to butchering English settlers in time of peace. His wild project never took effect, though the governor, he says, at first approved it. In the preceding year, the Apostle of the Iroquois, as he was called, made a journey to muster recruits for his mission, and kept a copious diary on the way. By accompanying him, one gets a clear view of an important part of the region in dispute between the rival nations. Six Canadians paddled him up the St. Lawrence, and five Indian converts followed in another canoe. Emerging from among the Thousand Islands, they stopped at Fort Frontenac, where Kingston now stands. Once the place was a great resort of Indians. Now none were here, for the English post of Oswego, on the other side of the lake, had greater attractions. Piquet and his company found the pork and bacon very bad, and he complains that there was not enough brandy in the fort to wash a wound. They crossed to a neighboring island, where they were soon visited by the chaplain of the fort, the storekeeper, his wife, and three young ladies, glad of an excursion to relieve the monotony of the garrison. My hunters, says P.K., had supplied me with the means of giving them a pretty good entertainment. We drank, with all our hearts, the health of the authorities, temporal and ecclesiastical, to the sound of our musketry, which was very well fired, and delighted the islanders. These islanders were a band of Indians who lived here. Piquet gave them a feast, then discoursed of religion, and at last persuaded them to remove to the new mission. During eight days, he and his party coasted the northern shore of Lake Ontario, with various incidents, such as an encounter between his dog Cerberus and a wolf, to the disadvantage of the latter, and the meeting with a very fine negro of twenty-two years, a fugitive from Virginia. 
On the 26th of June, they reached the new fort of Toronto, which offered a striking contrast to their last stopping place. The wine here is of the best. There is nothing wanting in this fort. Everything is abundant, fine, and good. There was reason for this. The northern Indians were flocking with their beaver skins to the English of Oswego, and in April 1749, an officer named Portneuf had been sent with soldiers and workmen to build a stockaded trading house at Toronto in order to intercept them, not by force, which would have been ruinous to French interests, but by a tempting supply of goods and brandy. Thus the fort was kept well stocked, and with excellent effect. Piquet found here a band of Mississaugas, who would otherwise no doubt have carried their furs to the English. He was strongly impelled to persuade them to migrate to La Presentation, but the governor had told him to confine his efforts to other tribes, and lest, he says, the ardor of his zeal should betray him to disobedience, he re-embarked and encamped six leagues from temptation. Two more days brought him to Niagara, where he was warmly received by the commandant, the chaplain, and the storekeeper, the triumvirate who ruled these forest outposts, and stood respectively for then three vital principles, war, religion, and trade. Here Piquet said mass, and after resting a day, set out for the trading house at the portage of the cataract, recently built, like Toronto, to stop the Indians on their way to Oswego. Here he found Jonquere, and here also was encamped a large band of Senecas, though being all drunk, men, women, and children, they were in no condition to receive the faith, or appreciate the temporal advantages that attended it. On the next morning, finding them partially sober, he invited them to remove to La Presentation. But as they had still something left in their bottles, I could get no answer till the following day. I pass in silence, pursues the missionary, an affinity of talks on this occasion. Monsieur de Jonquere forgot nothing that could help me, and behaved like a great servant of God and the King. My recruits increased every moment. I went to say my breviary, while my Indians and the Senecas, without loss of time, assembled to hold a council with Monsieur le Jonquere. The result of the council was an entreaty to the missionary not to stop at Oswego, lest evil should befall him at the hands of the English. He promised to do as they wished, and presently set out on his return to Fort Niagara, attended by Jonquere and a troop of his new followers. The journey was a triumphal progress. Whenever was passed a camp or a wigwam, the Indians saluted me by firing their guns, which happened so often that I thought all the trees along the way were charged with gunpowder. And when we reached the fort, Monsieur de Becancourt received us with great ceremony and the firing of cannon, by which my savages were infinitely flattered. His neophytes were gathered into the chapel for the first time in their lives, and there rewarded with a few presents. He now prepared to turn homeward, his flock at the mission being left in his absence without a shepherd, and on the 6th of July he embarked, followed by a swarm of canoes. On the 12th they stopped at the Genesee and went to visit the falls, where the city of Rochester now stands. On the way, the Indians found a populous resort of rattlesnakes, and attacked the gregarious reptiles with great animation, 
to the alarm of the missionary, who trembled for his bare-legged retainers. His fears proved needless. Forty-two dead snakes, as he avers, requited the efforts of the sportsmen, and not one of them was bitten. When he returned to camp in the afternoon, he found there a canoe loaded with kegs of brandy. The English, he says, had sent it to meet us, well knowing that this was the best way to cause disorder among my new recruits and make them desert me. The Indian in charge of the canoe, who had the look of a great rascal, offered some to me first, and then to my Canadians and Indians. I gave out that it was very probably poisoned, and immediately embarked again. He encamped on the 14th at Sodus Bay, and strongly advises the planting of a French fort there. Nevertheless, he adds, it would be still better to destroy Oswego, and on no account let the English build it again. On the 16th he came in sight of this dreaded post. Several times on the way he had met fleets of canoes going thither or returning, in spite of the rival attractions of Toronto and Niagara. No English establishment on the continent was of such ill omen to the French. It not only robbed them of the fur trade by which they lived, but threatened them with military and political no less than commercial ruin. They were in constant dread lest ships of war should be built here, strong enough to command Lake Ontario, thus separating Canada from Louisiana and cutting New France asunder. To meet this danger they soon after built at Fort Frontenac a large three-masted vessel mounted with heavy cannon, thus, as usual, forestalling their rivals by promptness of action. The ground on which Oswego stood was claimed by the province of New York, which alone had control of it, but through the purblind apathy of the assembly and their incessant quarrels with the governor, it was commonly left to take care of itself. For some time they would vote no money to pay the feeble little garrison, and Clinton, who saw the necessity of maintaining it, was forced to do so on his own personal credit. Why can't your governor and your great men, the assembly, agree? asked a Mohawk chief of the interpreter, Conrad Weezer. P.K. kept his promise not to land at the English fort, but he approached in his canoe and closely observed it. The shores, now covered by the city of Oswego, were then a desolation of bare hills and fields, studded with the stumps of felled trees and hedged about with a grim border of forests. Near the strand, by the mouth of the Onondaga, were the houses of some of the traders, and on the higher ground behind them stood a huge blockhouse with a projecting upper story. This building was surrounded by a rough wall of stone, with flankers at the angles, forming what was called the fort. Piquet reconnoitred it from his canoe with the eye of a soldier. It is commanded, he says, on almost every side. Two batteries of three twelve-pounders each would be more than enough to reduce it to ashes, and he enlarges on the evils that arise from it. It not only spoils our trade, but puts the English into communication with a vast number of our Indians, far and near. It is true that they like our brandy better than English rum, but they prefer English goods to ours and can buy for two beaver skins at Oswego a better silver bracelet than we sell at Niagara for ten. The burden of these reflections was lightened when he approached Fort Frontenac. Never was reception more solemn. The Nipissings and Algonquins, 
who were going on a war party with Monsieur Belletre, formed a line of their own accord and saluted us with three volleys of musketry and cries of joy without end. All our little bark vessels replied in the same way. Monsieur de Vercherche and Monsieur de Valtry ordered the cannon of the fort to be fired, and my Indians, transported with joy at the honor done them, shot off their guns incessantly with cries and acclamations that delighted everybody. A goodly band of recruits joined him, and he pursued his voyage to La Presentation, while the canoes of his proselytes followed him in a swarm to their new home. That establishment, thus in a burst of enthusiasm he closes his journal, that establishment which I began two years ago, in the midst of opposition, that establishment which may be regarded as a key of the colony, that establishment which officers, interpreters, and traders thought a chimera, that establishment, I say, forms already a mission of Iroquois savages, whom I assembled at first to the number of only six, increased last year to eighty-seven, and this year to three hundred and ninety-six, without counting more than a hundred and fifty, whom Monsieur Chabert de Jonquere is to bring me this autumn, and I certify that thus far I have received from His Majesty, for all favor, grace, and assistance, no more than a half pound of bacon and two pounds of bread for daily rations, and that he has not yet given a pin to the chapel, which I have maintained out of my own pocket, for the greater glory of my masters, God and the King. End of section 6「Section seven of Mont Carmen Wolf by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three, part two. In his late journey, he had made the entire circuit of Lake Ontario. Beyond lay four other inland oceans, to which Fort Niagara was the key as that all-essential post controlled the passage from Ontario to Erie, so did Fort Detroit control that from Erie to Huron, and Fort Michilimackinac that from Huron to Michigan, while Fort St. Marie, at the outlet of Lake Superior, had lately received the garrison and changed from a mission and trading station to a post of war. This immense extent of inland navigation was safe in the hands of France, so long as she held Niagara. Niagara lost, not only the lakes, but also the valley of the Ohio was lost with it. Next in importance was Detroit. This was not a military post alone, but also a settlement and, except the hamlets about Fort Chartres, the only settlement that France owned in all the West. There were, it is true, but a few families, yet the hope of growth seemed good, for to such as liked a wilderness home, no spot in America had more attraction. Father Bonnecamp stopped here for a day on his way back from the expedition of Celeron. The situation, he says, is charming. A fine river flows at the foot of the fortifications. Vast meadows, asking only to be tilled, extend beyond the site. Nothing can be more agreeable than the climate. Winter lasts hardly two months. European grains and fruits grow here far better than in many parts of France. It is the Touraine and Bossy of Canada. The white flag of the Bourbons floated above the compact little palisaded town, 
with its population of soldiers and fur traders, and from the blockhouses which served as bastions. One saw on either hand the small, solid dwellings of the habitants ranged at intervals along the margin of the water, while at a little distance three Indian villages, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Wyandot, curled their wigwam smoke into the pure summer air. When Celeron de Bienville returned from the Ohio, he went with a royal commission sent him a year before to command at Detroit. His late chaplain, the very intelligent Father Bonnecamp, speaks of him as fearless, energetic, and full of resource, but the governor calls him haughty and insubordinate. Great efforts were made at the same time to build up Detroit as a center of French power in the West. The methods employed were of the debilitating, paternal character long familiar to Canada. All emigrants with families were to be gathered thither at the king's expense, and every settler was to receive in free gift a gun, a hoe, an axe, a ploughshare, a scythe, a sickle, two augers, large and small, a sow, six hens, a cock, six pounds of powder, and twelve pounds of lead, while to these favors were added many others. The result was that twelve families were persuaded to go, or about a twentieth part of the number wanted. Detroit was expected to furnish supplies to the other posts for five hundred miles around, control the neighboring Indians, thwart English machinations, and drive off English interlopers. La Galassonniere no longer governed Canada. He had been honorably recalled, and the Marquis de la Jonquière sent in his stead. La Jonquière, like his predecessor, was a naval officer of high repute. He was tall and imposing in person, and of undoubted capacity and courage, but old, and according to his enemies, very avaricious. The colonial minister gave him special instructions regarding that thorn in the side of Canada, Oswego. To attack it openly would be indiscreet, as the two nations were at peace. But there was a way of dealing with it less hazardous, if not more lawful. This was to attack it vicariously by means of the Iroquois. If Abbe Piquet succeeds in his mission, wrote the minister to the new governor, we can easily persuade these savages to destroy Oswego. This is of the utmost importance, but act with great caution. In the next year the minister wrote again, the only means that can be used for such an operation in time of peace are those of the Iroquois. If by making these savages regard such an establishment, Oswego, as opposed to their liberty, and, so to speak, a usurpation by which the English mean to get possession of their lands, they could be induced to undertake its destruction an operation of the sort is not to be neglected. But Monsieur le Marquis de la Jonquière should feel with what circumspection such an affair should be conducted, and he should labor to accomplish it in a manner not to commit himself. To this, la Jonquière replies that it will need time, but he will gradually bring the Iroquois to attack and destroy the English post. He received stringent orders to use every means to prevent the English from encroaching, but to act towards them at the same time with the greatest politeness. This last injunction was scarcely fulfilled in a correspondence which he had with Clinton, governor of New York, 
who had written to complain of the new post at the Niagara Portage as an invasion of English territory, and also of the arrest of four English traders in the country of the Miamis. Niagara, like Oswego, was in the country of the Five Nations, whom the Treaty of Utrecht declared subject to the dominion of Great Britain. This declaration, preposterous in itself, was binding on France, whose plenipotentiaries had signed the treaty. The treaty also provided that the subjects of the two crowns shall enjoy full liberty of going and coming on account of trade, and Clinton therefore demanded that La Jonquière should disavow the arrest of the four traders and punish its authors. The French governor replied with great asperity, spurned the claim that the five nations were British subjects, and justified the arrest. He presently went further. Rewards were offered by his officers for the scalps of Crohn and of another trader named Lowry. When this reached the ears of William Johnson on the Mohawk, he wrote to Clinton in evident anxiety for his own scalp, if the French go on so, there is no man can be safe in his own house, for I can at any time get an Indian to kill any man for a small matter. Their going on in that manner is worse than open war. The French, on their side, made counter-accusations. The captive traders were examined on oath before La Jonquière, and one of them, John Patton, is reported to have said that Crohan had instigated Indians to kill Frenchmen. French officials declared that other English traders were guilty of the same practices, and there is very little doubt that the charge was true. The dispute with the English was not the only source of trouble to the governor. His superiors at Versailles would not adopt his views, and looked on him with distrust. He advised the building of forts near Lake Erie, and his advice was rejected. Niagara and Detroit, he was told, will secure forever our communications with Louisiana. His Majesty again wrote the colonial minister, thought that expenses would diminish after the peace, but on the contrary they have increased. There must be great abuses. You and the intendant must look into it. Great abuses there were, and of the money sent to Canada for the service of the king, the larger part found its way into the pockets of peculators. The colony was eaten to the heart with official corruption, and the center of it was Francois Bigot, the intendant. The minister directed La Jonquière's attention to certain malpractices which had been reported to him, and the old man, deeply touched, replied, I have reached the age of sixty-six years, and there is not a drop of blood in my veins that does not thrill for the service of my king. I will not conceal from you that the slightest suspicion on your part against me would cut the thread of my days. Perplexities increased. Affairs in the West grew worse and worse. La Jonquière ordered Celeron to attack the English at Picawillany, and Celeron could not or would not obey. I cannot express, writes the governor, how much this business troubles me. It robs me of sleep. It makes me ill. Another letter of rebuke presently came from Versailles. Last year you wrote that you would soon drive the English from the Ohio, but private letters say that you have done nothing. This is deplorable. If not expelled, they will seem to acquire a right against us. Send force enough at once to drive them off and cure them of all wish to return. La Jonquière answered with bitter complaints against Celeron, 
and then begged to be recalled. His health, already shattered, was ruined by fatigue and vexation, and he took to his bed. Before spring he was near his end. It is said that, though very rich, his habits of thrift so possessed his last hours that seeing wax candles burning in his chamber, he ordered others of tallow to be brought instead, as being good enough to die by. Thus frugally lighted on his way, his spirit fled, and the Baron de Longuet took his place till a new governor should arrive. Sinister tidings came thick from the west. Raymond, commandant at the French fort on the Maumee, close to the centre of intrigue, wrote, My people are leaving me for Detroit. Nobody wants to stay here and have his throat cut. All the tribes who go to the English at Pickawillani come back loaded with gifts. I am too weak to meet the danger. Instead of twenty men, I need five hundred. We have made peace with the English, yet they try continually to make war on us by means of the Indians. They intend to be masters of all this upper country. The tribes here are leaguing together to kill all the French, that they may have nobody on their lands but their English brothers. This I am told by Coldfoot, a great Miami chief, whom I think an honest man, if there is any such thing among Indians. If the English stay in this country we are lost, we must attack and drive them out. And he tells of war belts sent from tribe to tribe, and rumors of plots and conspiracies far and near. Without doubt, the English traders spared no pains to gain over the Indians by fair means or foul, sold them goods at low rates, made ample gifts, and gave gunpowder for the asking. St. Ange, who commanded at Vincennes, wrote that a storm would soon burst on the heads of the French. Jean Caire reported that all the Ohio Indians sided with the English. Longuet informed the minister that the Miamis had scalped two soldiers, that the Pianchi Shores had killed seven Frenchmen, and that a squaw who had lived with one of the slain declared that the tribes of the Wabash and Illinois were leaguing with the Osages for a combined insurrection. Every letter brought news of murder. Smallpox had broken out at Detroit. It is to be wished, says Longuet, that it would spread among our rebels. It would be fully as good as an army. We are menaced with a general outbreak, and even Toronto is in danger. Before long, the English on the Miami will gain over all the surrounding tribes, get possession of Fort Chartres, and cut our communications with Louisiana. The moving spirit of disaffection was the chief called Old Britain, or the Demoiselle, and its focus was his town of Picawillani on the Miami. At this place it is said that English traders sometimes mustered to the number of fifty or more. It is they, wrote Longuet, who are the instigators of revolt, and are the source of all our woes. Whereupon the colonial minister reiterated his instructions to drive them off and plunder them, which he thought would effectually disgust them, and bring all trouble to an end. La Jonquière's remedy had been more heroic, for he had ordered Celeron to attack the English and their red allies alike, and he charged that officer with arrogance and disobedience, because he had not done so. It is not certain that obedience was easy, for though besides the garrison of regulars, 
a strong body of militia was sent up to Detroit to aid the stroke. The Indians of that post, whose cooperation was thought necessary, proved half-hearted, intractable, and even touched with disaffection. Thus the enterprise languished till, in June, aid came from another quarter. Charles Langlade, a young French trader married to a squaw at Green Bay, and strong in influence with the tribes of that region, came down the lakes from Michilimackinac with a fleet of canoes, manned by two hundred and fifty Ottawa and Ojibwa warriors, stopped a while at Detroit, then embarked again, paddled up the Maumee to Raymond's fort at the portage, and led his greased and painted rabble through the forest to attack the demoiselle and his English friends. They approached Picawillani at about nine o'clock on the morning of the 21st. The scared squaws fled from the cornfields into the town, where the wigwams of the Indians clustered about the fortified warehouse of the traders. Of these, there were at the time only eight in the place. Most of the Indians were gone on their summer hunt, though the demoiselle remained with a band of his tribesmen. Great was the screeching of war-whoops and clatter of guns. Three of the traders were caught outside the fort. The remaining five closed the gate and stood on their defense. The fight was soon over. Fourteen Miamis were shot down, the demoiselle among the rest. The five white men held out till the afternoon, when three of them surrendered, and two, Thomas Burney and Andrew McBriar, made their escape. One of the English prisoners being wounded, the victors stabbed him to death. Seventy years of missionaries had not weaned them from cannibalism, and they boiled and ate the demoiselle. The captive traders, plundered to the skin, were carried by Lang Laid to Duquesne, the new governor, who highly praised the bold leader of the enterprise, and recommended him to the minister for such reward as befitted one of his station. As he is not in the king's service, and has married a squaw, I will ask for him only a pension of two hundred francs, which will flatter him infinitely. The Marquis Duquesne, sprung from the race of the great naval commander of that name, had arrived towards midsummer, and he began his rule by a general review of troops and militia. His lofty bearing offended the Canadians, but he compelled their respect and according to a writer of the time, showed from the first that he was born to command. He presently took in hand an enterprise which his predecessor would probably have accomplished, had the home government encouraged him. Duquesne, profiting by the infatuated neglect of the British provincial assemblies, prepared to occupy the upper waters of the Ohio, and secure the passes with forts and garrisons. Thus the Virginian and Pennsylvanian traders would be debarred all access to the west, and the tribes of that region, bereft henceforth of English guns, knives, hatchets, and blankets, English gifts, and English cajoleries, would be thrown back to complete dependence on the French. The moral influence, too, of such a movement would be incalculable, for the Indian respects nothing so much as a display of vigor and daring, backed by force. In short, the intended enterprise was a masterstroke, and laid the axe to the very root of disaffection. It is true that under the treaty commissioners had been long in session at Paris, to settle the question of American boundaries, but there was no likelihood that they would come to agreement, and if France would make good her western claims, it behooved her, while there was yet time, 
to prevent her rival from fastening a firm grasp on the countries in dispute. Yet the colonial minister regarded the plan with distrust. Be on your guard, he wrote to Duquesne, against new undertakings. Private interests are generally at the bottom of them. It is through these that new posts are established. Keep only such as are indispensable and suppress the others. The expenses of the colony are enormous, and they have doubled since the peace. Again, a little later, build on the Ohio such forts as are absolutely necessary, but no more. Remember that His Majesty suspects your advisers of interested views. No doubt there was justice in the suspicion. Every military movement, and above all the establishment of every new post, was an opportunity to the official thieves with whom the colony swarmed. Some band of favored knaves grew rich, while a much greater number excluded from sharing the illicit profits clamored against the undertaking and wrote charges of corruption to Versailles. Thus the minister was kept tolerably well informed, but was scarcely the less helpless, for with the Atlantic between, the disorders of Canada defied his control. Duquesne was exasperated by the opposition that met him on all hands, and wrote to the minister, There are so many rascals in this country that one is forever on the butt of their attacks. It seems that unlawful gain was not the only secret spring of the movement. An officer of repute says that the intendant, Bigot, enterprising in his pleasures as in his greed, was engaged in an intrigue with the wife of Chevalier Pion, and wishing at once to console the husband and to get rid of him, sought for him a high command at a distance from the colony. Therefore, while Marin, an able officer, was made first in rank, Pion was made second, the same writer hints that Duquesne himself was influenced by similar motives in his appointment of leaders. He mustered the colony troops and ordered out the Canadians. With the former he was but half satisfied, with the latter he was delighted, and he praises highly their obedience and alacrity. I had not the least trouble in getting them to march. They came on the minute, bringing their own guns, though many people tried to excite them to revolt, for the whole colony opposes my operations. The expedition set out early in the spring of 1753. The whole force was not much above a thousand men, increased by subsequent detachments to 1,500, but to the Indians it seemed a mighty host, and one of their orators declared that the lakes and rivers were covered with boats and soldiers from Montreal to Presqu'isle. Isle. Some Mohawk hunters by the St. Lawrence saw them as they passed, and hastened home to tell the news to Johnson, whom they awakened at midnight, whooping and hollowing in a frightful manner. Lieutenant Holland at Oswego saw a fleet of canoes upon the lake, and was told by a roving Frenchman that they belonged to an army of six thousand men going to the Ohio to cause all the English to quit those parts. The main body of the expedition landed at Presqu'isle on the southeastern shore of Lake Erie, where the town of Erie now stands, and here, for a while, we leave them. End of section 7《Section 8 of Montcalm and Wolf by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 1, 1710 to 1754. Conflict for Acadia. 
while in the west all the signs of the sky foreboded storm another tempest was gathering the east less in extent but not less in peril the conflict in acadia has a melancholy interest since it ended in a catastrophe which prose and verse have joined to commemorate but of which the causes have not been understood acadia that is to say the peninsula of nova scotia with the addition as the english claimed of the present new brunswick and some adjacent country was conquered by general nicholson in seventeen ten and formally transferred by france to the british crown three years later by the treaty of utrecht by that treaty it was expressly provided that such of the french inhabitants as are willing to remain there and to be subject to the kingdom of great britain are to enjoy the free exercise of their religion according to the usage of the church of rome as far as the laws of great britain do allow the same but that any who choose may remove with their effects if they do so within a year very few availed themselves of this right and after the end of the year those who remained were required to take an oath of allegiance to king george there is no doubt that in a little time they would have complied had they been let alone but the french authorities of canada and cape breton did their utmost to prevent them and employed agents to keep them hostile to england of these the most efficient were the french priests who in spite of the treaty persuaded their flocks that they were still subjects of king louis hence rose endless perplexity to the english commanders at annapolis who more than suspected that the indian attacks with which they were harassed were due mainly to french instigation it was not till seventeen years after the treaty that the acadians could be brought to take the oath without qualifications which made it almost useless the english authorities seem to have shown throughout an unusual patience and forbearance at length about seventeen thirty nearly all the inhabitants signed by crosses since few of them could write an oath recognizing george the second as sovereign of acadia and promising fidelity and obedience to him this restored comparative quiet till the war of seventeen forty five when some of the acadians remained neutral while some took arms against the english and many others aided the enemy with information and supplies english power in acadia hitherto limited to a feeble garrison at annapolis and a feebler one at canso received at this time a great accession the fortress of louisbourg taken by the english during the war had been restored by the treaty and the french at once prepared to make it a military and naval station more formidable than ever upon this the british ministry resolved to establish another station as a counterpoise and the harbour of chibucto on the south coast of acadia was chosen as the site of it thither in june 1749 came a fleet of transports loaded with emigrants tempted by offers of land and a home in the new world some were mechanics tradesmen farmers and laborers others were sailors soldiers and subaltern officers thrown out of employment by the peace including women and children they counted in all about twenty five hundred alone of all the british colonies on the continent this new settlement was the offspring 
not of private enterprise, but of royal authority. Yet it was free, like the rest, with the same popular representation and local self-government. Edward Cornwallis, uncle of Lord Cornwallis of the Revolutionary War, was made governor and commander-in-chief. Wolfe calls him a man of approved courage and fidelity, and even the caustic Horace Walpole speaks of him as a brave, sensible young man, of great temper and good nature. Before summer the streets were laid out, and the building lot of each settler was assigned to him. Before winter closed, the whole were under shelter. The village was fenced with palisades and defended by redoubts of timber, and the battalions, lately in garrison at Louisbourg, manned the wooden ramparts. Succeeding years brought more emigrants, and in 1752 the population was above 4,000. Thus was born into the world the city of Halifax. Along with the crumbling old fort and miserably disciplined garrison at Annapolis, besides six or seven small detached posts to watch the Indians and Acadians, it comprised the whole British force on the peninsula, for Canso had been destroyed by the French. The French had never reconciled themselves to the loss of Acadia, and were resolved, by diplomacy or force, to win it back again. But the building of Halifax showed that this was to be no easy task, and filled them at the same time with alarm for the safety of Louisbourg. On one point, at least, they saw their policy clear. The Acadians, though those of them who were not above thirty-five had been born under the British flag, must be kept French at heart, and taught that they were still French subjects. In 1748 they remembered eighty-eight hundred and fifty communicants, or from twelve to thirteen thousand souls. But an emigration of which the causes will soon appear had reduced them in 1752 to but little more than 9,000. These were divided into six principal parishes, one of the largest being that of Annapolis. Other centres of population were Grand Pré on the basis of mines, Beaubassin at the head of Chignecto Bay, Pisiquid, now Windsor, and Cobequid, now Truro. Their priests, who were missionaries controlled by the diocese of Quebec, acted also as their magistrates, ruling them for this world and the next. Bring subject to a French superior, and being moreover wholly French at heart, they formed in this British province a wheel within a wheel, the inner movement always opposing the outer. Although by the twelfth article of the Treaty of Utrecht, France had solemnly declared the Acadians to be British subjects, the government of Louis the Fifteenth intrigued continually to turn them from subjects into enemies. Before me is a mass of English documents on Acadian affairs from the Peace of Aix la Chapelle to the catastrophe of 1755, and above a thousand pages of French official papers from the archives of Paris, memorials, reports, and secret correspondence relating to the same matters. With the help of these and some collateral lights, it is not difficult to make a correct diagnosis of the political disease that ravaged this miserable country. Of a multitude of proofs, only a few can be given here, but these will suffice. It was not that the Acadians had been ill-used by the English. The reverse was the case. 
they had been left in free exercise of their worship, as stipulated by treaty. It is true that from time to time there were loud complaints from French officials that religion was in danger, because certain priests had been rebuked, arrested, brought before the council at Halifax, suspended from their functions, or required, on pain of banishment, to swear that they would do nothing against the interests of King George. Yet such action on the part of the provincial authorities seems, without a single exception, to have been the consequence of misconduct on the part of the priest, in opposing the government and stirring his flock to disaffection. La Jonquière, the determined adversary of the English, reported to the bishop that they did not oppose the ecclesiastics in the exercise of their functions, and an order of Louis the Fifteenth admits that the Acadians have enjoyed liberty of religion. In a long document addressed in 1750 to the colonial minister at Versailles, Roma, an officer at Louisbourg, testifies thus to the mildness of British rule, though he ascribes it to interested motives. The fear that the Acadians have of the Indians is the controlling motive which makes them side with the French. The English, having in view the conquest of Canada, wished to give the French of that colony, in their conduct towards the Acadians, a striking example of the mildness of their government, without raising the fortune of any of the inhabitants, they have supplied them for more than thirty-five years with the necessaries of life, often on credit and with an excess of confidence, without troubling their debtors, without pressing them, without wishing to force them to pay. They have left them an appearance of liberty so excessive that they have not intervened in their disputes or even punished their crimes. They have allowed them to refuse with insolence certain moderate rents payable in grain and lawfully due. They have passed over in silence the contemptuous refusal of the Acadians to take titles from them for the new lands which they chose to occupy. We know very well, pursues Roma, the fruits of this conduct in the last war, and the English know it also. Judge then what will be the wrath and vengeance of this cruel nation. The fruits to which Roma alludes were the hostilities, open or secret, committed by the Acadians against the English. He now ventures the prediction that the enraged conquerors will take their revenge by drafting all the young Acadians on board their ships of war, and there destroying them by slow starvation. He proved, however, a false prophet. The English governor merely required the inhabitants to renew their oath of allegiance without qualification or evasion. It was twenty years since the Acadians had taken such an oath, and meanwhile a new generation had grown up. The old oath pledged them to fidelity and obedience, but they averred that Philip's, then governor of the province, had given them, at the same time, assurance that they should not be required to bear arms against either French or Indians. In fact, such service had not been demanded of them, and they would have lived in virtual neutrality had not many of them broken their oaths and joined the French war parties. For this reason, Cornwallis thought it necessary that, in renewing the pledge, they should bind themselves to an allegiance as complete as that required of other British subjects. This spread general consternation. Deputies from the Acadian settlements appeared at Halifax, bringing a paper signed with the marks of a thousand persons. The following passage 
contains the pith of it. The inhabitants in general, sir, over the whole extent of this country, are resolved not to take the oath which your excellency requires of us but if your excellency will grant us our old oath with an exemption for ourselves and our heirs from taking up arms we will accept it the answer of cornwallis was by no means so stern as it has been represented after the formal reception he talked in private with the deputies and they went home in good humor, promising great things. The refusal of the Acadians to take the required oath was not wholly spontaneous, but was mainly due to influence from without. The French officials of Cape Breton and Isle St. John, now Prince Edward Island, exerted themselves to the utmost, chiefly through the agency of the priests, to excite the people to refuse any oath that should commit them fully to British allegiance. At the same time, means were used to induce them to migrate to the neighboring islands under French rule, and efforts were also made to set on the Indians to attack the English. But the plans of the French will best appear in a dispatch sent by La Jonquière to the colonial minister in the autumn of 1749. Monsieur Cornwallis issued an order on the 10th of the said month, August, to the effect that if the inhabitants will remain faithful subjects of the King of Great Britain, he will allow them priests and public exercise of their religion, with the understanding that no priest shall officiate without his permission or before taking an oath of fidelity to the king of great britain secondly that the inhabitants shall not be exempted from defending their houses their lands and the government thirdly that they shall take an oath of fidelity to the king of great britain on the twenty sixth of this month before officers sent them for that purpose La Jonquière proceeds to say that on hearing these conditions, the Acadians were filled with perplexity and alarm, and that he, the governor, had directed Boishebert, his chief officer on the Acadian frontier, to encourage them to leave their homes and seek asylum on French soil. He thus recounts the steps he has taken to harass the English of Halifax, by means of their Indian neighbors. As peace had been declared, the operation was delicate, and when three of these Indians came to him from their missionary, Le Loutre, with letters on the subject, La Jonquière was discreetly reticent. I did not care to give them any advice upon the matter, and confined myself to a promise that I would on no account abandon them and I have provided for supplying them with everything, whether arms, ammunition, food, or other necessaries. It is to be desired that these savages should succeed in thwarting the designs of the English, and even their settlement at Halifax. They are bent on doing so, and if they can carry out their plans, it is certain they will give the English great trouble and so harass them that they will be a great obstacle in their path. These savages are to act alone. Neither soldier nor French inhabitant is to join them. Everything will be done of their own motion, and without showing that I had any knowledge of the matter. This is very essential. Therefore I have written to the Sieur de Bourchebert to observe great prudence in his measures, and to act very secretly, in order that the English may not perceive that we are providing for the needs of the said savages. It will be the missionaries who will manage all the negotiation and direct the movements of the savages, who are in excellent hands, 
as the reverend father germain and monsieur l'abbe le loutre are very capable of making the most of them and using them to the greatest advantage for our interests they will manage their intrigue in such a way as not to appear in it la jonquiere then recounts the good results which he expects from these measures first the english will be prevented from making any new settlements secondly we shall gradually get the acadians out of their hands and lastly they will be so discouraged by constant indian attacks that they will renounce their pretensions to the parts of the country belonging to the king of france i feel monseigneur thus the government concludes his dispatch all the delicacy of this negotiation be assured that i will conduct it with such precaution that the english will not be able to say that my orders had any part in it he kept his word and so did the missionaries the indians gave great trouble on the outskirts of halifax and murdered many harmless settlers yet the english authorities did not at first suspect that they were hounded on by their priests under the direction of the governor of canada and with the privity of the minister at versailles more than this for looking across the sea we find royalty itself lending its august countenance to the machination among the letters read before the king in his cabinet in may seventeen fifty was one from de Cherbiers, then commanding at louisbourg saying that he was advising the acadians not to take the oath of allegiance to the king of england another from le loutre declaring that he and father germain were consulting together how to disgust the english with their enterprise of halifax and a third from the intendant bigot announcing that le loutre was using the indians to harass the new settlement and that he himself was sending them powder lead and merchandise to confirm them in their good designs to this the minister replies in a letter to de Cherbiers, his majesty is well satisfied with all you have done to thwart the english in their new establishment if the dispositions of the savages are such as they seem there is reason to hope that in the course of the winter they will succeed in so harassing the settlers that some of them will become disheartened the sherbiers is then told that his majesty desires him to aid english deserters in escaping from halifax supplies for the indians are also promised and he is informed that twelve medals are sent him by the frigate la mutine to be given to the chiefs who shall most distinguish themselves in another letter de cherbiers is enjoined to treat the english authorities with great politeness End of section eight. Section nine of Montcalm and Wolf by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four, part two. When Count Raymond took command at Louisbourg, he was instructed under the royal hand to give particular attention to the affairs of Acadia, especially in two points the management of the Indians and the encouraging of Acadian emigration to countries under French rule. His Majesty, says the document, has already remarked that the savages have been most favorably disposed. It is of the utmost importance that no means be neglected to keep them so. The missionaries among them are in a better position than anybody to contribute to this end, and His Majesty has reason to be satisfied with the pains they take therein. The Sieur de Raymond will excite these missionaries not to slacken their efforts, 
but he will warn them at the same time so to contain their zeal as not to compromise themselves with the English and give just occasion of complaint. That is, the king orders his representative to encourage the missionaries in instigating their flocks to butcher English settlers, but to see that they take care not to be found out. The injunction was hardly needed. Monsieur de Cherbiers, says a letter of earlier date, has engaged Abbe Le Loutre to distribute the usual presents among the savages, and Monsieur Bigot has placed in his hands an additional gift of cloth, blankets, powder, and ball, to be given them in case they harass the English at Halifax. This missionary is to induce them to do so. In spite of these efforts, the Indians began to relent in their hostilities, and when Longuet became provisional governor of Canada, he complained to the minister that it was very difficult to prevent them from making peace with the English, though Father Germain was doing his best to keep them on the war-path. La Jonquière, too, had done his best, even to the point of departing from his original policy of allowing no soldier or Acadian to take part with them. He had sent a body of troops under La Corne, an able partisan officer, to watch the English frontier, and in the same vessel was sent a supply of merchandise, guns, and munitions for the savages and Acadians who may take up arms with them, and the whole is sent under pretext of trading in furs with the savages. On another occasion, La Jonquière wrote, In order that the savages may do their part courageously, a few Acadians, dressed and painted in their way, could join them to strike the English. I cannot help consenting to what these savages do, because we have our hands tied by the peace, and so can do nothing ourselves. Besides, I do not think that any inconvenience will come of letting the Acadians mingle among them, because if they, the Acadians, are captured, we shall say that they acted of their own accord. In other words, he will encourage them to break the peace, and then, by means of falsehood, have them punished as felons. Many disguised Acadians did in fact join the Indian war parties, and their doing so was no secret to the English. What we call here an Indian war, wrote Hobson, successor of Cornwallis, is no other than a pretense for the French to commit hostilities on His Majesty's subjects. At length the Indians made peace, or pretended to do so. The chief of Le Loutre's mission, who called himself Major Jean-Baptiste Cope, came to Halifax with the deputation of his tribe, and they all affixed their totems to a solemn treaty. In the next summer they returned with ninety or a hundred warriors, were well entertained, presented with gifts, and sent homeward in a schooner. On the way they seized the vessel and murdered the crew. This is told by Prevost, intendant at Louisbourg, who does not say that French instigation had any part in the treachery. It is nevertheless certain that the Indians were paid for this or some contemporary murder, for Prevost, writing just four weeks later, says, Last month, the savages took eighteen English scalps, and Monsieur Le Loutre was obliged to pay them eighteen hundred livres, Acadian money, which I have reimbursed him. From the first, the services of this zealous missionary had been beyond price. Prevost testifies that though Cornwallis does his best to induce the Acadians to swear fidelity to King George, 
Le Loutre keeps them in allegiance to King Louis, and threatens to set his Indians upon them unless they declare against the English. I have already, adds Prevost, paid him 11,183 livres for his daily expenses, and I never cease advising him to be as economical as possible, and always to take care not to compromise himself with the English government. In consequence of good service to religion and the state, Le Loutre received a pension of 800 livres, as did also Maillard, his brother missionary on Cape Breton. The fear is, writes the colonial minister to the governor of Louisbourg, that their zeal may carry them too far, excite them to keep the Indians in our interests, but do not let them compromise us, act always so as to make the English appear as aggressors. All the Acadian clergy, in one degree or another, seem to have used their influence to prevent the inhabitants from taking the oath, and to persuade them that they were still French subjects. Some were noisy, turbulent, and defiant. Others were too tranquil to please the officers of the crown. A missionary at Annapolis is mentioned as old, and therefore inefficient, while the curé at Grand Pré also an elderly man, was too much inclined to confine himself to his spiritual functions. It is everywhere apparent that those who chose these priests and sent them as missionaries into a British province expected them to act as enemies of the British crown. The maxim is often repeated that duty to religion is inseparable from the duty to the King of France. The Bishop of Quebec desired the Abbe de Ile Dieu to represent to the court the need of more missionaries to keep the Acadians Catholic and French. But, he adds, there is danger that they, the missionaries, will be required to take an oath to do nothing contrary to the interests of the King of Great Britain. It is a wonder that such a pledge was not always demanded. It was exacted in a few cases, notably in that of Girard, priest at Cobequid, who on charges of instigating his flock to disaffection, had been sent prisoner to Halifax, but released on taking an oath in the above terms. Thereupon he wrote to Longay at Quebec that his parishioners wanted to submit to the English, and that he having sworn to be true to the British king, could not prevent them. Though I don't pretend to be a casuist, writes Longay, I could not help answering him that he is not obliged to keep such an oath, and that he ought to labor in all zeal to preserve and increase the number of the faithful. Girard, to his credit, preferred to leave the colony and retired to Ile Saint Jean. Cornwallis soon discovered to what extent the clergy stirred their flocks to revolt, and he wrote angrily to the Bishop of Quebec, Was it you who sent Le Loutre as a missionary to the Micmacs? And is it for their good that he excites these wretches to practice their cruelties against those who have shown them every kindness? The conduct of the priests of Acadia has been such that by command of his majesty I have published an order declaring that if any one of them presumes to exercise his functions without my express permission, he shall be dealt with according to the laws of England. The English, bound by treaty to allow the Acadians the exercise of their religion, at length conceived the idea of replacing the French priests by others to be named by the Pope at the request of the British government. This becoming known to the French greatly alarmed them, and the intendant at Louisbourg wrote to the minister 
that the matter required serious attention. It threatened, in fact, to rob them of their chief agents of intrigue. But their alarm proved needless, as the plan was not carried into execution. The French officials would have been better pleased had the conduct of Cornwallis been such as to aid their efforts to alienate the Acadians, and one writer, while confessing the favorable treatment of the English towards the inhabitants, denounces it as a snare. If so, it was a snare intended simply to reconcile them to English rule, nor was it without effect. We must give up altogether the idea of an insurrection in Acadia, writes an officer of Cape Breton. The Acadians cannot be trusted. They are controlled by fear of the Indians, which leads them to breathe French sentiments, even when their inclinations are English. They will yield to their interests, and the English will make it impossible that they should either hurt them or serve us, unless we take measures different from those we have hitherto pursued. During all this time, constant efforts were made to stimulate Acadian emigration to French territory, and thus to strengthen the French frontier. In this work, the chief agent was Le Loutre. This priest, says a French writer of the time, urged the people of Le Mine, Port Royal, Annapolis, and other places to come and join the French, and promised to all, in the name of the governor, to settle and support them for three years, and even indemnify them for any losses they might occur, threatening, if they did not do as he advised, to abandon them, deprive them of their priests, have their wives and children carried off, and their property laid waste by the Indians. Some passed over the Isthmus to the shores of the Gulf, and others made their way to the Strait of Canzo. Vessels were provided to convey them, in the one case to Ile Saint Jean, now Prince Edward Island, and in the other to Ile Royale called by the English Cape Breton. Some were eager to go, some went with reluctance, some would scarcely be persuaded to go at all. They leave their homes with great regret, reports the governor of Ile St. John, speaking of the people of Cobequid, and they began to move their luggage only when the savages compelled them. These savages were the flock of Abbe Le Loutre, who was on the spot to direct the emigration. Two thousand Acadians are reported to have left the peninsula before the end of 1751, and many more followed within the next two years. Nothing could exceed the misery of a great part of these emigrants, who had left perforce most of their effects behind. They became disheartened and apathetic. The intendant at Louisbourg says that they will not take the trouble to clear the land, and that some of them live, like Indians, under huts of spruce branches. The governor of Ile St. John declares that they are dying of hunger. Girard, the priest who had withdrawn to this island rather than break his oath to the English, writes, Many of them cannot protect themselves day or night from the severity of the cold. Most of the children are entirely naked, and when I go into a house they are all crouched in the ashes, close to the fire. They run off and hide themselves, without shoes, stockings, or shirts. They are not all reduced to this extremity, but nearly all are in want." Mortality among them was great, and would have been greater but for rations supplied by the French government. During these proceedings, the English governor, Cornwallis, seems to have justified the character of good temper given him by Horace Walpole. 
his attitude towards the Acadians remained, on the whole, patient and conciliatory. My friends, he replied to a deputation of them asking a general permission to leave the province, I am not ignorant of the fact that every means has been used to alienate the hearts of the French subjects of his Britannic majesty. Great advantages have been promised you elsewhere, and you have been made to imagine that your religion was in danger. Threats even have been resorted to in order to induce you to remove to French territory. The savages are made use of to molest you. They are to cut the throats of all who remain in their native country, attached to their own interests and faithful to the government. You know that certain officers and missionaries who came from Canada last autumn have been the cause of all our trouble during the winter. Their conduct has been horrible, without honor, probity, or conscience. Their aim is to embroil you with the government. I will not believe that they are authorized to do so by the court of France, that being contrary to good faith and the friendship established between the two crowns. What foundation there was for this amiable confidence in the court of Versailles has been seen already. When you declared your desire to submit yourselves to another government, pursues Cornwallis, our determination was to hinder nobody from following what he imagined to be his interest. We know that a forced service is worth nothing, and that a subject compelled to be so against his will is not far from being an enemy. We confess, however, that your determination to go gives us pain. We are aware of your industry and temperance, and that you are not addicted to any vice or debauchery. This province is your country. You and your fathers have cultivated it. Naturally, you ought yourselves to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Such was the design of the king, our master. You know that we have followed his orders. You know that we have done everything to secure to you not only the occupation of your lands, but the ownership of them forever. We have given you also every possible assurance of the free and public exercise of the Roman Catholic religion. But I declare to you, frankly, that according to our laws, nobody can possess lands or houses in the province who shall refuse to take the oath of allegiance to his king when required to do so. You know very well that there are ill-disposed and mischievous persons among you who corrupt the others. Your inexperience, your ignorance of the affairs of government, and your habit of following the counsels of those who have not your real interests at heart, make it an easy matter to seduce you. In your petitions, you ask for a general leave to quit the province. The only manner in which you can do so is to follow the regulations already established, and provide yourselves with our passport and we declare that nothing shall prevent us from giving such passports to all who ask for them. The moment peace and tranquillity are re-established. He declares as his reason for not giving them at once, that on crossing the frontier you will have to pass the French detachments and savages assembled there, and that they compel all the inhabitants who go there to take up arms against the English. How well this reason was founded will soon appear. Hopson, the next governor, described by the French themselves as a mild and peaceable officer, was no less considerate in his treatment of the Acadians, and at the end of 1752, he issued the following order to his military subordinates. You are to look on the French inhabitants in the same light as the rest of his majesty's subjects. 
as to the protection of the laws and government, for which reason nothing is to be taken from them by force, or any price set upon their goods but what they themselves agree to, and if at any time the inhabitants should obstinately refuse to comply with what His Majesty's service may require of them, you are not to redress yourself by military force or in any unlawful manner, but to lay the case before the governor and wait his orders thereon. Unfortunately, the mild rule of Cornwallis and Hobson was not always maintained under their successor, Lawrence. Louis Joseph Le Loutre, vicar general of Acadia and missionary to the Micmacs, was the most conspicuous person in the province, and more than any other man was answerable for the miseries that overwhelmed it. The sheep of which he was the shepherd dwelt at a day's journey from Halifax, by the banks of the river Shubenacadie, in small cabins of logs mixed with wigwams of birch bark. They were not a docile flock, and to manage them needed address, energy, and money, with all of which the missionary was provided. He fed their traditional dislike of the English, and fanned their fanaticism born of the villainous counterfeit of Christianity which he and his predecessors had imposed on them. Thus he contrived to use them on the one hand to murder the English, and on the other to terrify the Acadians, yet not without cost to the French government, for they had learned the value of money, and except when their blood was up, were slow to take scalps without pay. Le Loutre was a man of boundless egotism, a violent spirit of domination, an intense hatred of the English, and a fanaticism that stopped at nothing. Towards the Acadians he was a despot, and this simple and superstitious people, extremely susceptible to the influence of their priests, trembled before him. He was scarcely less masterful in his dealings with the Acadian clergy, and, aided by his quality of the bishop's vicar-general, he dragooned even the unwilling into aiding his schemes. Three successive governors of New France thought him invaluable, yet feared the impetuosity of his zeal and vainly tried to restrain it within safe bounds. The bishop, while approving his objects, thought his medicines too violent, and asked in a tone of reproof, Is it right for you to refuse the Acadians the sacraments, to threaten that they shall be deprived of the services of a priest, and that the savages shall treat them as enemies? Nobody says a French Catholic contemporary, was more fit than he to carry discord and desolation into a country. Cornwallis called him a good-for-nothing scoundrel and offered a hundred pounds for his head. End of section 9 Section 10 of Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 3. The authorities at Halifax, while exasperated by the perfidy practised on them, were themselves not always models of international virtue. They seized a French vessel in the Gulf of St. Lawrence on the charge, probably true, that she was carrying arms and ammunition to the Acadians and Indians. A less defensible act was the capture of the armed brig St. Francoise, laden with supplies for a fort lately re-established by the French at the mouth of the river St. John, on ground claimed by both nations. Captain Roux, 
a New England officer commanding a frigate in the Royal Navy, opened fire on the St. Francois, took her after a short cannonade, and carried her into Halifax, where she was condemned by the court. Several captures of small craft, accused of illegal acts, were also made by the English. These proceedings, being all of an overt nature, gave the officers of Louis the Fifteenth precisely what they wanted, an occasion for uttering loud complaints and denouncing the English as breakers of the peace. But the movement most alarming to the French was the English occupation of Beaubassin, an act perfectly lawful in itself, since without reasonable doubt the place was within the limits of Acadia, and therefore on English ground. Beaubassin was a considerable settlement on the isthmus that joins the Acadian peninsula to the mainland. Northwest of the settlement lay a wide marsh through which ran a stream called the Missaguache, some two miles beyond which rose a hill called Beauséjour. On and near this hill were stationed the troops and Canadians sent under Borchebert and La Corne to watch the English frontier. This French force excited disaffection among the Canadians through all the neighboring districts and constantly helped them to emigrate. Cornwallis therefore resolved to send an English force to the spot, and accordingly, towards the end of April 1750, Major Lawrence landed at Beaubassin with four hundred men. News of their approach had come before them, and Le Loutre was here with his Micmacs, mixed with some Acadians whom he had persuaded or bullied to join him. Resolved that the people of Beaubassin should not live under English influence, he now with his own hand set fire to the parish church, while his white and red adherents burned the houses of the inhabitants, and thus compelled them to cross to the French side of the river. This was the first forcible removal of the Acadians. It was as premature as it was violent, since Lawrence, being threatened by La Corne, whose force was several times greater than his own, presently re-embarked. In the following September he returned with seventeen small vessels and about seven hundred men, and again attempted to land on the strand of Beaubassin. La Jonquière says that he could only be resisted indirectly, because he was on the English side of the river. This indirect resistance was undertaken by Le Loutre, who had thrown up a breastwork along the shore and manned it with his Indians and his painted and befeathered Acadians. Nevertheless, the English landed, and with some loss drove out the defenders. Le Loutre himself seems not to have been among them, but they kept up for a time a helter-skelter fight, encouraged by two other missionaries, Germain and La Lerne, who were near being caught by the English. Lawrence quickly routed them, took possession of the cemetery, and prepared to fortify himself. The village of Beaubassin, consisting, it is said, of a hundred and forty houses, had been burned in the spring, but there were still in the neighborhood, on the English side, many hamlets and farms, with barns full of grain and hay. Le Loutre's Indians now threatened to plunder and kill the inhabitants if they did not take arms against the English. Few complied, and the greater part fled to the woods. On this the Indians and their Acadian allies set the houses and barns on fire, and laid waste the whole district, leaving the inhabitants no choice but to seek food and shelter with the French. 
the english fortified themselves on a low hill by the edge of the marsh planted palisades built barracks and named the new work fort lawrence slight skirmishes between them and the french were frequent neither party respected the dividing line of the missaguash and a petty warfare of aggression and reprisal began and became chronic before the end of the autumn there was an atrocious act of treachery among the english officers was captain edward howe an intelligent and agreeable person who spoke french fluently and had long been stationed in the province le loutre detested him dreading his influence over the acadians by many of whom he was known and liked one morning at about eight o'clock the inmates of fort lawrence saw what they seemed an officer from beauséjour carrying a flag and followed by several men in uniform wading through the sea of grass that stretched beyond the missaguash when the tide was out this river was but an ugly trench of reddish mud gashed across the face of the marsh with a thread of half fluid slime lazily crawling along the bottom but at high tide it was filled to the brim with an opaque torrent that would have overflowed but for the dikes thrown up to confine it behind the dike on the farther bank stood the seeming officer waving his flag in sign that he desired a parley he was in reality no officer but one of le loutre's indians in disguise etienne le batard or as others say the great chief jean baptiste cope howe carrying a white flag and accompanied by a few officers and men went towards the river to hear what he had to say as they drew near his looks and language excited their suspicion but it was too late for a number of indians who had hidden behind the dike during the night fired upon howe across the stream and mortally wounded him they continued their fire on his companions but could not prevent them from carrying the dying man to the fort the french officers indignant at this villainy did not hesitate to charge it upon le loutre for says one of them what is not a wicked priest capable of doing but le loutre's brother missionary maillard declares that it was purely an effect of religious zeal on the part of the micmacs who according to him bore a deadly grudge against howe because fourteen years before he had spoken words disrespectful to the holy virgin maillard adds that the indians were much pleased with what they had done finding however that they could effect little against the english troops they changed their field of action repaired to the outskirts of halifax murdered about thirty settlers and carried off eight or ten prisoners strong reinforcements came from canada the french began a fort on the hill of beauséjour and the acadians were required to work at it with no compensation but rations they were thinly clad some had neither shoes nor stockings and winter was begun they became so dejected that it was found absolutely necessary to give them wages enough to supply their most pressing needs in the following season fort beauséjour was in a state to receive a garrison it stood on the crown of the hill and a vast panorama stretched below and around it in front lay the bay of chignecto winding along the fertile shores of chipody and memoramcook far on the right spread the great tantemar marsh on the left lay the marsh of the missaguash and on a knoll beyond it 
not three miles distant, the red flag of England waved over the palisades of Fort Lawrence, while hills wrapped in dark forests bounded the horizon. How the homeless Acadians from Beaubassin lived through the winter is not very clear. They probably found shelter at Chipody and its neighborhood, where there were thriving settlements of their countrymen. La Loutre, fearing that they would return to their lands and submit to the English, sent some of them to Ile Saint Jean. They refused to go, says a French writer, but he compelled them at last by threatening to make the Indians pillage them, carry off their wives and children, and even kill them before their eyes. Nevertheless, he kept about him such as were most submissive to his will. In the spring after the English occupied Beaubassin, La Jonquière issued a strange proclamation. It commanded all Acadians to take forthwith an oath of fidelity to the King of France, and to enroll themselves in the French militia, on pain of being treated as rebels. Three years after, Lawrence, who then governed the province, proclaimed in his turn that all Acadians who had at any time sworn fidelity to the King of England, and who should be found in arms against him, would be treated as criminals. Thus were these unfortunates ground between the upper and nether millstones. Le Loutre replied to this proclamation of Lawrence by a letter in which he outdid himself. He declared that any of the inhabitants who had crossed to the French side of the line, and who should presume to return to the English, would be treated as enemies by his Micmacs, and in the name of these, his Indian adherents, he demanded that the entire eastern half of the Acadian peninsula, including the ground on which Fort Lawrence stood, should be at once made over to their sole use and sovereign ownership, which, being read and considered, says the record of the Halifax Council, the contents appeared too insolent and absurd to be answered. The number of Acadians who had crossed the line and were collected about Beauséjour was now large. Their countrymen of Chipody began to find them a burden, and they lived chiefly on government rations. Le Loutre had obtained 50,000 livres from the court in order to dike in for their use the fertile marshes of Memoramcook, but the relief was distant and the misery pressing. They complained that they had been lured over the line by false assurances, and they applied secretly to the English authorities to learn if they would be allowed to return to their homes. The answer was that they might do so with full enjoyment of religion and property if they would take a simple oath of fidelity and loyalty to the King of Great Britain, qualified by an oral intimation that they would not be required for the present to bear arms. When Le Loutre heard this, he mounted the pulpit, broke into fierce invectives, threatened the terrified people with excommunication, and preached himself into a state of exhaustion. The military commandant at Beauséjour used gentler means of prevention, and the Acadians, unused for generations to think or act for themselves, remained restless but indecisive, waiting till fate should settle for them the question, under which king? Meanwhile, for the past three years, the commissioners appointed under the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle to settle the question of boundaries between France and England in America had been in session at Paris, waging interminable war on paper. 
la galassonniere and silhouette for france shirley and mildmay for england by the treaty of utrecht acadia belonged to england but what was acadia according to the english commissioners it comprised not only the peninsula now called nova scotia but all the immense tract of land between the river st lawrence on the north the gulf of the same name on the east the atlantic on the south and new england on the west the french commissioners on their part maintained that the name acadia belonged of right to only about a twentieth part of this territory and that it did not even cover the whole of the acadian peninsula but only its southern coast with an adjoining belt of barren wilderness when the french owned acadia they gave it boundaries as comprehensive as those claimed for it by the english commissioners now that it belonged to a rival they cut it down to a pairing of its former self the denial that acadia included the whole peninsula was dictated by the need of a winter communication between quebec and cape breton which was only possible with the eastern portions in french hands so new was this denial that even la galissonniere himself the foremost in making it had declared without reservation two years before that acadia was the entire peninsula if says a writer on the question we had to do with a nation more tractable less grasping and more conciliatory it would be well to insist also that halifax should be given up to us he thinks that on the whole it would be well to make the demand in any case in order to gain some other point by yielding this one it is curious that while denying that the country was acadia the french invariably called the inhabitants acadians innumerable public documents commissions grants treaties edicts signed by french kings and ministers had recognized acadia as extending over new brunswick and a part of maine four censuses of acadia while it belonged to the french had recognized the mainland as included in it and so do also the early french maps its prodigious shrinkage was simply the consequence of its possession by an alien other questions of limits more important and equally perilous called loudly for solution what line should separate canada and her western dependency from the british colonies various principles of demarcation were suggested of which the most prominent on the french side was a geographical one all countries watered by streams falling into the st lawrence the great lakes and the mississippi were to belong to her this would have planted her in the heart of new york and along the crests of the alleghanies giving her all the interior of the continent and leaving nothing to england but a strip of sea coast yet in view of what france had achieved of the patient gallantry of her explorers the zeal of her missionaries the adventurous hardihood of her bushrangers revealing to civilized mankind the existence of this wilderness world while her rivals plodded at their workshops their farms or their fisheries in view of all this her pretensions were moderate and reasonable compared with those of england the treaty of utrecht had declared the iroquois or five nations to be british subjects therefore it was insisted that all countries conquered by them belonged to the british crown but what was an iroquois contest the iroquois rarely occupied the countries they overran 
Their military expeditions were mere raids, great or small. Sometimes, as in the case of the Hurons, they made a solitude and called it peace. Again, as in the case of the Illinois, they drove off the occupants of the soil, who returned after the invaders were gone. But the range of their war parties was prodigious, and the English laid claim to every mountain, forest, or prairie where an Iroquois had taken a scalp. That would give them not only the country between the Alleghanies and the Mississippi, but also that between Lake Huron and the Ottawa, thus reducing Canada to the patch on the American map now represented by the province of Quebec, or rather by a part of it since the extension of Acadia to the St. Lawrence would cut off the present counties of Gaspe, Rimouski, and Bonaventure. Indeed, among the advocates of British claims, there were those who denied that France had any rights whatever on the south side of the St. Lawrence. Such being the attitude of the two contestants, it was plain that there was no resort but the last argument of kings. Peace must be won with the sword. The commissioners at Paris broke up their sessions, leaving as the monument of their toils four quarto volumes of allegations, arguments, and documentary proofs. Out of the discussion rose also a swarm of fugitive publications in French, English, and Spanish, for the question of American boundaries had become European. There was one among them worth notice from its amusing absurdity. It is an elaborate disquisition, under the title of Roman Politique, by an author faithful to the traditions of European diplomacy, and inspired at the same time by the new philosophy of the school of Rousseau. He insists that the balance of power must be preserved in America as well as in Europe, because nature, the aggrandizement of the human soul, and the felicity of man are unanimous in demanding it. The English colonies are more populous and wealthy than the French, Therefore, the French should have more land to keep the balance. Nature, the human soul, and the felicity of man require that France should own all the country beyond the Alleghanies and all Acadia but a strip of the south coast, according to the sublime negotiations of the French commissioners, of which the writer declares himself a religious admirer. We know already that France had used means sharper than negotiation to vindicate her claim to the interior of the continent, had marched to the sources of the Ohio to entrench herself there, and hold the passes of the West against all comers. It remains to be seen how she fared in her bold enterprise. End of section 10. Section 11 of Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5, Part 1, 1753 to 1754. Washington. Towards the end of spring, the vanguard of the expedition sent by Duquesne to occupy the Ohio landed at Presqu'isle where Erie now stands. This route to the Ohio, far better than that which Celeron had followed, was a new discovery to the French, and Duquesne calls the harbor the finest in nature. Here they built a fort of squared chestnut logs, and when it was finished, they cut a road of several leagues through the woods to Riviere Aubouf, now French Creek. At the farther end of this road they began another wooden fort and called it Fort Leboeuf. Thence, when the water was high, 
they could descend French Creek to the Allegheny and follow that stream to the main current of the Ohio. It was heavy work to carry the cumbrous load of baggage across the portages. Much of it is said to have been superfluous, consisting of velvets, silks, and other useless and costly articles, sold to the king at enormous prices as necessaries of the expedition. The weight of the task fell on the Canadians, who worked with cheerful hardihood and did their part to admiration. Marin, commander of the expedition, a gruff, choleric old man of sixty-three, but full of force and capacity, spared himself so little that he was struck down with dysentery, and refusing to be sent home to Montreal, was before long in a dying state. His place was taken by Payen, of whose private character there is little good to be said, but whose conduct as an officer was such that Duquesne calls him a prodigy of talents, resources, and zeal. The subalterns deserve no such praise. They disliked the service and made no secret of their discontent. Rumors of it filled Montreal, and Duquesne wrote to Marin, I am surprised that you have not told me of this change. Take note of the sullen and discouraged faces about you. This sort are worse than useless. Rid yourself of them at once. Send them to Montreal that I may make an example of them. Pan wrote at the end of September that Marin was in extremity, and the governor disturbed and alarmed for he knew the value of the sturdy old officer, looked anxiously for a successor. He chose another veteran, Le Gardeur de Saint-Pierre, who had just returned from a journey of exploration towards the Rocky Mountains, and whom Duquesne now ordered to the Ohio. Meanwhile, the effects of the expedition had already justified it, at first the Indians of the Ohio had shown a bold front, one of them, a chief whom the English called the Half King, came to Fort Le Boeuf and ordered the French to leave the country, but was received by Marin with such contemptuous haughtiness that he went home shedding tears of rage and mortification. The western tribes were daunted. The Miamis, but yesterday fast friends of the English, made humble submission to the French, and offered them two English scalps to signalize their repentance, while the Sacs, Potawatamis, and Ojibwas were loud in professions of devotion. Even the Iroquois, Delaware, and Shawanoes on the Allegheny had come to the French camp and offered their help in carrying the baggage it needed but perseverance and success in the enterprise to win over every tribe from the mountains to the Mississippi. To accomplish this and to curb the English, Duquesne had planned a third fort at the junction of French Creek with the Allegheny, or at some point lower down. Then, leaving the three posts well garrisoned, Pian was to descend the Ohio with the whole remaining force, impose terror on the wavering tribes, and complete their conversion. Both plans were thwarted. The fort was not built, nor did Pian descend the Ohio. Fevers, lung diseases, and scurvy made such deadly havoc among troops and Canadians that the dying Marin saw with bitterness that his work must be left half done. Three hundred of the best men were kept to garrison Forts Presqu'Isle and Le Boeuf, and then, as winter approached, the rest were sent back to Montreal. When they arrived, the governor was shocked at their altered looks. I reviewed them and could not help being touched by the pitiable state 
to which fatigues and exposures had reduced them. Past all doubt, if these emaciated figures had gone down the Ohio as intended, the river would have been strewn with corpses, and the evil-disposed savages would not have failed to attack the survivors, seeing that they were but spectres. Les Gardeurs de Saint-Pierre arrived at the end of autumn and made his quarters at Fort Le Boeuf. The surrounding forests had dropped their leaves, and in grey and patient desolation bided the coming winter. Chill rains drizzled over the gloomy clearing and drenched the palisades and log-built barracks raw from the axe. Buried in the wilderness, the military exiles resigned themselves as they might to months of monotonous solitude, when just after sunset on the 11th of December, a tall youth came out of the forest on horseback, attended by a companion much older and rougher than himself, and followed by several Indians and four or five white men with pack horses. Officers from the fort went out to meet the strangers, and wading through mud and sodden snow, they entered at the gate. On the next day, the young leader of the party, with the help of an interpreter, for he spoke no French, had an interview with the commandant, and gave him a letter from Governor Dinwiddie. St. Pierre and the officer next in rank, who knew a little English, took it to another room to study it at their ease, and in it, all unconsciously, they read a name destined to stand one of the noblest in the annals of mankind, for it introduced Major George Washington, Adjutant General of the Virginia Militia. Dinwiddie, jealously watchful of French aggression, had learned through traders and Indians that a strong detachment from Canada had entered the territories of the King of England and built forts on Lake Erie and on a branch of the Ohio. He wrote to challenge the invasion and summon the invaders to withdraw, and he could find none so fit to bear his message as a young man of twenty-one. It was this rough Scotchman who launched Washington on his illustrious career. Washington set out for the trading station of the Ohio Company on Wills Creek, and thence, at the middle of November, struck into the wilderness with Christopher Gist as a guide. Van Braam, a Dutchman, as French interpreter, Davison, a trader, as Indian interpreter, and four woodsmen as servants. They went to the forks of the Ohio, and then down the river to Logstown, the Chiningui of Celeron de Bienville. There Washington had various parleys with the Indians, and thence, after vexatious delays, he continued his journey towards Fort Le Boeuf, accompanied by the friendly chief called the Half King, and by three of his tribesmen. For several days they followed the trader's path, pelted with unceasing rain and snow, and came at last to the old Indian town of Venango, where French Creek enters the Allegheny. Here there was an English trading house, but the French had seized it, raised their flag over it, and turned it into a military outpost. Jean Care was in command, with two subalterns, and nothing could exceed their civility. They invited the strangers to supper, and, says Washington, the wine, as they dozed themselves pretty plentifully with it, soon banished the restraint which at first appeared in their conversation, and gave a license to their tongues to reveal their sentiments more freely. They told me that it was their absolute design to take possession of the Ohio, and by c they would do it, for that, although they were sensible, the English could raise two men for their one, 
yet they knew their motions were too slow and dilatory to prevent any attacking of theirs. With all their civility, the French officers did their best to entice away Washington's Indians, and it was with extreme difficulty that he could persuade them to go with him. Through marshes and swamps, forests choked with snow and drenched with incessant rain, they toiled on for four days more, till the wooden walls of Fort Leboeuf appeared at last, surrounded by fields studded thick with stumps and half encircled by the chill current of French Creek, along the banks of which lay more than two hundred canoes, ready to carry troops in the spring. Washington describes Legardeur de Saint-Pierre as an elderly gentleman with much the air of a soldier. The letter sent him by Dinwiddie expressed astonishment that his troops should build forts upon lands so notoriously known to be the property of the crown of Great Britain. I must desire you, continued the letter, to acquaint me by whose authority and instructions you have lately marched from Canada with an armed force and invaded the King of Great Britain's territories. It becomes my duty to require your peaceable departure, and that you would forbear prosecuting a purpose so interruptive of the harmony and good understanding which His Majesty is desirous to continue and cultivate with the Most Christian King. I persuade myself you will receive and entertain Major Washington with the candor and politeness natural to your nation, and it will give me the greatest satisfaction if you return him with an answer suitable to my wishes for a very long and lasting peace between us. St. Pierre took three days to frame the answer. In it he said that he should send Dinwiddie's letter to the Marquis du Cane and wait his orders, and that meanwhile he should remain at his post according to the commands of his general. I made it my particular care, so the letter closed, to receive Mr. Washington with a distinction suitable to your dignity, as well as his own quality and great merit. No form of courtesy had in fact been wanting. He appeared to be extremely complaisant, says Washington, though he was exerting every artifice to set our Indians at variance with us. I saw that every stratagem was practised to win the half-king to their interest. Neither gifts nor brandy were spared, and it was only by the utmost pains that Washington could prevent his red allies from staying at the fort, conquered by French blandishments. After leaving Venango on his return, he found the horses so weak that to arrive the sooner he left them and their drivers in charge of Van Braam and pushed forward on foot, accompanied by Gist alone. Each was wrapped to the throat in an Indian match-coat, with a gun in his hand and a pack at his back. Passing an old Indian hamlet called Murdering Town, they had an adventure which threatened to make good the name. A French Indian whom they met in the forest fired at them, pretending that his gun had gone off by chance. They caught him, and Gist would have killed him, but Washington interposed and they let him go. Then, to escape pursuit from his tribesmen, they walked all night and all the next day. This brought them to the banks of the Allegheny. They hoped to have found it dead frozen, but it was all alive and turbulent, filled with ice sweeping down the current. They made a raft, shoved out into the stream, and were soon caught helplessly in the drifting ice. Washington, pushing hard with his setting-pole, was jerked into the freezing river, but caught a log of the raft 
and dragged himself out by no efforts could they reach the farther bank or regain that which they had left but they were driven against an island where they landed and left the raft to its fate the night was excessively cold and gist's feet and hands were badly frostbitten in the morning the ice had set and the river was a solid floor they crossed it and succeeded in reaching the house of the trader fraser on the monongahela it was the middle of january when washington arrived at williamsburg and made his report to dinwiddie robert dinwiddie was lieutenant governor of virginia in place of the titular governor lord albemarle whose post was a sinecure he had been clerk in a government office in the west indies then surveyor of customs in the old dominion a position in which he made himself cordially disliked and when he rose to the governorship he carried his unpopularity with him yet virginia and all the british colonies owed him much for though past sixty he was the most watchful sentinel against french aggression and its most strenuous opponent scarcely had marin's vanguard appeared at Presqu'isle, when dinwiddie warned the home government of the danger and urged what he had before urged in vain on the virginian assembly the immediate building of forts on the ohio there came in reply a letter signed by the king authorizing him to build the forts at the cost of the colony and to repel force by force in case he was molested or obstructed moreover the king wrote if you shall find that any number of persons shall presume to erect any fort or forts within the limits of our province of virginia you are first to require them peaceably to depart and if notwithstanding your admonitions they do still endeavor to carry out any such unlawful and unjustifiable designs we do hereby strictly charge and command you to drive them off by force of arms the order was easily given but to obey it needed men and money and for these dinwiddie was dependent on his assembly or house of burgesses he convoked them for the first of november sending washington at the same time with the summons to st pierre the burgesses met dinwiddie exposed the danger and asked for means to meet it they seemed more than willing to comply but debates presently arose concerning the fee of a pistole which the governor had demanded on each patent of land issued by him the amount was trifling but the principle was doubtful the aristocratic republic of virginia was intensely jealous of the slightest encroachment on its rights by the crown or its representative the governor defended the fee the burgesses replied that subjects cannot be deprived of the least part of their property without their consent declared the fee unlawful and called on dinwiddie to confess it to be so he still defended it they saw in his demand for supplies a means of bringing him to terms and refused to grant money unless he would recede from his position dinwiddie rebuked them for disregarding the designs of the french and disputing the rights of the crown and he prorogued them in some anger thus he was unable to obey the instructions of the king as a temporary resource he ventured to order a draft of two hundred men from the militia washington was to have command with the trader william trent as his lieutenant his orders were to push with all speed to the forks of the ohio and there build a fort but in case any attempts are made to obstruct the works by any persons whatsoever 
to restrain all such offenders and in case of resistance to make prisoners of or kill and destroy them the governor next sent messages to the catawbas cherokees chickasaws and iroquois of the ohio inviting them to take up the hatchet against the french who under pretense of embracing you mean to squeeze you to death then he wrote urgent letters to the governors of pennsylvania the carolinas maryland and new jersey begging for contingents of men to be at wills creek in march at the latest but nothing could be done without money and trusting for a change of heart on the part of the burgesses he summoned them to meet again on the fourteenth of february if they come in good temper he wrote to lord fairfax a nobleman settled in the colony I hope they will lay a fund to qualify me to send four or five hundred men more to the Ohio, which, with the assistance of our neighboring colonies, may make some figure. End of section 11. Section 12 of Mont Carmen Wolf by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5, Part 2 The session began. Again, somewhat oddly, yet forcibly, the governor set before the assembly the peril of the situation, and begged them to postpone less pressing questions to the exigency of the hour. This time they listened, and voted ten thousand pounds in virginia currency to defend the frontier the grant was frugal and they jealously placed its expenditure in the hands of a committee of their own dinwiddie writing to the lords of trade pleads necessity as his excuse for submitting to their terms i am sorry he says to find them too much in a republican way of thinking what vexed him still more was their sending an agent to England to complain against him on the irrepressible question of the pistole fee. And he writes to his London friend, the merchant Hanbury, I have had a great deal of trouble from the factious disputes and violent heats of a most impudent, troublesome party here in regard to that silly fee of a pistole surely every thinking man will make a distinction between a fee and a tax poor people i pity their ignorance and narrow ill-natured spirits but my friend consider that i could by no means give up this fee without affronting the board of trade and their council here who established it his thoughts were not all of this harassing nature and he ends his letter with the following petition. Now, sir, as his majesty is pleased to make me a military officer, please send for Scott, my tailor, to make me a proper suit of regimentals to be here by his majesty's birthday. I do not much like gaiety in dress, but I conceive this necessary. I do not much care for lace on the coat, but a neat embroidered buttonhole though you do not deal that way. I know you have a good taste, that I may show my friend's fancy in that suit of clothes, a good laced hat, and two pair stockings, one silk, the other fine thread. If the governor and his English sometimes provoke a smile, he deserves admiration for the energy with which he opposed the public enemy under circumstances the most discouraging he invited the indians to meet him in council at winchester and as bait to attract them coupled the message with a promise of gifts he sent circulars from the king to the neighboring governors calling for supplies and wrote letter upon letter to rouse them to effort he wrote also to the more distant governors delancey of new york and shirley of massachusetts 
begging them to make what he called a feint against Canada to prevent the French from sending so large a force to the Ohio. It was to the nearer colonies, from New Jersey to South Carolina, that he looked for direct aid, and their several governors were all more or less active to procure it. But as most of them had some standing dispute with their assemblies, they could get nothing except on terms with which they would not, and sometimes could not, comply. As the lands invaded by the French belonged to one of the two rival claimants, Virginia and Pennsylvania, the other colonies had no mind to vote money to defend them. Pennsylvania herself refused to move. Hamilton, her governor, could do nothing against the placid obstinacy of the Quaker non-combatants and the stolid obstinacy of the German farmers, who chiefly made up his assembly. North Carolina alone answered the appeal, and gave money enough to raise three or four hundred men. Two independent companies maintained by the king in New York, and one in South Carolina, had received orders from England to march to the scene of action, and in these, with the scanty levies of his own, and the adjacent province, lay Dinwiddie's only hope. With men abundant and willing, there were no means to put them into the field, and no commander whom they would all obey. From the brick house at Williamsburg, pompously called the governor's palace, Dinwiddie dispatched letters, orders, couriers, to hasten the tardy reinforcements of North Carolina and New York, and push on the raw soldiers of the Old Dominion, who now numbered three hundred men. They were called the Virginia Regiment, and Joshua Fry, an English gentleman bred at Oxford, was made their colonel, with Washington as next in command. Fry was at Alexandria with half the so-called regiment, trying to get it into marching order. Washington, with the other half, had pushed forward to the Ohio Company storehouse at Wills Creek, which was to form a base of operations. His men were poor whites, brave but hard to discipline, without tents, ill-armed and ragged as Falstaff's recruits. Behind these, a band of backwoodsmen under Captain Trent had crossed the mountains in February to build a fort at the forks of the Ohio, where Pittsburgh now stands, a spot which Washington had examined when on his way to Fort Leboeuf, and which he had reported as the best for the purpose. The hope was that Trent would fortify himself before the arrival of the French, and that Washington and Fry would join him in time to secure the position. Trent had begun the fort, but for some unexplained reason had gone back to Wills Creek, leaving Ensign Ward with forty men to work upon it. Their labors were suddenly interrupted. On the 17th of April, a swarm of bateaux and canoes came down the Allegheny, bringing, according to Ward, more than a thousand Frenchmen, though in reality not much above five hundred, who landed, planted cannon against the incipient stockade, and summoned the ensign to surrender on pain of what might ensue. He complied and was allowed to depart with his men. Retracing his steps over the mountains, he reported his mishap to Washington, while the French demolished his unfinished fort, began a much larger and better one, and named it Fort Duquesne. They had acted with their usual promptness. Their governor, a practised soldier, knew the value of celerity, and had set his troops in motion with the first opening of spring. He had no refractory assembly to hamper him, no lack of money, for the king supplied it, and all Canada must march at his bidding. Thus, while Dinwiddie was still toiling to muster his raw recruits, Duquesne's lieutenant, Contracour, 
successor of St. Pierre, had landed at Presqu'Isle with a much greater force in part regulars and in part Canadians. Dinwiddie was deeply vexed when a message from Washington told him how his plans were blighted, and he spoke his mind to his friend Hanbury. If our assembly had voted the money in November which they did in February, it's more than probable the fort would have been built and garrisoned before the French had approached. But these things cannot be done without money. As there was none in our treasury, I have advanced my own to forward the expenditure, and if the independent companies from New York come soon, I am in hopes the eyes of the other colonies will be opened, and if they grant a proper supply of men, I hope we shall be able to dislodge the French or build a fort on that river. I congratulate you on the increase of your family. My wife and two girls join us in our most sincere respects to good Mrs. Hanbury. The seizure of a king's fort by planting cannon against it and threatening it with destruction was in his eyes a beginning of hostilities on the part of the French, and henceforth both he and Washington acted much as if war had been declared. From their situation at Wills Creek, the distance by the trader's path to Fort Duquesne was about a hundred and forty miles. Midway was a branch of the Monongahela, called Redstone Creek, at the mouth of which the Ohio Company had built another storehouse. Dinwiddie ordered all the forces to cross the mountains and assemble at this point, until they should be strong enough to advance against the French. The movement was critical in presence of an enemy as superior in discipline as he was in numbers, while the natural obstacles were great. A road for cannon and wagons must be cut through a dense forest and over two ranges of high mountains, besides countless hills and streams. Washington set all his force to the work, and they spent a fortnight in making twenty miles. Towards the end of May, however, Dinwiddie learned that he had crossed the main ridge of the Alleghanies, and was encamped with a hundred and fifty men near the parallel ridge of Laurel Hill, at a place called the Great Meadows. Trent's backwoodsmen had gone off in disgust. Fry, with the rest of the regiment, was still far behind, and Washington was daily expecting an attack. Close upon this a piece of good news, or what seemed such, came over the mountains and gladdened the heart of the governor. He heard that a French detachment had tried to surprise Washington, and that he had killed or captured the whole. The facts were as follows. Washington was on the Yuhigani, a branch of the Monongahela, exploring it in hopes that it might prove navigable, when a messenger came to him from his old comrade, the half-king, who was on the way to join him. The message was to the effect that the French had marched from their fort and meant to attack the first English they should meet. A report came soon after that they were already at the ford of the Uhiogani, eighteen miles distance. Washington at once repaired to the Great Meadows, a level tract of grass and bushes bordered by wooded hills and traversed in one part by a gully which with a little labor the men turned into an entrenchment, at the same time cutting away the branches and clearing what the young commander called a charming field for an encounter. Parties were sent out to scour the woods, but they found no enemy. Two days passed when on the morning of the 27th, Christopher Gist, who had lately made a settlement on the farther side of Laurel Hill, twelve or thirteen miles distant, came to the camp with news that fifty Frenchmen had been at his house towards noon of the day before, and would have destroyed everything but for the intervention of two Indians 
whom he had left in charge during his absence. Washington sent seventy-five men to look for the party, but the search was vain, the French having hidden themselves so well as to escape any eye but that of an Indian. In the evening a runner came from the half-king, who was encamped with a few warriors some miles distant. He had sent to tell Washington that he had found the tracks of two men and traced them towards a dark glen in the forest, where in his belief all the French were lurking. Washington seems not to have hesitated a moment. Fearing a stratagem to surprise his camp, he left his main force to guard it, and at ten o'clock set out for the half-king's wigwams at the head of forty men. The night was rainy, and the forest, to use his own words, as black as pitch. The path, he continues, was hardly wide enough for one man. We often lost it and could not find it again for fifteen or twenty minutes, and we often tumbled over each other in the dark. Seven of his men were lost in the woods and left behind. The rest groped their way all night and reached the Indian camp at sunrise. A council was held with the half-king, and he and his warriors agreed to join in striking the French. Two of them led the way. The tracks of the two French scouts sent the day before were again found, and marching in single file, the party pushed through the forest into the rocky hollow where the French were supposed to be concealed. They were there, in fact, and they snatched their guns the moment they saw the English. Washington gave the word to fire. A short fight ensued. Coulon de Jumonville, an ensign in command, was killed with nine others. Twenty-two were captured, and none escaped but a Canadian, who had fled at the beginning of the fray. After it was over, the prisoners told Washington that the party had been sent to bring him a summons from Contrecoeur, the commandant at Fort Duquesne. Five days before, Contrecoeur had sent Jumonville to scour the country as far as the dividing ridge of the Alleghanies. Under him were another officer, three cadets, a volunteer, an interpreter, and twenty-eight men. He was provided with a written summons to be delivered to any English he might find. It required them to withdraw from the domain of the King of France, and threatened compulsion by force of arms in case of refusal. But before delivering the summons, Jumonville was ordered to send two couriers back with all speed to Fort Duquesne to inform the commandant that he had found the English, and to acquaint him when he intended to communicate with them. It is difficult to imagine any object for such an order except thinking that of enabling Contrecoeur to send to the spot whatever force might be needed to attack the English on their refusal to withdraw. Jumonville had sent the two couriers and had hidden himself, apparently to wait the result. He lurked nearly two days within five miles of Washington's camp, sent out scouts to reconnoitre it, but gave no notice of his presence, played to perfection the part of a skulking enemy, and brought destruction on himself by conduct which can only be ascribed to a sinister motive on the one hand, or to extreme folly on the other. French deserters told Washington that the party came as spies, and were to show the summons only if threatened by a superior force. This last assertion is confirmed by the French officer Pouchot, who says that Jumonville, seeing himself the weaker party, tried to show the letter he had brought. French writers say that on seeing the English, Jumonville's interpreter called out that he had something to say to them, but Washington, who was at the head of his men, affirms this to be absolutely false. The French, 
say further that the Jumonville was killed in the act of reading the summons. This is also denied by Washington, and rests only on the assertion of the Canadian who ran off at the outset and on the alleged assertion of indians who if present at all which is unlikely escaped like the canadian before the fray began droyon an officer with jumonville wrote two letters to dinwiddie after his capture to claim the privilege of the bearers of a summons but while bringing forward every other circumstance in favor of the claim he does not pretend that the summons was read or shown either before or during the action the french account of the conduct of washington's indians is no less erroneous this murder says a chronicler of the time produced on the minds of the savages an effect very different from that which the cruel washington had promised himself they have a horror of crime and they were so indignant at that which had just been perpetrated before their eyes that they abandoned him and offered themselves to us in order to take vengeance instead of doing this they boasted of their part in the fight scalped all the dead frenchmen sent one scalp to the delawares as an invitation to take up the hatchet for the english and distributed the rest among the various Ohio tribes to the same end. End of section 12. Section 13 of Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5, Part 3. Coolness of Judgment a profound sense of public duty and a strong self-control were even then the characteristics of washington but he was scarcely twenty-two was full of military ardor and was vehement and fiery by nature yet it is far from certain that even when age and experience had ripened him he would have forborne to act as he did for there was every reason for believing that the designs of the French were hostile, and though by passively waiting the event he would have thrown upon them the responsibility of striking the first blow, he would have exposed his small party to capture or destruction by giving them time to gain reinforcements from Fort Duquesne. It was inevitable that the killing of Dumontville should be greeted in france by an outcry of real or assumed horror but the chevalier de levis second in command to montcalm probably expresses the true opinion of frenchmen best fitted to judge when he calls it a pretended assassination judge it as we may this obscure skirmish began the war that set the world on fire Washington returned to the camp at the Great Meadows, and expecting soon to be attacked, sent for reinforcements to Colonel Fry, who was lying dangerously ill at Wills Creek. Then he set his men to work at an entrenchment, which he named Fort Necessity, and which must have been of the slightest, as they finished it within three days. The half-king now joined him, along with the female potentate known as Queen Aliquippa, and some thirty Indian families. A few days after, Gist came from Will's Creek with news that Fry was dead. Washington succeeded to the command of the regiment, the remaining three companies of which presently appeared and joined their comrades raising the whole number to three hundred. Next arrived the independent company from South Carolina, and the Great Meadows became an animated scene, with the wigwams of the Indians, the camp sheds of the rough Virginians, the cattle grazing on the tall grass or drinking at the lazy brook that traversed it, the surrounding heights and forests, and over all, four miles away the lofty green ridge of laurel hill the presence of the company of regulars was a doubtful advantage 
Captain Mackay, its commander, holding his commission from the king, thought himself above any officer commissioned by the governor. There was great courtesy between him and Washington, but Mackay would take no orders, not even the countersign from the colonel of volunteers. Nor would his men work, except for an additional shilling a day. To give this was impossible, both from want of money and from the discontent it would have bred in the Virginians, who worked for nothing besides their daily pay of eight pence. Washington, already a leader of men, possessed himself in a patience extremely difficult to his passionate temper. But the position was untenable, and the presence of the military drones demoralized his soldiers. Therefore, leaving Mackay at the meadows, he advanced towards Gist's settlement, cutting a wagon road as he went. On reaching the settlement, the camp was formed and an entrenchment thrown up. Deserters had brought news that strong reinforcements were expected at Fort Duquesne, and friendly Indians repeatedly warned Washington that he would soon be attacked by overwhelming numbers. Forty Indians from the Ohio came to the camp, and several days were spent in councils with them, but they proved for the most part to be spies of the French. The half-king stood fast by the English, and sent out three of his young warriors as scouts. Reports of attack thickened. Mackay and his men were sent for, and they arrived on the 28th of June. A council of war was held at Gist's house, and as the camp was commanded by neighboring heights, it was resolved to fall back. The horses were so few that the Virginians had to carry much of the baggage on their backs and drag nine swivels over the broken and rocky road. The regulars, though they also were raised in the provinces, refused to give the slightest help. Toiling on for two days, they reached the Great Meadows on the 1st of July. The position, though perhaps the best in the neighborhood, was very unfavorable, and Washington would have retreated farther but for the condition of his men. They were spent with fatigue, and there was no choice but to stay and fight. Strong reinforcements had been sent to Fort Duquesne in the spring, and the garrison now consisted of about 1,400 men. When the news of the death of Dumontville reached Montreal, Coulon de Villiers, brother of the slain officer, was sent to the spot with the body of Indians from all the tribes in the colony. He made such speed that at eight o'clock on the morning of the 26th of June, he reached the fort with his motley following. Here he found that 500 Frenchmen and a few Ohio Indians were on the point of marching against the English under Chevalier Le Mercier, but in view of his seniority in rank and his relationship to Jumonville, the command was now transferred to Villiers. Hereupon the march was postponed, the newly arrived warriors were called to council, and Contrecoeur thus harangued them. The English have murdered my children. My heart is sick. Tomorrow I shall send my French soldiers to take revenge. And now, men of the Sault Saint Louis, men of the Lake of Two Mountains, Hurons, Abenakis, Iroquois of La Presentation, Nipissings, Algonquins, and Ottawas, I invite you all by this belt of wampum to join your French father and help him crush the assassins. Take this hatchet, and with it two barrels of wine for a feast. Both hatchet and wine were cheerfully accepted. Then Contrecoeur turned to the Delawares, who were also present. By these four strings of wampum, I invite you, if you are true children of Ontontio, to follow the example of your brethren. And with some hesitation, they also took up the hatchet.
The next day was spent by the Indians in making moccasins for the march, and by the French in preparing for an expedition on a larger scale than had been at first intended. Contrecour, Villiers, Le Mercier, and Longway, after deliberating together, drew up a paper to the effect that it was fitting, convenable, to march against the English with the greatest possible number of French and savages, in order to avenge ourselves and chastise them for having violated the most sacred laws of civilized nations, that thought their conduct justified the French in disregarding the existing treaty of peace, yet, after thoroughly punishing them and compelling them to withdraw from the domain of the king, they should be told that, in pursuance of his royal orders, the French looked on them as friends. But it was further agreed that should the English have withdrawn to their own side of the mountains, they should be followed to their settlements to destroy them and treat them as enemies, till that nation should give ample satisfaction and completely change its conduct. The party set out on the next morning, paddled their canoes up the Monongahela, encamped, heard mass, and on the 30th reached the deserted storehouse of the Ohio Company at the mouth of Redstone Creek. It was a building of solid logs, well loopholed for musketry. To please the Indians by asking their advice, Villiers called all the chiefs to council which being concluded to their satisfaction, he left a sergeant's guard at the storehouse to watch the canoes, and began his march through the forest. The path was so rough that at the first halt the chaplain declared he could go no farther, and turned back for the storehouse, though not till he had absolved the whole company in a body. Thus lightened of their sins, they journeyed on, constantly sending out scouts on the second of july they reached the abandoned camp of washington at gist's settlement and here they bivouacked tired and drenched all night by rain at daybreak they marched again and passed through the gorge of laurel hill it rained without ceasing but villiers pushed his way through the dripping forest to see the place half a mile from the road, where his brother had been killed, and where several bodies still lay unburied. They had learned from a deserter the position of the enemy, and Villiers filled the woods in front with a swarm of Indian scouts. The crisis was near. He formed his men in column and ordered every officer to his place. Washington's men had had a full day at Fort Necessity, but they spent it less in resting from their fatigue than in strengthening their rampart with logs. The fort was a simple square enclosure, with a trench said by a French writer to be only knee-deep. On the south and partly to the west there was an exterior embankment, which seems to have been made like a rifle pit, with the ditch inside. The Virginians had but little ammunition, and no bread whatever, living chiefly on fresh beef. They knew the approach of the French, who were reported to Washington as nine hundred strong, besides Indians. Towards eleven o'clock a wounded sentinel came in with news that they were close at hand, and they presently appeared at the edge of the woods, yelling and firing from such a distance that their shot fell harmless. Washington drew up his men on the meadow before the fort, thinking, he says, that the enemy, being greatly superior in force, would attack at once, and choosing for some reason to meet them on the open plain. But Villiers had other views. We approached the English, he writes, as near as possible, without uselessly exposing the lives of the king's subjects, and he and his followers made their way through the forest till they came opposite the fort, 
where they stationed themselves on two densely wooded hills, adjacent though separated by a small brook. One of these was about a hundred paces from the English, and the other about sixty. Their position was such that the French and Indians, well sheltered by trees and bushes, and with the advantage of higher ground, could cross their fire upon the fort and enfilade a part of it. Washington had meanwhile drawn his followers within the entrenchment, and the firing now began on both sides. Rain fell all day. The raw earth of the embankment was turned to soft mud, and the men in the ditch of the outwork stood to the knee in water. The swivels brought back from the camp at Gist's farm were mounted on the rampart, but the gunners were so ill-protected that the pieces were almost silenced by the French musketry. The fight lasted nine hours. At times the fire on both sides was nearly quenched by the showers, and the bedrenched combatants could do little but gaze at each other through a grey veil of mist and rain. Towards night, however, the fusillade revived and became sharp again until dark. At eight o'clock the French called out to propose a parley. Villiers thus gives his reason for these overtures. As we had been wet all day by the rain, as the soldiers were very tired, as the savages said that they would leave us the next morning, and as there was a report that drums and the firing of cannon had been heard in the distance, I proposed to Monsieur Le Monsieur to offer the English a conference. He says further that ammunition was falling short, and that he thought the enemy might sally in a body and attack him. The English, on their side, were in a worse plight. They were half-starved, their powder was nearly spent, their guns were foul, and among them all they had but two screw-rods to clean them. In spite of his desperate position, Washington declined the parley, thinking it a pretext to introduce a spy. But when the French repeated their proposal and requested that he would send an officer to them, he could hesitate no longer. There were but two men with him who knew French, Ensign Peyroni, who was disabled by a wound, and the Dutchman, Captain Van Braam. To him the unpalatable errand was assigned. After a long absence, he returned with articles of capitulation offered by Villiers, and while the officers gathered about him in the rain, he read and interpreted the paper by the glimmer of a sputtering candle, kept alight with difficulty. Objection was made to some of the terms, and they were changed. Van Braam, however, apparently anxious to get the capitulation signed and the affair ended, mistranslated several passages, and rendered the words Le assassinate du Sieur de Jumonville as the death of Sieur de Jumonville. As thus understood, the articles were signed about midnight. They provided that the English should march out with drums beating and the honors of war, carrying with them one of their swivels and all their other property, that they should be protected against insult from French or Indians, that the prisoners taken in the affair of Jumonville should be set free, and that two officers should remain as hostages for their safe return to Fort Duquesne. The hostages chosen were Van Braam and a brave but eccentric Scotchman, Robert Stobo, an acquaintance of the novelist Smollett, said to be the original of his Les Mahago. Washington reports that twelve of the Virginians were killed on the spot, and forty-three wounded, while on the casualties in Mackay's company no returns appear. Villiers reports his own loss at only twenty in all. The numbers engaged are uncertain. 
the six companies of the virginia regiment counted three hundred and five men and officers and mackay's company one hundred but many were on the sick list and some had deserted about three hundred and fifty may have taken part in the fight on the side of the french villiers says that the detachment as originally formed consisted of five hundred white men these were increased after his arrival at fort duquesne and one of the party reports that seven hundred marched on the expedition the number of indians joining them is not given but as nine tribes and communities contributed to it and as two barrels of wine were required to give the warriors a parting feast it must have been considerable white men and red it seems clear that the french force was more than twice that of the english while they were better posted and better sheltered keeping all day under cover and never showing themselves on the open meadow there were no indians with washington even the half king held aloof though being of a caustic turn he did not spare his comments on the fight telling conrad weiser the provincial interpreter that the french behaved like cowards and the english like fools in the early morning the fort was abandoned and the retreat began the indians had killed all the horses and cattle and washington's men were so burdened with the sick and wounded whom they were obliged to carry on their backs that most of the baggage was perforce left behind even then they could march but a few miles and then encamped to wait for wagons the indians increased the confusion by plundering and threatening an attack they knocked to pieces the medicine chest thus causing great distress to the wounded two of whom they murdered and scalped for a time there was danger of panic but order was restored and the wretched march began along the forest road that led over the alleghanies fifty-two miles to the station at wills creek whatever may have been the feelings of washington he has left no record of them his immense fortitude was doomed to severer trials in the future yet perhaps this miserable morning was the darkest of his life he was deeply moved by sights of suffering and all around him were wounded men borne along in torture and weary men staggering under the living load his pride was humbled and his young ambition seemed blasted in the bud it was the fourth of july he could not foresee that he was to make that day forever glorious to a new-born nation hailing him as its father the defeat at fort necessity was doubly disastrous to the english since it was a new step and a long one towards the ruin of their interest with the indians and when in the next year the smouldering war broke into flame nearly all the western tribes drew their scalping knives for france villiers went back exultant to fort duquesne burning on his way the buildings of gist's settlement and the storehouse at redstone creek not an english flag now waved beyond the alleghanies end of section thirteen section fourteen of montcalm and wolf by francis parkman this librivox recording is in the public domain Chapter Six, Part One, seventeen fifty four to seventeen fifty five. The Signal of Battle. The defeat of Washington was a heavy blow to the governor, and he angrily described it to the delay of the expected reinforcements. The king's companies from New York had reached Alexandria and crawled towards the scene of action with thin ranks bad discipline thirty women and children no tents no blankets no knapsacks and for munitions one barrel of spoiled gunpowder 
The case was still worse with the regiment from North Carolina. It was commanded by Colonel Innes, a countryman and friend of Dinwiddie who wrote to him, Dear James, I now wish that we had none from your colony but yourself, for I foresee nothing but confusion among them. The men were, in fact, utterly unmanageable. They had been promised three shillings a day, while the Virginians had only eight pence, and when they heard on the march that their pay was to be reduced, they mutinied, disbanded, and went home. You may easily guess, says Dinwiddie to a London correspondent, the great fatigue and trouble I have had, which is more than I ever went through in my life. He rested his hopes on the session of his assembly, which was to take place in August, for he thought that the late disaster would move them to give him money for defending the colony. These meetings of the Burgesses were the great social as well as political event of the Old Dominion, and gave a gathering signal to the Virginian gentry scattered far and wide on their lonely plantations. The capital of the province was Williamsburg, a village of about a thousand inhabitants, traversed by a straight and very wide street and adorned with various public buildings, conspicuous among which was William and Mary College, a respectable structure unjustly likened by Jefferson to a brick kiln with a roof. The capital, at the other end of the town, had been burned some years before, and had just risen from its ashes. Not far distant was the so-called Governor's Palace, where Dinwiddie, with his wife and two daughters, exercised such official hospitality as his moderate salary and Scottish thrift would permit. In these seasons of festivity the dull and quiet village was transfigured. The broad, sandy street, scorching under a southern sun, was thronged with coaches and chariots brought over from London at heavy cost in tobacco, though soon to be bedimmed by Virginia roads and Negro care, racing and hard-drinking planters, clergymen of the establishment, not much more ascetic than their boon companions of the laity, ladies with manners a little rusted by long seclusion, black coachmen and footmen, proud of their masters and their liveries, young cavaliers, booted and spurred, sitting their thoroughbreds with the careless grace of men, whose home was the saddle. It was a proud little provincial society, which might seem absurd in its lofty self-appreciation, had it not soon proved itself so prolific in ability and worth. The Burgesses met, and Dinwiddie made them an opening speech, inveighing against the aggressions of the French, their contempt of treaties, and ambitious views for universal monarchy. And he concluded, I could expatiate very largely on these affairs, but my heart burns with resentment at their insolence. I think there is no room for many arguments to induce you to raise a considerable supply to enable me to defeat the designs of these troublesome people and enemies of mankind. The Burgesses, in their turn, expressed the highest and most becoming resentment, and promptly voted twenty thousand pounds. But on the third reading of the bill they added to it a rider which touched the old question of the pistole fee, and which, in the view of the governor, was both unconstitutional and offensive. He remonstrated in vain. The stubborn Republicans would not yield, nor would he, and again he prorogued them. This unexpected defeat depressed him greatly. A governor, he wrote, 
is really to be pitied in the discharge of his duty to his king and country in having to do with such obstinate self-conceited people i cannot satisfy the burgesses unless i prostitute the rules of government i have gone through monstrous fatigues such wrong-headed people i thank god i never had to do with before a few weeks later he was comforted for having again called the burgesses they gave him the money without trying this time to humiliate him in straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel aristocratic virginia was far outdone by democratic pennsylvania hamilton her governor had laid before the assembly a circular letter from the earl of holderness directing him in common with other governors to call on his province for means to repel any invasion which might be made within the undoubted limits of his majesty's dominion the assembly of pennsylvania was curiously unlike that of virginia as half and more often than half of its members were quaker tradesmen in sober raiment and broad-brimmed hats while of the rest the greater part were germans who cared little whether they lived under english rule or french provided that they were left in peace upon their farms the house replied to the governor's call it would be highly presumptuous in us to pretend to judge of the undoubted limits of his majesty's dominions and they added the assemblies of this province are generally composed of a majority who are constitutionally principled against war and represent a well-meaning peaceable people then they adjourned telling the governor that as those our limits have not been clearly ascertained to our satisfaction we fear the precipitate call upon us as the province invaded cannot answer any good purpose at this time in the next month they met again and again hamilton asked for means to defend the country the question was put should the assembly give money for the king's use and the vote was feebly affirmative should the sum be twenty thousand pounds the vote was overwhelmingly in the negative fifteen thousand ten thousand and five thousand were successively proposed and the answer was always no the house would give nothing but five hundred pounds for a present to the indians after which they adjourned to the sixth of the month called may at their next meeting they voted to give the governor ten thousand pounds but under conditions which made them for some time independent of his veto and which in other respects were contrary to his instructions from the king as well as from the proprietaries of the province to whom he had given bonds to secure his obedience he therefore rejected the bill and they adjourned in august they passed a similar vote with the same result at their october meeting they evaded his call for supplies in december they voted twenty thousand pounds hampered with conditions which were sure to be refused since morris the new governor who had lately succeeded hamilton was under the same restrictions as his predecessor they told him however that in the present case they felt themselves bound by no act of parliament and added we hope the governor notwithstanding any penal bond he may have entered into will on reflection think himself at liberty and find it consistent with his safety and honour to give his assent to this bill morris who had taken the highest legal advice on the subject in england declined to promise himself saying consider gentlemen in what light you will appear to his majesty while instead of contributing towards your own defence 
you are entering into an ill-timed controversy concerning the validity of royal instructions which may be delayed to a more convenient time without the least injury to the rights of the people they would not yield and told him that they had rather the french should conquer them than give up their privileges truly remarks dinwiddie i think they have given their senses a long holiday new york was not much behind her sisters in contentious stubbornness in answer to the governor's appeal the assembly replied it appears that the french have built a fort at a place called french creek at a considerable distance from the river ohio which may but does not by any evidence or information appear to us to be an invasion of any of his majesty's colonies so blind were they as yet to manifest destiny afterwards however on learning the defeat of washington they gave five thousand pounds to aid virginia maryland after long delay gave six thousand new jersey felt herself safe behind the other colonies and would give nothing new england on the other hand and especially massachusetts had suffered so much from french war parties that they were always ready to fight shirley the governor of massachusetts had returned from his bootless errand to settle the boundary question at paris his leanings were strongly monarchical yet he believed in the new englanders and was more or less in sympathy with them both he and they were strenuous against the french and they had mutually helped each other to reap laurels in the last war shirley was cautious of giving umbrage to his assembly and rarely quarrelled with it except when the amount of his salary was in question he was not averse to a war with france for though bred a lawyer and now past middle life he flattered himself with hopes of a high military command on the present occasion making use of a rumour that the french were seizing the carrying place between the chaudiere and the kennebec he drew from the assembly a large grant of money and induced them to call upon him to march in person to the scene of danger he now accordingly repaired to falmouth now portland and though the rumour proved false sent eight hundred men under captain john winslow to build two forts on the kennebec as a measure of precaution while to these northern provinces canada was an old and pestilent enemy those towards the south scarcely knew her by name and the idea of french aggression on their borders was so novel and strange that they admitted it with difficulty mind and heart were engrossed in strife with their governors the universal struggle for virtual self-rule but the war was often waged with a passionate stupidity the colonist was not then an american he was simply a provincial and a narrow one the time was yet distant when these dissevered and jealous communities should weld themselves into one broad nationality capable at need of the mightiest efforts to purge itself of disaffection and vindicate its commanding unity in the interest of that practical independence which they had so much at heart two conditions were essential to the colonists the one was a field for expansion and the other was mutual help their first necessity was to rid themselves of the french who by shutting them between the alleghanies and the sea would cramp them into perpetual littleness with france on their backs growing while they had no room to grow they must remain in helpless wardship dependent on england whose aid they would always need but with the west open before them their future was their own 
king and parliament would respect perforce the will of a people spread from the ocean to the mississippi and united in action as in aims but in the middle of the last century the vision of the ordinary colonist rarely reached so far the immediate victory under a governor however slight the point at issue was more precious in his eyes than the remote though decisive advantage which he saw but dimly the governors representing the central power saw the situation from the national point of view several of them notably dinwiddie and shirley were filled with wrath at the proceedings of the french and the former was exasperated beyond measure at the supineness of the provinces he had spared no effort to rouse them and had failed his instincts were on the side of authority but under the circumstances it is hardly to be imputed to him as a very deep offence against human liberty that he advised the compelling of the colonies to raise men and money for their own defence and proposed in view of their intolerable obstinacy and disobedience to his majesty's command that parliament should tax them half a crown a head the approaching war offered to the party of authority temptations from which the colonies might have saved it by opening their purse strings without waiting to be told the home government on its part was but half-hearted in the wish that they should unite in opposition to the common enemy. It was very willing that the several provinces should give money and men, but not that they should acquire military habits and a dangerous capacity of acting together. There was one kind of union, however, so obviously necessary, and at the same time so little to be dreaded, that the British cabinet, instructed by the governors, not only assented to it, but urged it. This was joint action in making treaties with the Indians. The practice of separate treaties made by each province in its own interest had bred endless disorders. The adhesion of all the tribes had been so shaken and the efforts of the French to alienate them were so vigorous and effective that not a moment was to be lost. Jean Caire had gained over most of the Senecas. Piquet was drawing the Onondagas more and more to his mission, and the Dutch of Albany were alienating their best friends, the Mohawks, by encroaching on their lands. Their chief, Hendrick, came to New York with the deputation of the tribe to complain of their wrongs, and, finding no redress, went off in anger, declaring that the covenant chain was broken. The authorities in alarm called William Johnson to their aid. He succeeded in soothing the exasperated chief, and then proceeded to the Confederate council at Onondaga, where he found the assembled sachems full of anxieties and doubts. We don't know what you Christians, English, and French intend, said one of their orators. We are so hemmed in by you both that we have hardly a hunting place left. In a little while, if we find a bear in a tree, there will immediately appear an owner of the land to claim the property and hinder us from killing it, by which we live. We are so perplexed between you that we hardly know what to say or think. No man had such power over the five nations as Johnson. His dealings with them were at once honest, downright, and sympathetic. They loved and trusted him as much as they detested the Indian commissioners at Albany whom the province of New York had charged with their affairs, and who, being traders, grossly abused their office. 
it was to remedy this perilous state of things that the lords of trade and plantations directed the several governors to urge on their assemblies the sending of commissioners to make a joint treaty with the wavering tribes seven of the provinces new york pennsylvania maryland and the four new england colonies acceded to the plan and sent to albany the appointed place of the meeting a body of men who for character and ability had never had an equal on the continent but whose powers from their respective assemblies were so cautiously limited as to preclude decisive action they met in the courthouse of the little frontier city a large chain belt of wampum was provided on which the king was symbolically represented holding in his embrace the colonies the five nations and all their allied tribes this was presented to the assembled warriors with a speech in which the misdeeds of the french were not forgotten the chief hendrick made a much better speech in reply we do now solemnly renew and brighten the covenant chain we shall take the chain belt to onondaga where our council fire always burns and keep it so safe that neither thunder nor lightning shall break it the commissioners had blamed them for allowing so many of their people to be drawn away to piquet's mission it is true said the orator that we live disunited we have tried to bring back our brethren but in vain for the governor of canada is like a wicked deluding spirit you ask why we are so dispersed the reason is that you have neglected us for these three years past here he took a stick and threw it behind him you have thus thrown us behind your back whereas the french are a subtle and vigilant people always using their utmost endeavors to seduce and bring us over to them he then told them that it was not the french alone who invaded the country of the indians the governor of virginia and the governor of canada are quarrelling about lands which belong to us and their quarrel may end in our destruction and he closed with a burst of sarcasm we could have taken crown point in the last war but you prevented us instead you burned your own fort at saratoga and ran away from it which was a shame and a scandal to you look about your country and see you have no fortifications no not even in this city it is but a step from canada hither and the french may come and turn you out of doors you desire us to speak from the bottom of our hearts and we shall do it look at the french they are men they are fortifying everywhere but you are all like women bare and open without fortifications end of section fourteen Section 15 of Montcalm and Wolf by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6, Part 2. Hendrick's brother Abraham now took up the word and begged that Johnson might be restored to the management of Indian affairs, which he had formerly held. For, said the chief, we love him and he us and he has always been our good and trusty friend the commissioners had not power to grant the request but the indians were assured that it should not be forgotten and they returned to their villages soothed but far from satisfied nor were the commissioners empowered to take any effective steps for fortifying the frontier 
the congress now occupied itself with another matter its members were agreed that great danger was impending that without wise and just treatment of the tribes the french would gain them all build forts along the back of the british colonies and by means of ships and troops from france master them one by one unless they would combine for mutual defence the necessity of some form of union had at length begun to force itself upon the colonial mind a rough woodcut had lately appeared in the pennsylvania gazette figuring the provinces under the not very flattering image of a snake cut to pieces with the motto join or die a writer of the day held up the five nations for emulation observing that if ignorant savages could confederate british colonists might do as much franklin the leading spirit of the congress now laid before it his famous project of union which has been too often described to need much notice here its fate is well known the crown rejected it because it gave too much power to the colonies the colonies because it gave too much power to the crown and because it required each of them to transfer some of its functions of self-government to a central council another plan was afterwards devised by the friends of prerogative perfectly agreeable to the king since it placed all power in the hands of a council of governors and since it involved compulsory taxation of the colonists who for the same reasons would have doggedly resisted it had an attempt been made to carry it into effect even if some plan of union had been agreed upon long delay must have followed before its machinery could be set in motion and meantime there was need of immediate action war parties of indians from canada set on it was thought by the governor were already burning and murdering among the border settlements of new york and new hampshire in the south dinwiddie grew more and more alarmed for the french are like so many locusts they are collected in bodies in a most surprising manner their number now on the ohio is from twelve hundred to fifteen hundred he writes to lord granville that in his opinion they aim to conquer the continent and that the obstinacy of this stubborn generation exposes the country to the merciless rage of a rapacious enemy what vexed him even more than the apathy of the assemblies was the conduct of his brother governor glenn of south carolina who apparently piqued at the conspicuous part dinwiddie was acting wrote to him in a very dictatorial style found fault with his measures jested at his activity in writing letters and even questioned the right of england to lands on the ohio till he was moved at last to retort i cannot help observing that your letters and arguments would have been more proper from a french officer than from one of his majesty's governors my conduct has met with his majesty's gracious approbation and i am sorry it has not received yours thus discouraged even in quarters where he had least reason to expect it he turned all his hopes to the home government again recommended a tax by act of parliament and begged in repeated letters for arms munitions and two regiments of infantry his petition was not made in vain england at this time presented the phenomenon of a prime minister who could not command the respect of his own servants a more preposterous figure than the duke of newcastle never stood at the head of a great nation he had a feverish craving for place and power 
joined to a total unfitness for both. He was an adept in personal politics, and was so busied with the arts of winning and keeping office that he had no leisure, even if he had had ability, for the higher work of government. He was restless, quick in movement, rapid and confused in speech, lavish of worthless promises, always in a hurry, and at once headlong, timid, and rash. A borrowed importance and real insignificance, says Walpole, who knew him well, gave him the perpetual air of a solicitor. He had no pride, though infinite self-love. He loved business immoderately, yet was only always doing it, never did it. When left to himself, he always plunged into difficulties, and then shuddered for the consequences. Walpole gives an anecdote showing the state of his ideas on colonial matters. General Ligonier suggested to him that Annapolis ought to be defended, to which he replied with his lisping, evasive hurry, Annapolis, Annapolis, oh yes, Annapolis must be defended. Where is Annapolis? Another contemporary, Smollett, ridicules him in his novel of Humphrey Clinker, and tells a similar story, which, founded in fact or not, shows in what estimation the minister was held. Captain C. treated the Duke's character without any ceremony. This wiseacre, said he, is still abed, and I think the best thing he can do is to sleep on till Christmas, for when he gets up he does nothing but expose his own folly. In the beginning of the war he told me in a great fright that 30,000 French had marched from Acadia to Cape Breton. Where did they find transports, said I? Transports, cried he. I tell you, they marched by land. By land to the island of Cape Breton? What, is Cape Breton an island? Certainly. Ha! Are you sure of that? When I pointed it out on the map, he examined it earnestly with his spectacles, then taking me in his arms. My dear C, cried he, you always bring us good news. Egad, I'll go directly and tell the king that Cape Breton is an island. His wealth, county influence, flagitious use of patronage, and long-practised skill in keeping majorities in the House of Commons by means that would not bear the light, made his support necessary to Pitt himself, and placed a fantastic political jobber at the helm of England in a time when she needed a patriot and a statesman. Newcastle was the growth of the decrepitude and decay of a great party which had fulfilled its mission and done its work. But if the Whig soil had become poor for a wholesome crop, it was never so rich for toadstools. Sir Thomas Robinson held the southern department, charged with the colonies, and Lord Mahon remarks of him that the Duke had achieved the feat of finding a Secretary of State more incapable than himself. He had the lead of the House of Commons. Sir Thomas Robinson, lead us, said Pitt to Henry Fox. The Duke might as well send his jackboot to lead us. The active and inspiring Halifax was at the head of the Board of Trade and Plantations. The Duke of Cumberland commanded the army. An indifferent soldier, though a brave one, harsh, violent, and headlong. Anson, the celebrated navigator, was first Lord of the Admiralty, a position in which he disappointed everybody. In France, the true ruler was Madame de Pompadour, once the king's mistress, 
now his procuress, and a sort of feminine prime minister. Machot d'Arnouville was at the head of the marine and colonial department. The diplomatic representatives of the two crowns were more conspicuous for social than for political talents. Of Mirepoix, French ambassador at London, Marshal Saxe had once observed, It is a good appointment. He can teach the English to dance. Walpole says concerning him, He could not even learn to pronounce the names of our games of cards, which, however, engaged most of the hours of his negotiation. We were to be bullied out of our colonies by an apprentice at whist. Lord Albemarle, English ambassador at Versailles, is held up by Chesterfield as an example to encourage his son in the pursuit of the graces. What do you think made our friend Lord Albemarle, colonel of a regiment of guards, governor of Virginia, groom of the stole, and ambassador to Paris? amounting in all to sixteen or seventeen thousand pounds a year. Was it his birth? No, a Dutch gentleman only. Was it his estate? No, he had none. Was it his learning, his parts, his political abilities and application? You can answer these questions as easily and as soon as I can ask them. What was it then? Many people wondered, but I do not, for I know, and will tell you. It was his air, his address, his manners, and his graces. The rival nations differed widely in military and naval strength. England had afloat more than two hundred ships of war, some of them of great force, while the navy of France counted little more than half the number. On the other hand, England had reduced her army to 18,000 men, and France had nearly ten times as many under arms. Both alike were weak in leadership. That rare son of the Tempest, a great commander, was to be found in neither of them since the death of Saxe. In respect to the approaching crisis, the interests of the two powers pointed to opposite courses of action. What France needed was time. It was her policy to put off a rupture, wreathe her face in diplomatic smiles, and pose in an attitude of peace and good faith, while increasing her navy, reinforcing her garrisons in America, and strengthening her positions there. It was the policy of England to attack at once and tear up the young encroachments while they were yet in the sap before they could strike root and harden into stiff resistance. When, on the 14th of November, the King made his opening speech to the Houses of Parliament, he congratulated them on the prevailing peace and assured them that he should improve it to promote the trade of his subjects and protect those possessions which constitute one great source of their wealth. America was not mentioned, but his hearers understood him, and made a liberal grant for the service of the year. Two regiments, each of five hundred men, had already been ordered to sail for Virginia, where their numbers were to be raised by enlistment to seven hundred. Major General Braddock, a man after the Duke of Cumberland's own heart, was appointed to the chief command. The two regiments, the 44th and the 48th, embarked at Cork in the middle of January. The soldiers detested the service, and many had deserted. More would have done so had they foreseen what awaited them. This movement was no sooner known at Versailles than a counter-expedition was prepared on a larger scale. Eighteen ships of war were fitted for sea at Brest and Rochefort, and the six battalions of Lorraine, Bourgogne, Languedoc, 
Guyenne, Artois, and Béarn, three thousand men in all, were ordered to board for Canada. Baron Dieskau, a German veteran who had served under Saxe, was made their general, and with him went the new governor of French America, the Marquis de Vaudreuil, destined to succeed Duquesne, whose health was failing under the fatigues of his office. Admiral de Bois de la Motte commanded the fleet, and lest the English should try to intercept it, another squadron of nine ships under Admiral McNamara was ordered to accompany it to a certain distance from the coast. There was a long and tedious delay. Dory, commissioner of war, who had embarked with Vaudreuil and Dieskau in the same ship, wrote from the harbour of Brest on the 29th of April, At last I think we are off. We should have been outside by four o'clock this morning if Monsieur de McNamara had not been obliged to ask Count Dubois de la Motte to wait till noon to mend some important part of the rigging, I don't know the name of it, which was broken. It is precious time lost, and gives the English the advantage over us of two tides. I talk of these things as a blind man does of colours. What is certain is that Count Dubois de la Motte is very impatient to get away, and that the King's fleet destined for Canada is in very able and zealous hands. It is now half past two. In half an hour all may be ready, and we may get out of the harbour before night. He was again disappointed. It was the third of May before the fleet put to sea. During these preparations there was active diplomatic correspondence between the two courts. Mirepoix demanded why British troops were sent to America. Sir Thomas Robinson answered that there was no intention to disturb the peace or offend any power whatever. Yet the secret orders to Braddock were the reverse of Pacific. Robinson asked on his part the purpose of the French armament at Brest and Rochefort, and the answer, like his own, was a protestation that no hostility was meant. At the same time, Mirepoix, in the name of the king, proposed that orders should be given to the American governors on both sides to refrain from all acts of aggression. But while making this proposal, the French court secretly sent orders to Duquesne to attack and destroy Fort Halifax, one of the two forts lately built by Shirley on the Kennebec a river which, by the admission of the French themselves, belonged to the English. But in making this attack, the French governor was expressly enjoined to pretend that he acted without orders. He was also told that, if necessary, he might make use of the Indians to harass the English. Thus there was good faith on neither part, but it is clear through all the correspondence that the English expected to gain by precipitating an open rupture, and the French by postponing it. Projects of convention were proposed on both sides, but there was no agreement. The English insisted as a preliminary condition that the French should evacuate all the western country as far as the Wabash, then ensued a long discussion of their respective claims, as futile as the former discussion at Paris on Acadian boundaries. The British court knew perfectly the naval and military preparations of the French. Lord Albemarle had died at Paris in December, but the secretary of the embassy, de Cosny, sent to London full information concerning the fleet at Brest and Rochefort. On this occasion, Admiral Boscawen, with eleven ships of the line and one frigate, was ordered to intercept it, and as his force was plainly too small, 
Admiral Melbourne, with seven more ships, was sent nearly three weeks after to join him if he could. Their orders were similar, to capture or destroy any French vessels bound to North America. Boscawen, who got to sea before La Motte, stationed himself near the southern coast of Newfoundland to cut him off. But most of the French squadron eluded him, and made their way, some to Louisbourg and the others to Quebec. Thus, the English expedition was, in the main, a failure. Three of the French ships, however, lost in the fog and rain, had become separated from the rest, and lay rolling and tossing on an angry sea not far from Cape Race. One of them was the Alcide, commanded by Captain Hochart. The others were the Lee and the Dauphin. The wind fell, but the fogs continued at intervals, till on the afternoon of the 7th of June, the weather having cleared, the watchman on the main top saw the distant ocean studded with ships. It was the fleet of Boscawen. Hocart, who gives the account, says that in the morning they were within three leagues of him, crowding all sail in pursuit. Towards eleven o'clock one of them, the Dunkirk, was abreast of him to windward, within short speaking distance, and the ship of the admiral, displaying a red flag as a signal to engage, was not far off. Hocart called out, Are we at peace or war? He declares that Howe, captain of the Dunkirk, replied, La paille, la paille. Hocart then asked the name of the British admiral, and on hearing it said, I know him, he is a friend of mine. Being asked his own name in return, he had scarcely uttered it when the batteries of the Dunkirk belched flame and smoke, and volleyed a tempest of iron upon the crowded decks of the Alcide. She returned the fire, but was forced at length to strike her colors. Rostain, second in command of the troops, was killed, and six other officers, with about eighty men, were killed or wounded. At the same time the Lee was attacked and overpowered. She had on board eight companies of the battalions of La Reine and Languedoc. The third ship, the Dauphin, escaped under cover of a rising fog. Here at last was an end to negotiation. The sword was drawn and brandished in the eyes of Europe. End of section 15. Section 16 of Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, Part 1. 1755. Braddock. I have the pleasure to acquaint you that General Braddock came to my house last Sunday night, writes Dinwiddie, at the end of February, to Governor Dobbs of North Carolina. Braddock had landed at Hampton from the ship Centurion, along with young Commodore Keppel, who commanded the American squadron. I am mighty glad, again writes Dinwiddie, that the general is arrived, which I hope will give me some ease. For these twelve months past, I have been a perfect slave. He conceived golden opinions of his guest. He is, I think, a very fine officer, and a sensible, considerate gentleman. He and I live in great harmony. Had he known him better, he might have praised him less. William Shirley, son of the governor of Massachusetts, was Braddock's secretary, and after an acquaintance of some months wrote to his friend Governor Morris, We have a general, most judiciously chosen, 
for being disqualified for the service he is employed in in almost every respect he may be brave for aught i know and he is honest in pecuniary matters the astute franklin who also had good opportunity of knowing him says this general was i think a brave man and might probably have made a good figure in some european war but he had too much self-confidence too high an opinion of the validity of regular troops to mean a one of both americans and indians horace walpole in his function of gathering and immortalizing the gossip of his time has left a sharply drawn sketch of braddock in two letters to sir horace mann written in the summer of this year i love to give you an idea of our characters as they rise upon the stage of history braddock is a very iroquois in disposition he had a sister who having gamed away all her little fortune at bath hanged herself with a truly english deliberation leaving only a note upon the table with those lines to die is landing on some silent shore etc when braddock was told of it he only said poor fanny i always thought she would play till she would be forced to tuck herself up under the name of miss sylvia s goldsmith in his life of nash tells the story of this unhappy woman she was a rash but warm-hearted creature reduced to penury and dependence not so much by a passion for cards as by her lavish generosity to a lover ruined by his own follies and with whom her relations are said to have been entirely innocent walpole continues but a more ridiculous story of braddock and which is recorded in heroics by fielding in his covent garden tragedy was an amorous discussion he had formerly with a mrs upton who kept him he had gone the greatest lengths with her pin money and was still craving one day that he was very pressing she pulled out her purse and showed him that she had but twelve or fourteen shillings left he twitched it from her let me see that tied up at the other end he found five guineas he took them tossed the empty purse in her face saying did you mean to cheat me and never went near her more now you are acquainted with general braddock he once had a duel with colonel gumley lady bath's brother who had been his great friend as they were going to engage gumley who had good humour and wit bradley had the latter said braddock you are a poor dog here take my purse if you kill me you will be forced to run away and then you will have not a shilling to support you braddock refused the purse insisted on the duel was disarmed and would not even ask his life however with all his brutality he has lately been governor of gibraltar where he made himself adored and where scarce any governor was endured before another story is told of him by an accomplished actress of the time george ann bellamy whom braddock had known from girlhood and with whom his present relations seem to have been those of an elderly adviser and friend as we were walking in the park one day we heard a poor fellow was to be chastised when i requested the general to beg off the offender upon his application to the general officer whose name was jury he asked braddock 
how long since he had divested himself of the brutality and insolence of his manners to which the other replied you never knew me insolent to my inferiors it is only to such rude men as yourself that I behave with the spirit which I think they deserve. Braddock made a visit to the actress on the evening before he left London for America. Before we parted, she says, the general told me that he should never see me more, for he was going with a handful of men to conquer whole nations and to do this they must cut their way through unknown woods. He produced a map of the country, saying at the same time, Dear Pop, we are sent like sacrifices to the altar. A strange presentiment for a man of his sturdy temper. Whatever were his failings, he feared nothing, and his fidelity and honor in the discharge of public trusts were never questioned. Desperate in his fortune, brutal in his behavior, obstinate in his sentiments, again writes Walpole, he was still intrepid and capable. He was a veteran in years and in service, having entered the Coldstream Guards as ensign in 1710. The transports bringing the two regiments from Ireland all arrived safely at Hampton, and were ordered to proceed up the Potomac to Alexandria, where a camp was to be formed. Thither, towards the end of March, went Braddock himself, along with Keppel and Dinwiddie in the governor's coach, while his aide-de-camp, Orme, his secretary Shirley, and the servants of the party followed on horseback. Braddock had sent for the elder Shirley and other provincial governors to meet him in council, and on the 14th of April they assembled in a tent of the newly formed encampment. Here was Dinwiddie, who thought his troubles at an end, and saw in the red-coated soldiery the near fruition of his hopes. Here, too, was his friend and ally, Dobbs of North Carolina, with Morris of Pennsylvania, fresh from assembly quarrels, Sharp of Maryland, who, having once been a soldier, had been made a sort of provisional commander-in-chief before the arrival of Braddock, and the ambitious Delancey of New York, who had lately led the opposition against the governor of that province, and now filled the office himself, a position that needed all his manifold adroitness. But next to Braddock, the most noteworthy man present was Shirley, governor of Massachusetts. There was a fountain of youth in this old lawyer. A few years before, when he was boundary commissioner in Paris, he had had the indiscretion to marry a young Catholic girl, the daughter of his landlord, and now, when more than sixty years old, he thirsted for military honors and delighted in contriving operations of war. He was one of a very few in the colonies who at this time entertained the idea of expelling the French from the continent. He held that Carthage must be destroyed, and in spite of his Parisian marriage, was the foremost advocate of the root and branch policy. He and Lawrence, governor of Nova Scotia, had concerted an attack on the French fort of Beauséjour, and jointly with others in New England, he had planned the capture of Crown Point, the key of Lake Champlain. By these two strokes, and by fortifying the portage between the Kennebec and the Chaudière, he thought that the northern colonies would be saved from invasion, and placed in a position to become themselves invaders. Then, by driving the enemy from Niagara, securing that important pass, 
and thus cutting off the communications between Canada and her interior dependencies, all the French posts in the West would die of inanition. In order to commend these schemes to the home government, he had painted in gloomy colors the dangers that beset the British colonies. Our Indians, he said, will all desert us if we submit to French encroachment. Some of the provinces are full of Negro slaves, ready to rise against their masters, and of Roman Catholics, Jacobites, indented servants, and other dangerous persons, who would add the French in raising a servile insurrection. Pennsylvania is in the hands of Quakers who will not fight, and of Germans who are likely enough to join the enemy. The Dutch of Albany would do anything to save their trade. A strong force of French regulars might occupy that place without resistance, then descend the Hudson, and with the help of a naval force, capture New York and cut the British colonies asunder. The plans against Crown Point and Beausjour had already found the approval of the home government and the energetic support of all the New England colonies. Preparation for them was in full activity, and it was with great difficulty that Shirley had disengaged himself from these cares to attend the council at Alexandria. He and Dinwiddie stood in the front of opposition to French designs. As they both defended the royal prerogative and were strong advocates of taxation by Parliament, they have found scant justice from American writers. Yet the British colonies owed them a debt of gratitude, and the American states owe it still. Braddock laid his instructions before the council, and Shirley found them entirely to his mind, while the general on his part fully approved the schemes of the governor. The plan of the campaign was settled. The French were to be attacked at four points at once. The two British regiments lately arrived were to advance on Fort Duquesne. Two new regiments, known as Shirley's and Pepperell's, just raised in the provinces and taken into the king's pay, were to reduce Niagara. A body of provincials from New England, New York, and New Jersey was to seize Crown Point, and another body of New England men to capture Beausjour and bring Acadia to complete subjection. Braddock himself was to lead the expedition against Fort Duquesne. He asked Shirley, who, though a soldier only in theory, had held the rank of colonel since the last war, to charge himself with that against Niagara, and Shirley eagerly assented. The movement on Crown Point was entrusted to Colonel William Johnson by reason of his influence over the Indians and his reputation for energy, capacity, and faithfulness. Lastly, the Acadian enterprise was assigned to Lieutenant Colonel Monckton, a regular officer of merit. To strike this fourfold blow in time of peace was a scheme worthy of Newcastle and of Cumberland. The pretext was that the positions to be attacked were all on British soil, that in occupying them the French had been guilty of invasion, and that to expel the invaders would be an act of self-defense. Yet in regard to two of these positions, the French, if they had no other right, might at least claim one of prescription. Crown Point had been twenty-four years in their undisturbed possession, while it was three-quarters of a century since they first occupied Niagara, and though New York claimed the ground, 
no serious attempt had been made to dislodge them. Other matters now engaged the council. Braddock, in accordance with his instructions, asked the governors to urge upon their several assemblies the establishment of a general fund for the service of the campaign. But the governors were all of opinion that the assemblies would refuse, each being resolved to keep the control of its money in its own hands, and all present with one voice advised that the colonies should be compelled by act of parliament to contribute in due proportion to the support of the war. Braddock next asked if, in the opinion of the council, it would not be well to send Colonel Johnson with full powers to treat with the five nations, who had been driven to the verge of an outbreak by the misconduct of the Dutch Indian commissioners at Albany. The measure was cordially approved as was also another suggestion of the general that vessels should be built at Oswego to command Lake Ontario. The council then dissolved. Shirley hastened back to New England, burdened with the preparation for three expeditions and the command of one of them. Johnson, who had been in the camp, though not in the council, went back to Albany, provided with a commission as sole superintendent of Indian affairs, and charged besides with the enterprise against Crown Point, while an express was dispatched to Moncton at Halifax, with orders to set at once to his work of capturing Beauséjour. In regard to Braddock's part of the campaign, there had been a serious error. If, instead of landing in Virginia and moving on Fort Duquesne by the long and circuitous route of Wills Creek, the two regiments had disembarked at Philadelphia and marched westward, the way would have been shortened and would have lain through one of the richest and most populous districts on the continent, filled with supplies of every kind. In Virginia, on the other hand, and in the adjoining province of Maryland, wagons, horses, and forage were scarce. The enemies of the administration ascribed this blunder to the influence of the Quaker merchant John Hanbury, whom the Duke of Newcastle had consulted as a person familiar with American affairs. Hanbury, who was a prominent stockholder in the Ohio Company and who traded largely in Virginia, saw it for his interest that the troops should pass that way, and is said to have brought the Duke to this opinion. A writer of the time thinks that if they had landed in Pennsylvania, forty thousand pounds would have been saved in money and six weeks in time. Not only were supplies scarce, but the people showed such unwillingness to furnish them, and such apathy in aiding the expedition, that even Washington was provoked to declare that they ought to be chastised. Many of them thought that the alarm about French encroachment was a device of designing politicians, and they did not awake to a full consciousness of the peril till it was forced upon them by a deluge of calamities produced by the purblind folly of their own representatives, who instead of frankly promoting the expedition displayed a perverse and exasperating narrowness which chafed Braddock to fury. He praises the New England colonies and echoes Dinwiddie's declaration that they have shown a fine martial spirit, and he commends Virginia as having done far better than her neighbors. But for Pennsylvania he finds no words to express his wrath. He knew nothing of the intestine war between proprietaries and people, and hence could see no palliation for a conduct 
which threatened to ruin both the expedition and the colony. Everything depended on speed, and speed was impossible, for stores and provision were not ready, though notice to furnish them had been given months before. The quartermaster-general, Sir John Sinclair, stormed like a lion rampant, but with small effect. Contracts broken or disavowed, want of horses, want of wagons, want of forage, want of wholesome food or sufficient food of any kind, caused such delay that the report of it reached England, and drew from Walpole the comment that Braddock was in no hurry to be scalped. In reality, he was maddened with impatience and vexation. End of section 16. Section 17 of Montcalm and Wolfe by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, Part 2. A powerful ally presently came to his aid in the shape of Benjamin Franklin, then postmaster general of Pennsylvania. That sagacious personage, the sublime of common sense, about equal in his instincts and motives of character to the respectable average of the New England that produced him, but gifted with a versatile power of brain rarely matched on earth, was then divided between his strong desire to repel a danger of which he saw the imminence, and his equally strong antagonism to the selfish claims of the Pens, proprietaries of Pennsylvania. This last motive had determined his attitude towards their representative, the governor, and led him into an opposition as injurious to the military good name of the province as it was favorable to its political longings. In the present case there was no such conflict of inclinations. He could help Braddock without hurting Pennsylvania. He and his son had visited the camp, and found the general waiting restlessly for the report of the agents whom he had sent to collect wagons. I stayed with him, says Franklin, several days, and dined with him daily. When I was about to depart, the returns of wagons to be obtained were brought in, by which it appeared that they amounted only to twenty-five, and not all of these were in serviceable condition. On this the general and his officers declared that the expedition was at an end, and denounced the ministry for sending them into a country void of the means of transportation. Franklin remarked that it was a pity they had not landed in Pennsylvania, where almost every farmer had his wagon. Braddock caught eagerly at his words, and begged that he would use his influence to enable the troops to move. Franklin went back to Pennsylvania, issued an address to the farmers, appealing to their interest and their fears, and in a fortnight procured a hundred and fifty wagons, with a large number of horses. Braddock, grateful to his benefactor, and enraged at everybody else, pronounced him almost the only instance of ability and honesty I have known in these provinces. More wagons and more horses gradually arrived, and at the eleventh hour the march began. On the 10th of May, Braddock reached Wills Creek, where the whole force was now gathered, having marched thither by detachments along the banks of the Potomac. This old trading station of the Ohio Company had been transformed into a military post and named Fort Cumberland. During the past winter, the independent companies which had failed Washington in his need 
had been at work here to prepare a base of operations for Braddock. Their axes had been of more avail than their muskets. A broad wound had been cut in the bosom of the forest, and the murdered oaks and chestnuts turned into ramparts, barracks, and magazines. Fort Cumberland was an enclosure of logs set upright in the ground, pierced with loopholes and armed with ten small cannon. It stood on a rising ground near the point where Wills Creek joined the Potomac, and the forest girded it like a mighty hedge, or rather like a paling of gaunt brown stems, upholding a canopy of green. All around spread illimitable woods, wrapping hill, valley, and mountain. The spot was an oasis in a desert of leaves, if the name oasis can be given to anything so rude and harsh. In this rugged area, or clearing, all Braddock's force was now assembled, a mounting regulars, provincials, and sailors, to about twenty-two hundred men. The two regiments, Halkett's and Dunbar's, had been completed by enlistment in Virginia to seven hundred men each. Of Virginians there were nine companies of fifty men, who found no favor in the eyes of Braddock or his officers. To Ensign Allen of Halkett's regiment was assigned the duty of making them as much like soldiers as possible, that is, of drilling them like regulars. The general had little hope of them, and informed Sir Thomas Robinson that their slothful and languid disposition renders them very unfit for military service a point on which he lived to change his mind. Thirty sailors, whom Commodore Keppel had lent him, were more to his liking, and were, in fact, of value in many ways. He had now about six hundred baggage horses, besides those of the artillery, all weakening daily on their diet of leaves, for no grass was to be found. There was great show of discipline, and little real order. Braddock's executive capacity seems to have been moderate, and his dogged, imperious temper, rasped by disappointments, was in constant irritation. He looks upon the country, I believe, writes Washington, as void of honor or honesty, we have frequent disputes on this head, which are maintained with warmth on both sides, especially on his, as he is incapable of arguing without it, or giving up any point he asserts, be it ever so incompatible with reason or common sense. Braddock's secretary, the younger Shirley, writing to his friend Governor Morris, spoke thus irreverently of his chief. As the king said of a neighboring governor of yours, Sharp, when proposed for the command of the American forces about a twelve month ago, and recommended as a very honest man, though not remarkably able, a little more ability and a little less honesty upon the present occasion might serve our turn better, it is a joke to suppose that secondary officers can make amends for the defects of the first. The mainspring must be the mover. As to the others, I don't think we have much to boast. Some are insolent and ignorant, others capable but rather aiming at showing their own abilities than making a proper use of them. I have a very great love for my friend Orm and think it uncommonly fortunate for our leader that he is under the influence of so honest and capable a man. But I wish for the sake of the public he had some more experience of business 
particularly in America. I am greatly disgusted at seeing an expedition, as it is called, so ill-concerted originally in England, so improperly conducted since in America. Captain Robert Orme, of whom Shirley speaks, was aide-de-camp to Braddock, and author of a copious and excellent journal of the expedition, now in the British Museum. His portrait, painted at full length by Sir Joshua Reynolds, hangs in the National Gallery at London. He stands by his horse, a gallant young figure, with a pale face, yet rather handsome, booted to the knee, his scarlet coat, ample waistcoat, and small three-cornered hat all heavy with gold lace. The general had two other aides-de-camp, Captain Roger Morris and Colonel George Washington, whom he had invited in terms that do him honor, to become one of his military family. It has been said that Braddock despised not only provincials, but Indians. Nevertheless, he took some pains to secure their aid, and complained that Indian affairs had been so ill-conducted by the provinces that it was hard to gain their confidence. This was true. The tribes had been alienated by gross neglect. Had they been protected from injustice and soothed by attentions and presents, the five nations, Delawares and Shawanoes, would have been retained as friends. But their complaints had been slighted, and every gift begrudged. The trader Crone brought, however, about fifty warriors, with as many women and children, to the camp at Fort Cumberland. They were objects of great curiosity to the soldiers, who gazed with astonishment on their faces, painted red, yellow, and black their ears slit and hung with pendants, and their heads close shaved except the feathered scalp-lock at the crown. In the day, says an officer, they are in our camp, and in the night they go to their own, where they dance and make a most horrible noise. Braddock received them several times in his tent, ordered the guard to salute them, made them speechless, caused cannon to be fired and drums and fife to play in their honor, regaled them with rum, and gave them a bullock for a feast, whereupon, being much pleased, they danced a war-dance, described by one spectator as droll and odd, showing how they scalp and fight after which, says another, they set up the most horrid song or cry that ever I heard. These warriors, with a few others, promised the general to join him on the march, but he apparently grew tired of them, for a famous chief called Scaroyadi afterwards complained, he looked upon us as dogs, and would never hear anything that we said to him. Only eight of them remained with him to the end. Another ally appeared at the camp. This was a personage long known in Western fireside story as Captain Jack, the Black Hunter, or the Black Rifle. It was said of him that having been a settler on the farthest frontier, in the valley of the Juniata, he returned one evening to his cabin and found it burned to the ground by Indians, and the bodies of his wife and children lying among the ruins. He vowed undying vengeance, raised a band of kindred spirits, dressed and painted like Indians, and became the scourge of the red man and the champion of the white. But he and his wild crew 
useful as they might have been, shocked Braddock's sense of military fitness, and he received them so coldly that they left him. It was the 10th of June before the army was well on its march. Three hundred axemen led the way to cut and clear the road, and the long train of pack-horses, wagons, and cannon toiled on behind, over the stumps, roots, and stones of the narrow track, the regulars and provincials marching in the forest close on either side. Squads of men were thrown out on the flanks, and scouts ranged the woods to guard against surprise, for with all his scorn of Indians and Canadians, Braddock did not neglect reasonable precautions. Thus foot by foot they advanced into the waste of lonely mountains that divided the streams flowing to the Atlantic from those flowing to the Gulf of Mexico, a realm of forests ancient as the world. The road was but twelve feet wide, and the line of march often extended four miles. It was like a thin, long, party-colored snake, red, blue, and brown, trailing slowly through the depth of leaves, creeping round inaccessible heights, crawling over ridges, moving always in dampness and shadow, by rivulets and waterfalls, crags and chasms, gorges and shaggy steps, in glimpses only through jagged boughs and flickering leaves did this wild primeval world reveal itself with its dark green mountains flecked with the morning mist and its distant summits penciled in dreamy blue the army passed the main allegheny meadow mountain and great savage mountain and traversed the funereal pine forest afterwards called the shades of death no attempt was made to interrupt their march though the commandant of fort duquesne had sent out parties for that purpose a few french and indians hovered about them now and then scalping a straggler or inscribing filthy insults on trees while others fell upon the border settlements which the advance of the troops had left defenceless here they were more successful, butchering about thirty persons, chiefly women and children. It was the 18th of June before the army reached a place called the Little Meadows, less than thirty miles from Fort Cumberland. Fever and dysentery among the men and the weakness and worthlessness of many of the horses, joined to the extreme difficulty of the road, so retarded them that they could move scarcely more than three miles a day. Braddock consulted with Washington, who advised him to leave the heavy baggage to follow as it could, and push forward with a body of chosen troops. This counsel was given in view of a report that five hundred regulars were on the way to reinforce Fort Duquesne. It was adopted. Colonel Dunbar was left to command the rear division, whose powers of movement were now reduced to the lowest point, the advance corps consisting of about twelve hundred soldiers, besides officers and drivers, began its march on the 19th with such artillery as was thought indispensable, thirty wagons and a large number of pack-horses. The prospect, writes Washington to his brother, conveyed infinite delight to my mind, though I was excessively ill at the time. But this prospect was soon clouded, and my hopes brought very low indeed when I found that, instead of pushing on with vigor without regarding a little rough road, they were halting to level every molehill and to erect bridges over every brook, 
by which means we were four days in getting twelve miles. It was not till the 7th of July that they neared the mouth of Turtle Creek, a stream entering the Monongahela about eight miles from the French fort. The way was direct and short, but would lead them through a difficult country and a defile so perilous that Braddock resolved to ford the Monongahela to avoid this danger and then ford it again to reach his destination. Fort Duquesne stood on the point of land where the Allegheny and the Monongahela join to form the Ohio, and where now stands Pittsburgh, with its swarming population, its restless industries, the clang of its forges, and its chimneys vomiting foul smoke into the face of heaven. At that early day, a white flag fluttering over a cluster of palisades and embankments betokened the first intrusion of civilized men upon a scene which a few months before breathed the repose of a virgin wilderness, voiceless but for the lapping of waves upon the pebbles or the note of some lonely bird. But now the sleep of ages was broken and bugle and drum told the astonished forest that its doom was pronounced and its days numbered. The fort was a compact little work, solidly built and strong, compared with others on the continent. It was a square of four bastions with the water close on both sides, and the other two protected by ravelins, ditch, glacis, and covered way. The ramparts on these sides were of squared logs, filled in with earth and ten feet or more thick. The two water sides were enclosed by a massive stockade of upright logs, twelve feet high, mortised together and loopholed. The armament consisted of a number of small cannon mounted on the bastions a gate and drawbridge on the east side gave access to the area within which was surrounded by barracks for the soldiers officers quarters the lodgings of the commandant a guardhouse and a storehouse all built partly of logs and partly of boards there were no casemates and the place was commanded by a high woody hill beyond the Monongahela. The forest had been cleared away to the distance of more than a musket shot from the ramparts, and the stumps were hacked level with the ground. Here, just outside the ditch, bark cabins had been built for such of the troops and Canadians as could not find room within, and the rest of the open space was covered with Indian corn and other crops. End of section 17. Section 18 of Mont Carmen Wolf by Francis Parkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, Part 3. The garrison consisted of a few companies of the regular troops stationed permanently in the colony and to these were added a considerable number of Canadians. Contrecoeur still held the command. Under him were three other captains, Beaujou, Dumas, and Linieris. Besides the troops and Canadians, eight hundred Indian warriors, mustered from far and near, had built their wigwams and camp sheds on the open ground or under the edge of the neighboring woods, very little to the advantage of the young corn. Some were baptized savages settled in Canada, Kanawagas from Salt St. Louis, Abenakis from St. Francis, and Hurons from Lorette, whose chief bore the name of Anastasi, in honor of the father of that church. 
the rest were unmitigated heathen potawatamis and ojibwas from the northern lakes under charles langlaid the same bold partisan who had led them three years before to attack the miamis at Pickawillany, shawanoes and mingos from the ohio and ottawas from detroit commanded it is said by that most redoubtable of savages pontiac the law of the survival of the fittest had wrought on this heterogeneous crew through countless generations and with the primitive indian the fittest was the hardiest fiercest most adroit and most wily baptized and heathen alike they had just enjoyed a diversion greatly to their taste a young pennsylvanian named james smith a spirited and intelligent boy of eighteen had been waylaid by three indians on the western borders of the province and led captive to the fort when the party came to the edge of the clearing his captors who had shot and scalped his companions raised the scalp yell whereupon a din of responsive whoops and firing of guns rose from all the indian camps and their inmates swarmed out like bees while the french in the fort shot off muskets and cannon to honor the occasion the unfortunate boy the object of this obstreperous rejoicing presently saw a multitude of savages naked hideously bedaubed with red blue black and brown and armed with sticks or clubs ranging themselves in two long parallel lines between which he was told that he must run the faster the better as they would beat him all the way he ran with his best speed under a shower of blows and had nearly reached the end of the course when he was knocked down he tried to rise but was blinded by a handful of sand thrown into his face and then they beat him till he swooned on coming to his senses he found himself in the fort with the surgeon opening a vein in his arm and a crowd of french and indians looking on in a few days he was able to walk with the help of a stick and coming out from his quarters one morning he saw a memorable scene three days before an indian had brought the report that the english were approaching and that the chevalier de la perade was sent out to reconnoitre he returned on the next day the seventh with news that they were not far distant on the eighth the brothers normanville went out and found that they were within six leagues of the fort the french were in great excitement and alarm but contrecoeur at length took a resolution which seems to have been inspired by beaujeu it was determined to meet the enemy on the march and ambuscade them if possible at the crossing of the monongahela or some other favorable spot beaujeu proposed the plan to the indians and offered them the war hatchet but they would not take it do you want to die my father and sacrifice us besides that night they held a council and in the morning again refused to go beaujeu did not despair i am determined he exclaimed to meet the english what will you let your father go alone the greater part caught fire at his words promised to follow him and put on their war paint beaujeu received the communion then dressed himself like a savage and joined the clamorous throng open barrels of gunpowder and bullets were set before the gate of the fort 
and james smith painfully climbing the rampart with the help of his stick looked down on the warrior rabble as huddling together wild with excitement they scooped up the contents to fill their powder horns and pouches then band after band they filed off along the forest track that led to the ford of the monongahela they numbered six hundred and thirty-seven and with them went thirty-six french officers and cadets seventy-two regular soldiers and a hundred and forty-six canadians or about nine hundred in all at eight o'clock the tumult was over the broad clearing lay lonely and still and contrecoeur with what was left of his garrison waited in suspense for the issue it was near one o'clock when braddock crossed the monongahela for the second time if the french made a stand anywhere it would be he thought at the fording place but lieutenant colonel gage whom he sent across with a strong advance party found no enemy and quietly took possession of the farther shore then the main body followed to impose on the imagination of the french scouts who were doubtless on the watch the movement was made with studied regularity and order the sun was cloudless and the men were inspired by the prospect of a near triumph washington afterwards spoke with admiration of the spectacle the music the banners the mounted officers the troop of light cavalry the naval detachment the red-coated regulars the blue-coated virginians the wagons and tumbrils cannon howitzers and cohorns the track of pack-horses and the droves of cattle passed in long procession through the rippling shallows and slowly entered the bordering forest here when all were over a short halt was ordered for rest and refreshment why had not beaujeu defended the ford this was his intention in the morning but he had been met by obstacles the nature of which is not wholly clear his indians it seems had proved refractory three hundred of them left him went off in another direction and did not rejoin him till the english had crossed the river hence perhaps it was that having left fort duquesne at eight o'clock he spent half the day in marching seven miles and was more than a mile from the fording place when the british reached the eastern shore the delay from whatever cause arising cost him the opportunity of laying an ambush either at the ford or in the gullies and ravines that channeled the forest through which braddock was now on the point of marching not far from the bank of the river and close by the british line of march there was a clearing and a deserted house that had once belonged to the trader fraser washington remembered it well it was here that he found rest and shelter on the winter journey homeward from his mission to fort le Bouf. he was in no less need of rest at this moment for recent fever had so weakened him that he could hardly sit his horse from fraser's house to fort duquesne the distance was eight miles by a rough path along which the troops were now beginning to move after their halt it ran inland for a little then curved to the left and followed a course parallel to the river along the base of a line of steep hills that here bordered the valley these and all the country were buried in dense and heavy forest choked with bushes and the carcasses of fallen trees braddock has been charged with marching blindly into an ambuscade but it was not so there was no ambuscade 
and had there been one he would have found it it is true that he did not reconnoitre the woods very far in advance of the head of the column yet with this exception he made elaborate dispositions to prevent surprise several guides with six virginian light horsemen led the way then a musket shot behind came the vanguard then three hundred soldiers under gage then a large body of axemen under sir john sinclair to open the road then two cannon with tumbrils and tool wagons and lastly the rear guard closing the line while flanking parties ranged the woods on both sides this was the advance column the main body followed with little or no interval the artillery and wagons moved along the road and the troops filed through the woods close on either hand numerous flanking parties were thrown out a hundred yards and more to right and left while in the space between them and the marching column the pack horses and cattle with their drivers made their way painfully among the trees and thickets since had they been allowed to follow the road the line of march would have been too long for mutual support a body of regulars and provincials brought up the rear gage with his advance column had just passed a wide and bushy ravine that crossed their path and the van of the main column was on the point of entering it when the guides and light horsemen in the front suddenly fell back and the engineer gordon then engaged in marking out the road saw a man dressed like an indian but wearing the gorget of an officer bounding forward along the path he stopped when he discovered the head of the column turned and waved his hat the forest behind was swarming with french and savages at the signal of the officer who was probably beaujou they yelled the war-whoop spread themselves to right and left and opened a sharp fire under cover of the trees gage's column wheeled deliberately into line and fired several volleys with great steadiness against the now invisible assailants few of them were hurt the trees caught the shot but the noise was deafening under the dense arches of the forest the greater part of the canadians to borrow the words of dumas fled shamefully crying save qui peut. volley followed volley and at the third beaujou dropped dead gage's two cannon were now brought to bear on which the indians like the canadians gave way in confusion but did not like them abandon the field the close scarlet ranks of the english were plainly to be seen through the trees and the smoke they were moving forward cheering lustily and shouting god save the king dumas now chief in command thought that all was lost i advanced he says with the assurance that comes from despair exciting by voice and gesture the few soldiers that remained the fire of my platoon was so sharp that the enemy seemed astonished the indians encouraged began to rally the French officers who commanded them showed admirable courage and address, and while Dumas and Linares, with the regulars and what was left of the Canadians, held the ground in front, the savage warriors, screeching their war cries, swarmed through the forest along both flanks of the English, hid behind trees, bushes, and fallen trunks or crouched in gullies and ravines and opened a deadly fire on the helpless soldiery whom themselves completely visible could see no enemy 
and wasted volley after volley on the impassive trees the most destructive fire came from a hill on the english right where the indians lay in multitudes firing from their lurking places on the living target below but the invisible death was everywhere in front flank and rear the british cheer was heard no more the troops broke their ranks and huddled together in a bewildered mass shrinking from the bullets that cut them down by scores when braddock heard the firing in the front he pushed forward with the main body to the support of gage leaving four hundred men in the rear under sir peter halkett to guard the baggage at the moment of his arrival gage's soldiers had abandoned their two cannon and were falling back to escape the concentrated fire of the indians meeting the advancing troops they tried to find cover behind them this threw the whole into confusion the men of the two regiments became mixed together and in a short time the entire force except the virginians and the troops left with halkett were massed in several dense bodies within a small space of ground facing some one way and another and all alike exposed without shelter to the bullets that pelted them like hail both men and officers were new to this blind and frightful warfare of the savage in his native woods to charge the indians in their hiding places would have been useless they would have eluded pursuit with the agility of wildcats and swarmed back like angry hornets the moment that it ceased the virginians alone were equal to the emergency fighting behind trees like the indians themselves they might have held the enemy in check till order could be restored had not braddock furious at a proceeding that shocked all his ideas of courage and discipline ordered them with oaths to form into line a body of them under captain wagoner made a dash for a fallen tree lying in the woods far out towards the lurking places of the indians and crouching behind the huge trunk opened fire but the regulars seeing the smoke among the bushes mistook their best friends for the enemy shot at them from behind killed many and forced the rest to return a few of the regulars also tried in their clumsy way to fight behind trees but braddock beat them back with his sword and compelled them to stand with the rest an open mark for the indians the panic increased the soldiers crowded together and the bullets spent themselves in a mass of human bodies commands entreaties and threats were lost upon them we would fight some of them answered if we could see anybody to fight with nothing was visible but puffs of smoke officers and men who had stood all the afternoon under fire afterwards declared that they could not be sure they had seen a single indian braddock ordered lieutenant colonel burton to attack the hill where the puffs of smoke were thickest and the bullets most deadly with infinite difficulty that brave officer induced a hundred men to follow him but he was soon disabled by a wound and they all faced about the artillerymen stood for some time by their guns which did great damage to the trees and little to the enemies the mob of soldiers stupefied with terror stood panting their foreheads beaded with sweat loaded and firing mechanically sometimes into the air sometimes among their own comrades many of whom they killed the ground strewn with dead and wounded men the bounding of maddened horses 
the clatter and roar of musketry and cannon mixed with the spiteful report of rifles and the yells that rose from the indefatigable throats of six hundred unseen savages formed a chaos of anguish and terror scarcely paralleled even in indian war i cannot describe the horrors of that scene one of braddock's officers wrote three weeks after no pen could do it the yell of the indians is fresh on my ear and the terrific sound will haunt me till the hour of my dissolution braddock showed a furious intrepidity mounted on horseback he dashed to and fro storming like a madman four horses were shot under him and he mounted a fifth washington seconded his chief with equal courage he too no doubt using strong language for he did not measure words when the fit was on him he escaped as by miracle two horses were killed under him and four bullets tore his clothes the conduct of the british officers was above praise nothing could surpass their undaunted self-devotion and in their vain attempts to lead on the men the havoc among them was frightful sir peter halkett was shot dead his son a lieutenant in his regiment stooping to raise the body of his father was shot dead in turn young shirley braddock's secretary was pierced through the brain orm and morris his aide-de-camp sinclair the quartermaster-general gates and gage both afterwards conspicuous on opposite sides in the war of the revolution and gladwin who eight years later defended detroit against pontiac were all wounded of eighty-six officers sixty-three were killed or disabled while out of thirteen hundred and seventy-three non-commissioned officers and privates only four hundred and fifty-nine came off unharmed. End of section 18